Chapter Seventeen, Part Two of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Flushing could not resist such an opportunity. She gulped down the ode to Aphrodite during the litany, keeping herself with difficulty from asking when Sappho lived and what else she wrote worth reading, and contriving to come in punctually at the end with the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Meanwhile Hurst took out an envelope and began scribbling on the back of it. When Mr. Bax mounted the pulpit, he shut up Sappho with his envelope between the pages, settled his spectacles, and fixed his gaze intently upon the clergyman. Standing in the pulpit he looked very large and fat. The light coming through the greenish unstained window-glass made his face appear smooth and white, like a very large egg. He looked round at all the faces looking mildly up at him, although some of them were the faces of men and women old enough to be his grandparents, and gave out his text with weighty significance. The argument of the sermon was that visitors to this beautiful land, although they were on a holiday, owed a duty to the natives. It did not, in truth, differ very much from a leading article upon topics of general interest in the weekly newspapers. It rambled with a kind of amiable verbosity from one heading to another, suggesting that all human beings are very much the same under their skins, illustrating this by some resemblance of the games which little Spanish boys play to the games little boys in London streets play, observing that very small things do influence people, particularly natives. In fact, a very dear friend of Mr. Bax had told him that the success of our rule in India, that vast country, largely depended upon the strict code of politeness which the English adopted towards the natives, which led to the remark that small things were not necessarily small, and that, somehow to the virtue of sympathy, which was a virtue never more needed than to-day, when we lived in a time of experiment and upheaval, witness the aeroplane and wireless telegraph. And there were other problems which hardly presented themselves to our fathers, but which no man who called himself a man could leave unsettled. Here Mr. Bax became more definitely clerical, if it were possible. He seemed to speak with a certain innocent craftiness, as he pointed out that all this laid a special duty upon earnest Christians. What men were inclined to say now was, Oh, that fellow! he's a parson. What we want them to say is, he's a good fellow. In other words, he is my brother. He exhorted them to keep in touch with men of the modern type. They must sympathize with their multifarious interests in order to keep before their eyes that whatever discoveries were made, there was one discovery which could not be superseded, which was indeed as much of a necessity to the most successful and most brilliant of them all, as it had been to their fathers. The humblest could help. The least important things had an influence. Here his manner became definitely priestly, and his remarks seemed to be directed to women for indeed Mr. Back's congregations were mainly composed of women, and he was used to assigning them their duties in his innocent clerical campaigns. Leaving more definite instruction, he passed on, 
and his theme broadened into a peroration, for which he drew a long breath and stood very upright. As a drop of water, detached, alone, separate from others, falling from the cloud and entering the great ocean, alters, so scientists tell us, not only the immediate spot in the ocean where it falls, but all the myriad drops which together compose the great universe of waters, and by this means alters the configuration of the globe and the lives of millions of sea creatures, and finally the lives of the men and women who seek their living upon the shores. As all this is within the compass of a single drop of water, such as any rain shower sends in millions to lose themselves in the earth, to lose themselves, we say, but we know very well that the fruits of the earth could not flourish without them. So is a marvel comparable to this within the reach of each one of us, who dropping a little word or a little deed into the great universe alters it. Yea, it is a solemn thought, alters it, for good or for evil not for one instant, or in one vicinity, but throughout the entire race and for all eternity. Whipping round as though to avoid applause, he continued with the same breath, but in a different tone of voice. And now to God the Father. He gave his blessing, and then, while the solemn chords again issued from the harmonium behind the curtain, the different people began scraping and fumbling and moving very awkwardly and consciously towards the door. Halfway upstairs, at a point where the light and sounds of the upper world conflicted with the dimness and the dying hymn tune of the under, Rachel felt a hand drop upon her shoulder. Miss Binrace, Mrs. Flushing whispered peremptorily, stay to luncheon. It's such a dismal day. They don't even give one beef for luncheon. Please stay. Here they came out into the hall, where once more the little band was greeted with curious respectful glances by the people who had not gone to church although their clothing made it clear that they approved of Sunday to the very verge of going to church. Rachel felt unable to stand any more of this particular atmosphere, and was about to say she must go back, when Terence passed them, drawn along in talk with Evelyn M. Rachel thereupon contented herself with saying that the people looked very respectable, which negative remark Mrs. Flushing interpreted to mean that she would stay. English people abroad, she returned with a vivid flash of malice, ain't they awful? But we won't stay here, she continued, plucking at Rachel's arm. Come up to my room. She bore her past Hewitt and Evelyn, and the Thornburys and the Elliots. Hewitt stepped forward. Luncheon, he began. Miss Vinrace has promised to lunch with me, said Mrs. Flushing, and began to pound energetically up the staircase, as though the middle classes of England were in pursuit. She did not stop until she had slammed her bedroom door behind them. "'Well, what did you think of it?' she demanded, panting slightly. All the disgust and horror which Rachel had been accumulating burst forth beyond her control. "'I thought it the most loathsome exhibition I'd ever seen,' she broke out. "'How can they? How dare they?' What do they mean by it? Mr. Bax, hospital nurses, old men, prostitutes. 
disgusting. She hit off the points she remembered as fast as she could, but she was too indignant to stop to analyse her feelings. Mrs. Flushing watched her with keen gusto as she stood ejaculating with emphatic movements of her head and hands in the middle of the room. "'Go on, go on, do go on,' she laughed, clapping her hands. "'It's delightful to hear you.' "'But why do you go?' Rachel demanded. "'I've been every Sunday of my life ever since I can remember.' Mrs. Flushing chuckled, as though that were a reason by itself. Rachel turned abruptly to the window. She did not know what it was that had put her into such a passion. The sight of Terence in the hall had confused her thoughts, leaving her merely indignant. She looked straight at their own villa, halfway up the side of the mountain. The most familiar view seen framed through glass has a certain unfamiliar distinction, and she grew calm as she gazed. Then she remembered that she was in the presence of someone she did not know well, and she turned and looked at Mrs. Flushing. Mrs. Flushing was still sitting on the edge of the bed, looking up, with her lips parted, so that her strong white teeth showed in two rows. Tell me, she said, which do you like best, Mr. Hewitt or Mr. Hurst? Mr. Hewitt, Rachel replied, but her voice did not sound natural. Which is the one who reads Greek in church, Mrs. Flushing demanded. It might have been either of them, and while Mrs. Flushing proceeded to describe them both, and to say that both frightened her, but one frightened her more than the other. Rachel looked for a chair. The room, of course, was one of the largest and most luxurious in the hotel. There were a great many armchairs and settees covered in brown holland, but each of these was occupied by a large square piece of yellow cardboard, and all the pieces of cardboard were dotted or lined with spots or dashes of bright oil paint. But you're not to look at those, said Mrs. Flushing, as she saw Rachel's eye wander. She jumped up and turned as many as she could, face downwards, upon the floor. Rachel, however, managed to possess herself of one of them, and with the vanity of an artist, Mrs. Flushing demanded anxiously, Well? Well? It's a hill, Rachel replied. There could be no doubt that Mrs. Flushing had represented the vigorous and abrupt fling of the earth up into the air. You could almost see the clods flying as it whirled. Rachel passed from one to another. They were all marked by something of the jerk and decision of their maker. They were all perfectly untrained onslaughts of the brush upon some half-realized idea suggested by hill or tree, and they were all in some way characteristic of Mrs. Flushing. "'I see things movin', Mrs. Flushing explained. "'So,' she swept her hand through a yard of the air, she then took up one of the cardboards which Rachel had laid aside, seated herself on a stool, and began to flourish a stump of charcoal, while she occupied herself in strokes which seemed to serve her as speech serves others. Rachel, who was very restless, looked about her. "'Open the wardrobe,' said Mrs. Flushing after a pause speaking indistinctly because of a paintbrush in her mouth, and look at the things. As Rachel hesitated, Mrs. Flushing came forward, still with a paintbrush in her mouth, flung open the wings of her wardrobe, and tossed a quantity of shawls, stuffs, cloaks, embroideries on to the bed. Rachel began to finger them, 
Mrs. Flushing came up once more and dropped a quantity of beads, brooches, earrings, bracelets, tassels, and combs among the draperies. Then she went back to her stool and began to paint in silence. The stuffs were coloured and dark and pale. They made a curious swarm of lines and colours upon the counterpane with the reddish lumps of stone and peacock's feathers and clear pale tortoise-shell combs lying among them. The women wore them hundreds of years ago. They wear em still, Mrs. Flushing remarked. My husband rides about and finds em. They don't know what they're worth, so we get em cheap. And we shall sell em to smart women in London, she chuckled as though the thought of these ladies and their absurd appearance amused her. After painting for some minutes, she suddenly laid down her brush and fixed her eyes upon Rachel. "'I tell you what I want to do,' she said. "'I want to go up there and see things for myself. It's silly staying here with a pack of old maids as though we were at the seaside in England.' I want to go up the river and see the natives in their camps. It's only a matter of ten days under canvas. My husband's done it. One would lie out under the trees at night and be towed down the river by day. And if we saw anything nice, we'd shout out and tell em to stop. She rose and began piercing the bed again and again with a long golden pin as she watched to see what effect her suggestion had upon Rachel. "'We must make up a party,' she went on. Ten people could hire a launch. "'Now you'll come, and Mrs. Ambrose'll come. "'And will Mr. Hurst and t'other gentlemen come? "'Where's a pencil?' She became more and more determined and excited as she evolved her plan. She sat on the edge of the bed and wrote down a list of surnames, which she invariably spelt wrong. Rachel was enthusiastic, for indeed the idea was immeasurably delightful to her. She had always had a great desire to see the river, and the name of Terence threw a luster over the prospect, which made it almost too good to come true. She did what she could to help Mrs. Flushing by suggesting names, helping her to spell them, and counting up the days of the week upon her fingers. As Mrs. Flushing wanted to know all she could tell her about the birth and pursuits of every person she suggested, and threw in wild stories of her own as to the temperaments and habits of artists, and people of the same name who used to come to Chillingly in the old days, but were doubtless not the same, though they too were very clever men interested in Egyptology. The business took some time. At last Mrs. Flushing sought her diary for help, the method of reckoning dates on the fingers proving unsatisfactory. She opened and shut every drawer in her writing-table, and then cried furiously, "'Yarmouth! Yarmouth! Drat that woman! She's always out of the way when she's wanted!' At this moment the luncheon gong began to work itself into its midday frenzy. Mrs. Flushing rang her bell violently. The door was opened by a handsome maid who was almost as upright as her mistress. "'Oh, Yarmouth,' said Mrs. Flushing, "'just find my diary and see where ten days from now would bring us to, and ask the hall porter how many men it'd be wanted to row eight people up the river for a week, and what it'd cost, and put it on a slip of paper and leave it on my dressing-table. Now!' She pointed at the door with a superb forefinger, so that Rachel had to lead the way. "'Oh, and Yarmouth,' Mrs. Flushing called back over her shoulder. 
put those things away and hang em in their right places there's a good girl or it fusses mr flushen to all of which yarmouth merely replied yes ma'am as they entered the long dining-room it was obvious that the day was still sunday although the mood was slightly abating the flushing's table was set by the side in the window so that mrs flushing could scrutinize each figure as it entered and her curiosity seemed to be intense old mrs paley she whispered as the wheeled chair slowly made its way through the door arthur pushing behind thornbury's came next that nice woman she nudged rachel to look at miss allen what's her name the painted lady who always came in late tripping into the room with a prepared smile as though she came out upon a stage might well have quailed before mrs flushing's stare which expressed her steely hostility to the whole tribe of painted ladies next came the two young men whom mrs flushing called collectively the hursts they sat down opposite across the gangway mr flushing treated his wife with a mixture of admiration and indulgence making up by the suavity and fluency of his speech for the abruptness of hers while she darted and ejaculated he gave rachel a sketch of the history of south american art he would deal with one of his wife's exclamations and then return as smoothly as ever to his theme he knew very well how to make a luncheon pass agreeably without being dull or intimate he had formed the opinion so he told rachel that wonderful treasures lay hid in the depths of the land the things rachel had seen were merely trifles picked up in the course of one short journey he thought there might be giant gods hewn out of stone in the mountainside and colossal figures standing by themselves in the middle of vast green pasture lands where none but natives had ever trod before the dawn of european art he believed that the primitive huntsmen and priests had built temples of massive stone slabs had formed out of the dark rocks and the great cedar trees majestic figures of gods and of beasts and symbols of the great forces water air and forest among which they lived there might be prehistoric towns like those in greece and asia standing in open places among the trees filled with the works of this early race nobody had been there scarcely anything was known thus talking and displaying the most picturesque of his theories rachel's attention was fixed upon him she did not see that hewitt kept looking at her across the gangway between the figures of waiters hurrying past with plates he was inattentive and hurst was finding him also very cross and disagreeable they had touched upon all the usual topics upon politics and literature gossip and christianity they had quarrelled over the service which was every bit as fine as sappho according to hewitt so that hurst's paganism was mere ostentation why go to church he demanded merely in order to read sappho hurst observed that he had listened to every word of the sermon as he could prove if hewitt would like a repetition of it and he went to church in order to realize the nature of his creator which he had done very vividly that morning thanks to mr bax who had inspired him to write three of the most superb lines in english literature an invocation to the deity 
I wrote him on the back of the envelope of my aunt's last letter, he said, and pulled it from between the pages of Sappho. Well, let's hear them, said Hewitt, slightly mollified by the prospect of a literary discussion. My dear Hewitt, do you wish us both to be flung out of the hotel by an enraged mob of Thornburys and Elliots? Hurst inquired. The merest whisper would be sufficient to incriminate me forever. God, he broke out, what's the use of attempting to write when the world's peopled by such damned fools? Seriously, Hewitt, I advise you to give up literature. What's the good of it? There's your audience. He nodded his head at the tables where a very miscellaneous collection of Europeans were now engaged in eating, in some cases in gnawing, the stringy foreign fowls. Hewitt looked and grew more out of temper than ever. Hurst looked too. His eyes fell upon Rachel, and he bowed to her. I rather think Rachel's in love with me, he remarked as his eyes returned to his plate. That's the worst of friendships with young women. They tend to fall in love with one. To that Hewitt made no answer whatever, and sat singularly still. Hurst did not seem to mind getting no answer, for he returned to Mr. Bax again, quoting the peroration about the drop of water and when Hewitt scarcely replied to these remarks either, he merely pursed his lips, chose a fig, and relapsed quite contentedly into his own thoughts, of which he always had a very large supply. When luncheon was over, they separated, taking their cups of coffee to different parts of the hall. From his chair beneath the palm tree, Hewitt saw Rachel come out of the dining-room with the flushings. He saw them look round for chairs and choose three in a corner where they could go on talking in private. Mr. Flushing was now in the full tide of his discourse. He produced a sheet of paper upon which he made drawings as he went on with his talk. He saw Rachel lean over and look pointing to this and that with her finger. Hewitt unkindly compared Mr. Flushing, who was extremely well-dressed for a hot climate, and rather elaborate in his manner, to a very persuasive shopkeeper. Meanwhile, as he sat looking at them, he was entangled in the Thornburys, and Miss Allen, who, after hovering about for a minute or two, settled in chairs round him, holding their cups in their hands. They wanted to know whether he could tell them anything about Mr. Bax. Mr. Thornbury, as usual, sat saying nothing, looking vaguely ahead of him, occasionally raising his eyeglasses, as if to put them on, but always thinking better of it at the last moment, and letting them fall again. After some discussion, the ladies put it beyond a doubt that Mr. Bax was not the son of Mr. William Bax. There was a pause. Then Mrs. Thornbury remarked that she was still in the habit of saying Queen instead of King in the National Anthem. There was another pause. Then Miss Allen observed reflectively that going to church abroad always made her feel as if she had been to a sailor's funeral. There was then a very long pause, which threatened to be final, when mercifully a bird about the size of a magpie, but of a metallic blue color, appeared on the section of the terrace that could be seen from where they sat. Mrs. Thornbury was led to inquire whether we should like it if all our rooks were blue. What do you think, William? she asked, touching her husband on the knee. 
If all our rooks were blue, he said, he raised his glasses. He actually placed them on his nose. They would not live long in Wiltshire, he concluded. He dropped his glasses to his side again. The three elderly people now gazed meditatively at the bird, which was so obliging as to stay in the middle of the view for a considerable space of time, thus making it unnecessary for them to speak again. Hewitt began to wonder whether he might not cross over to the Flushing's corner when Hurst appeared from the background slipped into a chair by Rachel's side, and began to talk to her with every appearance of familiarity. Hewitt could stand it no longer. He rose, took his hat, and dashed out of doors. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Everything he saw was distasteful to him. He hated the blue and white, the intensity and definiteness, the hum and heat of the South. The landscape seemed to him as hard and as romantic as a cardboard background on the stage, and the mountain but a wooden screen against a sheet painted blue. He walked fast in spite of the heat of the sun. Two roads led out of the town on the eastern side. One branched off towards the Ambrose's villa, the other struck into the country, eventually reaching a village on the plain. But many footpaths, which had been stamped in the earth when it was wet, led off from it across great dry fields, to scattered farmhouses and the villas of rich natives. Hewitt stepped off the road on to one of these in order to avoid the hardness and heat of the main road, the dust of which was always being raised in small clouds by carts and ramshackle flies which carried parties of festive peasants or turkeys swelling unevenly like a bundle of air-balls beneath a net, or the brass bedstead and black wooden boxes of some newly wedded pair. The exercise indeed served to clear away the superficial irritations of the morning, but he remained miserable. It seemed proved beyond a doubt that Rachel was indifferent to him for she had scarcely looked at him, and she had talked to Mr. Flushing with just the same interest with which she talked to him. Finally Hurst's odious words flicked his mind like a whip, and he remembered that he had left her talking to Hurst. She was at this moment talking to him, and it might be true, as he said, that she was in love with him. He went over all the evidence for this supposition. Her sudden interest in Hurst's writing, her way of quoting his opinions respectfully, or with only half a laugh, her very nickname for him, the great man, might have some serious meaning in it. Supposing that there were an understanding between them, what would it mean to him? Damn it all, he demanded. Am I in love with her? To that he could only return himself one answer. He certainly was in love with her, if he knew what love meant. Ever since he had first seen her, he had been interested and attracted, more and more interested and attracted, until he was scarcely able to think of anything except Rachel. But just as he was sliding into one of the long feasts of meditation about them both, he checked himself by asking whether he wanted to marry her. That was the real problem, 
for these miseries and agonies could not be endured, and it was necessary that he should make up his mind. He instantly decided that he did not want to marry anyone, partly because he was irritated by Rachel, the idea of marriage irritated him. It immediately suggested the picture of two people sitting alone over the fire. The man was reading, the woman sewing. There was a second picture. He saw a man jump up, say good night, leave the company, and hasten away with the quiet secret look of one who is stealing to certain happiness. Both these pictures were very unpleasant, and even more so was a third picture, of husband and wife and friend, and the married people glancing at each other as though they were content to let something pass unquestioned, being themselves possessed of the deeper truth. Other pictures. He was walking very fast in his irritation and they came before him without any conscious effort, like pictures on a sheet, succeeded these. Here were the worn husband and wife sitting with their children round them, very patient, tolerant, and wise. But that too was an unpleasant picture. He tried all sorts of pictures, taking them from the lives of friends of his, for he knew many different married couples, but he saw them always walled up in a warm, firelit room. When, on the other hand, he began to think of unmarried people, he saw them active in an unlimited world, above all standing on the same ground as the rest, without shelter or advantage. All the most individual and humane of his friends were bachelors and spinsters. Indeed he was surprised to find that the women he most admired and knew best were unmarried women. Marriage seemed to be worse for them than it was for men. Leaving these general pictures, he considered the people whom he had been observing lately at the hotel. He had often revolved these questions in his mind, as he watched Susan and Arthur, or Mr. and Mrs. Thornbury, or Mr. and Mrs. Elliot. He had observed how the shy happiness and surprise of the engaged couple had gradually been replaced by a comfortable, tolerant state of mind, as if they had already done with the adventure of intimacy and were taking up their parts. Susan used to pursue Arthur about with a sweater, because he had one day let slip that a brother of his had died of pneumonia. The sight amused him, but was not pleasant if you substituted Terence and Rachel for Arthur and Susan. And Arthur was far less eager to get you in a corner and talk about flying and the mechanics of aeroplanes. They would settle down. He then looked at the couples who had been married for several years. It was true that Mrs. Thornbury had a husband, and that for the most part she was wonderfully successful in bringing him into the conversation. But one could not imagine what they said to each other when they were alone. There was the same difficulty with regard to the Elliots, except that they probably bickered openly in private. They sometimes bickered in public, though these disagreements were painfully covered over by little insincerities on the part of the wife who was afraid of public opinion, because she was much stupider than her husband, and had to make efforts to keep hold of him. There could be no doubt, he decided, that it would have been far better for the world 
if these couples had separated. Even the Ambroses, whom he admired and respected profoundly, in spite of all the love between them, was not their marriage to a compromise? She gave way to him, she spoiled him, she arranged things for him. She who was all truth to others was not true to her husband, was not true to her friends if they came in conflict with her husband. It was a strange and piteous flaw in her nature. Perhaps Rachel had been right then, when she said that night in the garden, we bring out what's worst in each other, we should live separate. No, Rachel had been utterly wrong. Every argument seemed to be against undertaking the burden of marriage until he came to Rachel's argument, which was manifestly absurd. From having been the pursued, he turned and became the pursuer, allowing the case against marriage to lapse. He began to consider the peculiarities of character which had led to her saying that. Had she meant it? Surely one ought to know the character of the person with whom one might spend all one's life. Being a novelist, let him try to discover what sort of person she was. When he was with her, he could not analyze her qualities, because he seemed to know them instinctively. But when he was away from her, it sometimes seemed to him that he did not know her at all. She was young, but she was also old. She had little self-confidence and yet she was a good judge of people. She was happy, but what made her happy? If they were alone and the excitement had worn off, and they had to deal with the ordinary facts of the day, what would happen? Casting his eye upon his own character, two things appeared to him, that he was very unpunctual, and that he disliked answering notes. As far as he knew, Rachel was inclined to be punctual, but he could not remember that he had ever seen her with a pen in her hand. Let him next imagine a dinner party, say at the Crooms, and Wilson, who had taken her down, talking about the state of the Liberal Party, she would say, of course she was absolutely ignorant of politics. Nevertheless, she was intelligent, certainly, and honest, too. Her temper was uncertain, that he had noticed, and she was not domestic, and she was not easy, and she was not quiet or beautiful except in some dresses, in some lights. But the great gift she had was that she understood what was said to her. There had never been anyone like her for talking to. You could say anything. You could say everything, and yet she was never servile. Here he pulled himself up, for it seemed to him suddenly that he knew less about her than about any one. All these thoughts had occurred to him many times already. Often had he tried to argue and reason, and again he had reached the old state of doubt. He did not know her, and he did not know what she felt, or whether they could live together, or whether he wanted to marry her and yet he was in love with her. Supposing he went to her and said, he slackened his pace and began to speak aloud as if he were speaking to Rachel. I worship you, but I loathe marriage. 
I hate its smugness, its safety, its compromise, and the thought of you interfering in my work, hindering me. What would you answer? He stopped, leant against the trunk of a tree, and gazed without seeing them at some stones scattered on the bank of the dry river bed. He saw Rachel's face distinctly, the grey eyes, the hair, the mouth, the face that could look so many things, plain, vacant, almost insignificant, or wild, passionate, almost beautiful yet in his eyes was always the same because of the extraordinary freedom with which she looked at him and spoke as she felt. What would she answer? What did she feel? Did she love him? Or did she feel nothing at all for him or for any other man, being, as she had said that afternoon, free like the wind or the sea. Oh, you're free, he exclaimed in exultation at the thought of her, and I'd keep you free. We'd be free together. We'd share everything together. No happiness would be like ours. No lives would compare with ours. He opened his arms wide as if to hold her and the world in one embrace. No longer able to consider marriage, or to weigh coolly what her nature was, or how it would be if they lived together, he dropped to the ground and sat absorbed in the thought of her. Chapter Nineteen of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But Hewitt need not have increased his torments by imagining that Hurst was still talking to Rachel. The party very soon broke up, the Flushings going in one direction, Hurst in another, and Rachel remaining in the hall, pulling the illustrated papers about turning from one to another, her movements expressing the unformed restless desire in her mind. She did not know whether to go or to stay, though Mrs. Flushing had commanded her to appear at tea. The hall was empty save for Miss Willet, who was playing scales with her fingers upon a sheet of sacred music, and the Carters, an opulent couple who disliked the girl, because her shoelaces were untied, and she did not look sufficiently cheery, which by some indirect process of thought led them to think that she would not like them. Rachel certainly would not have liked them if she had seen them, for the excellent reason that Mr. Carter waxed his moustache and Mrs. Carter wore bracelets, and they were evidently the kind of people who would not like her. But she was too much absorbed by her own restlessness to think or to look. She was turning over the slippery pages of an American magazine. When the hall door swung, a wedge of light fell upon the floor and a small white figure upon whom the light seemed focused, made straight across the room to her. "'What, you here?' Evelyn exclaimed. "'Just caught a glimpse of you at lunch, but you wouldn't condescend to look at me.' It was part of Evelyn's character that, in spite of many snubs which she received or imagined, she never gave up the pursuit of people she wanted to know, and in the long run generally succeeded in knowing them, and even in making them like her. She looked round her. 
I hate this place. I hate these people, she said. I wish you'd come up to my room with me. I do want to talk to you. As Rachel had no wish to go or to stay, Evelyn took her by the wrist and drew her out of the hall and up the stairs. As they went upstairs two steps at a time, Evelyn, who still kept hold of Rachel's hand, ejaculated broken sentences about not caring a hang what people said. Why should you, if one knows one's right? And let em all go to blazes. Them's my opinions. She was in a state of great excitement and the muscles of her arms were twitching nervously. It was evident that she was only waiting for the door to shut to tell Rachel all about it. Indeed, directly they were inside her room, she sat on the end of the bed and said, I suppose you think I'm mad. Rachel was not in the mood to think clearly about anyone's state of mind. She was, however, in the mood to say straight out whatever occurred to her, without fear of the consequences. "'Somebody's proposed to you,' she remarked. "'How on earth did you guess that?' Evelyn exclaimed, some pleasure mingling with her surprise. "'Do I look as if I'd just had a proposal?' You look as if you had them every day, Rachel replied. But I don't suppose I've had more than you've had. Evelyn laughed rather insincerely. I've never had one. But you will. Lots. It's the easiest thing in the world. But that's not what's happened this afternoon exactly. It's... Oh, it's a muddle, a detestable, horrible, disgusting muddle. She went to the washstand and began sponging her cheeks with cold water, for they were burning hot. Still sponging them and trembling slightly, she turned and explained in the high-pitched voice of nervous excitement. Alfred Parrott says I've promised to marry him, and I say I never did. Sinclair says he'll shoot himself if I don't marry him, and I say, well, shoot yourself. But of course he doesn't. They never do. And Sinclair got hold of me this afternoon and began bothering me to give an answer and accusing me of flirting with Alfred Parrott and told me I'd no heart and was merely a siren oh, and quantities of pleasant things like that. So at last I said to him, Well, Sinclair, you've said enough now. You can just let me go. And then he caught me and kissed me, the disgusting brute. I can still feel his nasty hairy face just there, as if he'd any right to, after what he'd said. She sponged a spot on her left cheek energetically. I've never met a man that was fit to compare with a woman, she cried. They've no dignity. They've no courage. They've nothing but their beastly passions and their brute strength. Would any woman have behaved like that? If a man had said he didn't want her? We've too much self-respect. We're infinitely finer than they are. She walked about the room, dabbing her wet cheeks with a towel. Tears were now running down with the drops of cold water. It makes me angry, she explained, drying her eyes. Rachel sat watching her. She did not think of Evelyn's position. She only thought that the world was full of people in torment. There's only one man here I really like, Evelyn continued. Terence Hewitt. One feels as if one could trust him. At these words Rachel suffered an indescribable chill. 
her heart seemed to be pressed together by cold hands. Why, she asked, why can you trust him? I don't know, said Evelyn. Don't you have feelings about people? Feelings you're absolutely certain are right. I had a long talk with Terence the other night. I felt we were really friends after that. There's something of a woman in him. She paused as though she were thinking of very intimate things that Terence had told her. So at least Rachel interpreted her gaze. She tried to force herself to say, Has he proposed to you? But the question was too tremendous, and in another moment Evelyn was saying that the finest men were like women, and women were nobler than men. For example, one couldn't imagine a woman like Lila Harrison thinking a mean thing or having anything base about her. How I'd like you to know her, she exclaimed. She was becoming much calmer, and her cheeks were now quite dry. Her eyes had regained their usual expression of keen vitality, and she seemed to have forgotten Alfred and Sinclair and her emotion. Lila runs a home for inebriate women in the Deptford Road, she continued. She started it, managed it, did everything off her own bat, and it's now the biggest of its kind in England. You can't think what those women are like, and their homes. But she goes among them at all hours of the day and night. I've often been with her. That's what's the matter with us. We don't do things. What do you do? she demanded, looking at Rachel with a slightly ironical smile. Rachel had scarcely listened to any of this and her expression was vacant and unhappy. She had conceived an equal dislike for Lila Harrison and her work in the Deptford Road, and for Evelyn M. and her profusion of love affairs. I play, she said, with an affectation of stolid composure. That's about it, Evelyn laughed. We none of us do anything but play, and that's why women like Lila Harrison, who's worth twenty of you and me, have to work themselves to the bone. But I'm tired of playing, she went on, lying flat on the bed and raising her arms above her head. Thus stretched out, she looked more diminutive than ever. I'm going to do something. I've got a splendid idea. Look here, you must join. I'm sure you've got any amount of stuff in you, though you look, well, as if you'd lived all your life in a garden. She sat up and began to explain with animation. I belong to a club in London. It meets every Saturday so it's called the Saturday Club. We're supposed to talk about art, but I'm sick of talking about art. What's the good of it? With all kinds of real things going on round one. It isn't as if they'd got anything to say about art either. So what I'm going to tell em is that we've talked enough about art, and we'd better talk about life for a change questions that really matter to people's lives. The white slave traffic, women's suffrage, the insurance bill, and so on. And when we've made up our mind what we want to do, we could form ourselves into a society for doing it. I'm certain that if people like ourselves were to take things in hand instead of leaving it to policemen and magistrates, we could put a stop to prostitution. She lowered her voice at the ugly word. In six months. 
My idea is that men and women ought to join in these matters. We ought to go into Piccadilly and stop one of these poor wretches and say, Now look here, I'm no better than you are, and I don't pretend to be any better. But you're doing what you know to be beastly, and I won't have you doing beastly things, because we're all the same under our skins. And if you do a beastly thing, it does matter to me. That's what Mr. Bax was saying this morning, and it's true, though you clever people, you're clever too, aren't you? Don't believe it. When Evelyn began talking, it was a fact she often regretted. Her thoughts came so quickly that she never had any time to listen to other people's thoughts. She continued without more pause than was needed for taking breath. I don't see why the Saturday Club people shouldn't do a really great work in that way, she went on. Of course it would want organization someone to give their life to it. But I'm ready to do that. My notion's to think of the human beings first, and let the abstract ideas take care of themselves. What's wrong with Lila, if there is anything wrong, is that she thinks of temperance first, and the women afterwards. Now there's one thing I'll say to my credit, she continued. I'm not intellectual or artistic or anything of that sort, but I'm jolly human. She slipped off the bed and sat on the floor, looking up at Rachel. She searched up into her face as if she were trying to read what kind of character was concealed behind the face. She put her hand on Rachel's knee. It is being human that counts, isn't it? She continued. Being real, whatever Mr. Hurst may say. Are you real? Rachel felt much as Terence had felt, that Evelyn was too close to her, and that there was something exciting in this closeness, although it was also disagreeable. She was spared the need of finding an answer to the question, for Evelyn proceeded. Do you believe in anything? In order to put an end to the scrutiny of these bright blue eyes, and to relieve her own physical restlessness, Rachel pushed back her chair and exclaimed, In everything, and began to finger different objects the books on the table, the photographs, the freshly leaved plant with the stiff bristles, which stood in a large earthenware pot in the window. I believe in the bed, in the photographs, in the pot, in the balcony, in the sun, in Mrs. Flushing, she remarked, still speaking recklessly, with something at the back of her mind forcing her to say the things that one usually does not say. But I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Mr. Bax. I don't believe in the hospital nurse. I don't believe... She took up a photograph and, looking at it, did not finish her sentence. That's my mother, said Evelyn who remained sitting on the floor, binding her knees together with her arms, and watching Rachel curiously. Rachel considered the portrait. Well, I don't much believe in her, she remarked after a time in a low tone of voice. Mrs. Murgatroyd looked indeed as if the life had been crushed out of her. She knelt on a chair gazing piteously from behind the body of a Pomeranian dog, which she clasped to her cheek, as if for protection. "'And that's my dad,' said Evelyn, for there were two photographs in one frame. 
The second photograph represented a handsome soldier, with high regular features and a heavy black moustache. His hand rested on the hilt of his sword. There was a decided likeness between him and Evelyn. "'And it's because of them,' said Evelyn, "'that I'm going to help the other women. "'You've heard about me, I suppose. "'They weren't married, you see. "'I'm not anybody in particular. "'I'm not a bit ashamed of it. "'They loved each other somehow, "'and that's more than most people can say of their parents.' Rachel sat down on the bed with the two pictures in her hands and compared them, the man and the woman who had, so Evelyn said, loved each other. That fact interested her more than the campaign on behalf of unfortunate women, which Evelyn was once more beginning to describe. She looked again from one to the other. "'What do you think it's like?' she asked, as Evelyn paused for a minute. "'Being in love.' "'Have you never been in love?' Evelyn asked. "'Oh, no. One's only got to look at you to see that,' she added. She considered. "'I really was in love once,' she said. She fell into reflection, her eyes losing their bright vitality and approaching something like an expression of tenderness. It was heavenly, while it lasted. The worst of it is, it don't last. Not with me. That's the bother. She went on to consider the difficulty with Alfred and Sinclair, about which she had pretended to ask Rachel's advice. But she did not want advice. She wanted intimacy. When she looked at Rachel, who was still looking at the photographs on the bed, she could not help seeing that Rachel was not thinking about her. What was she thinking about, then? Evelyn was tormented by the little spark of life in her, which was always trying to work through to other people and was always being rebuffed. Falling silent, she looked at her visitor, her shoes, her stockings, the combs in her hair, all the details of her dress, in short, as though by seizing every detail she might get closer to the life within. Rachel at last put down the photographs, walked to the window, and remarked, it's odd. People talk as much about love as they do about religion. I wish you'd sit down and talk, said Evelyn impatiently. Instead, Rachel opened the window, which was made in two long panes, and looked down into the garden below. That's where we got lost the first night, she said. It must have been in those bushes. They kill hens down there, said Evelyn. They cut their heads off with a knife. Disgusting. But tell me, what? I'd like to explore the hotel, Rachel interrupted. She drew her head in and looked at Evelyn, who still sat on the floor. It's just like other hotels, said Evelyn. That might be although every room and passage and chair in the place had a character of its own in Rachel's eyes. But she could not bring herself to stay in one place any longer. She moved slowly towards the door. "'What is it you want?' said Evelyn. "'You make me feel as if you were always thinking of something you don't say. Do say it.' But Rachel made no response to this invitation either. She stopped with her fingers on the handle of the door, as if she remembered that some sort of pronouncement was due from her. 
I suppose you'll marry one of them, she said, and then turned the handle and shut the door behind her. She walked slowly down the passage, running her hand along the wall beside her. She did not think which way she was going, and therefore walked down a passage which only led to a window and a balcony. She looked down at the kitchen premises, the wrong side of the hotel life which was cut off from the right side by a maze of small bushes. The ground was bare. Old tins were scattered about, and the bushes wore towels and aprons upon their heads to dry. Every now and then a waiter came out in a white apron and threw rubbish on to a heap. Two large women in cotton dresses were sitting on a bench with blood-smeared tin trays in front of them and yellow bodies across their knees. They were plucking the birds and talking as they plucked. Suddenly a chicken came floundering, half-flying, half-running into the space, pursued by a third woman, whose age could hardly be under eighty. Although wizened and unsteady on her legs, she kept up the chase, egged on by the laughter of the others. Her face was expressive of furious rage, and as she ran she swore in Spanish. Frightened by hand-clapping here, a napkin there. The bird ran this way and that in sharp angles, and finally fluttered straight at the old woman, who opened her scanty grey skirts to enclose it, dropped upon it in a bundle, and then holding it out, cut its head off with an expression of vindictive energy and triumph combined. The blood and the ugly wriggling fascinated Rachel, so that although she knew that someone had come up behind and was standing beside her, she did not turn round until the old woman had settled down on the bench beside the others. Then she looked up sharply, because of the ugliness of what she had seen. It was Miss Allen who stood beside her. Not a pretty sight said Miss Allen, although I dare say it's really more humane than our method. I don't believe you've ever been in my room, she added, and turned away as if she meant Rachel to follow her. Rachel followed, for it seemed possible that each new person might remove the mystery which burdened her. The bedrooms at the hotel were all on the same pattern, save that some were larger and some smaller. They had a floor of dark red tiles. They had a high bed, draped in mosquito curtains. They had each a writing table and a dressing table, and a couple of armchairs. But directly a box was unpacked, the rooms became very different so that Miss Allen's room was very unlike Evelyn's room. There were no variously colored hat pins on her dressing table, no scent bottles, no narrow curved pair of scissors, no great variety of shoes and boots, no silk petticoats lying on the chairs. The room was extremely neat. There seemed to be two pairs of everything. The writing table, however, was piled with manuscript, and a table was drawn out to stand by the armchair, on which were two separate heaps of dark library books, in which there were many slips of paper sticking out at different degrees of thickness. Miss Allen had asked Rachel to come in out of kindness, thinking that she was waiting about with nothing to do. Moreover, she liked young women, for she had taught many of them, and having received so much hospitality from the Ambroses, she was glad to be able to repay a minute part of it. She looked about accordingly for something to show her. The room did not provide much entertainment. 
She touched her manuscript. Age of Chaucer, age of Elizabeth, age of Dryden, she reflected. I'm glad there aren't many more ages. I'm still in the middle of the eighteenth century. Won't you sit down, Miss Vinrace? The chair, though small, is firm. Euphues. The germ of the English novel, she continued, glancing at another page. Is that the kind of thing that interests you? She looked at Rachel with great kindness and simplicity, as though she would do her utmost to provide anything she wished to have. This expression had a remarkable charm in a face otherwise much lined with care and thought. Oh, no, it's music with you, isn't it? She continued, recollecting. And I generally find that they don't go together. Sometimes, of course, we have prodigies. She was looking about her for something and now saw a jar on the mantelpiece which she reached down and gave to Rachel. If you put your finger into this jar, you may be able to extract a piece of preserved ginger. Are you a prodigy? But the ginger was deep and could not be reached. Don't bother, she said, as Miss Allen looked about for some other implement. I dare say I shouldn't like preserved ginger. You've never tried? inquired Miss Allen. Then I consider that it is your duty to try now. Why, you may add a new pleasure to life, and as you are still young. She wondered whether a button-hook would do. I make it a rule to try everything, she said. Don't you think it would be very annoying if you tasted ginger for the first time on your deathbed and found you never liked anything so much? I should be so exceedingly annoyed that I think I should get well on that count alone. She was now successful, and a lump of ginger emerged on the end of the button-hook. While she went to wipe the button-hook, Rachel bit the ginger and at once cried, I must spit it out. Are you sure you have really tasted it? Miss Allen demanded. For answer, Rachel threw it out of the window. An experience, anyhow, said Miss Allen calmly. Let me see. I have nothing else to offer you, unless you would like to taste this. A small cupboard hung above her bed, and she took out of it a slim, elegant jar filled with a bright green fluid. Creme de menthe, she said. The cure, you know. It looks as if I drank, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, it goes to prove what an exceptionally abstemious person I am. I've had that jar for six and twenty years, she added looking at it with pride as she tipped it over, and from the height of the liquid it could be seen that the bottle was still untouched. Twenty-six years, Rachel exclaimed. Miss Allen was gratified, for she had meant Rachel to be surprised. When I went to Dresden six and twenty years ago, she said, a certain friend of mine announced her intention of making me a present. She thought that in the event of shipwreck or accident, a stimulant might be useful. However, as I had no occasion for it, I gave it back on my return. On the eve of any foreign journey, the same bottle always makes its appearance, with the same note. On my return in safety, it is always handed back. I consider it a kind of charm against accidents. Though I was once detained twenty-four hours by an accident to the train in front of me, 
I have never met with any accident myself. Yes, she continued, now addressing the bottle. We have seen many climbs and cupboards together, have we not? I intend one of these days to have a silver label made with an inscription. It is a gentleman, as you may observe, and his name is Oliver. I do not think I could forgive you, Miss Vinrace, if you broke my Oliver, she said, firmly taking the bottle out of Rachel's hands and replacing it in the cupboard. Rachel was swinging the bottle by the neck. She was interested by Miss Allen, to the point of forgetting the bottle. Well, she exclaimed, I do think that odd, to have had a friend for twenty-six years and a bottle, and to have made all those journeys. Not at all. I call it the reverse of odd, Miss Allen replied. I always consider myself the most ordinary person I know. It's rather distinguished to be as ordinary as I am. I forget. Are you a prodigy, or did you say you were not a prodigy? She smiled at Rachel very kindly. She seemed to have known and experienced so much as she moved cumbrously about the room, that surely there must be balm for all anguish in her words, could one induce her to have recourse to them. But Miss Allen, who was now locking the cupboard door, showed no signs of breaking the reticence which had snowed her under for years. An unfortunate sensation kept Rachel silent, on the one hand, she wished to whirl high and strike a spark out of the cool pink flesh. On the other, she perceived there was nothing to be done but to drift past each other in silence. I'm not a prodigy. I find it very difficult to say what I mean, she observed at length. It's a matter of temperament, I believe. Miss Allen helped her. There are some people who have no difficulty. For myself I find there are a great many things I simply cannot say. But then I consider myself very slow. One of my colleagues now knows whether she likes you or not. Let me see, how does she do it? By the way you say good morning at breakfast. It is sometimes a matter of years before I can make up my mind, but most young people seem to find it easy. Oh, no, said Rachel, it's hard. Miss Allen looked at Rachel quietly, saying nothing. She suspected that there were difficulties of some kind. Then she put her hand to the back of her head and discovered that one of the grey coils of hair had come loose. I must ask you to be so kind as to excuse me, she said, rising, if I do my hair. I have never yet found a satisfactory type of hairpin. I must change my dress, too, for the matter of that, and I should be particularly glad of your assistance because there is a tiresome set of hooks which I can fasten for myself, but it takes from ten to fifteen minutes, whereas with your help. She slipped off her coat and skirt and blouse, and stood doing her hair before the glass, a massive homely figure, her petticoat being so short that she stood on a pair of thick slate gray legs. People say youth is pleasant. I myself find middle age far pleasanter, she remarked, removing hairpins and combs and taking up her brush. When it fell loose her hair only came down to her neck. 
When one was young, she continued, things could seem so very serious if one was made that way. And now my dress. In a wonderfully short space of time her hair had been reformed in its usual loops. The upper half of her body now became dark green with black stripes on it. The skirt, however, needed hooking at various angles, and Rachel had to kneel on the floor, fitting the eyes to the hooks. Our Miss Johnson used to find life very unsatisfactory, I remember, Miss Allen continued. She turned her back to the light, and then she took to breeding guinea pigs for their spots, and became absorbed in that. I have just heard that the yellow guinea pig has had a black baby. We had a bet of sixpence on about it. She will be very triumphant. The skirt was fastened. She looked at herself in the glass with the curious stiffening of her face generally caused by looking in the glass. Am I in a fit state to encounter my fellow beings? she asked. I forget which way it is. But they find black animals very rarely have coloured babies. It may be the other way round. I have had it so often explained to me that it is very stupid of me to have forgotten again. She moved about the room, acquiring small objects with quiet force, and fixing them about her. A locket, a watch and chain, a heavy gold bracelet, and the party-coloured button of a suffrage society. Finally, completely equipped for Sunday tea, she stood before Rachel and smiled at her kindly. She was not an impulsive woman, and her life had schooled her to restrain her tongue. At the same time, she was possessed of an amount of good will towards others, and in particular towards the young, which often made her regret that speech was so difficult. Shall we descend? she said. She put one hand upon Rachel's shoulder, and stooping, picked up a pair of walking shoes with the other, and placed them neatly side by side outside her door. As they walked down the passage, they passed many pairs of boots and shoes, some black and some brown, all side by side, and all different, even to the way in which they lay together. I always think that people are so like their boots, said Miss Allen. That is Mrs. Paley's. But as she spoke, the door opened, and Mrs. Paley rolled out in her chair, equipped also for tea. She greeted Miss Allen and Rachel. I was just saying that people are so like their boots, said Miss Allen. Mrs. Paley did not hear. She repeated it more loudly still. Mrs. Paley did not hear. She repeated it a third time. Mrs. Paley heard, but she did not understand. She was apparently about to repeat it for the fourth time, when Rachel suddenly said something inarticulate and disappeared down the corridor. This misunderstanding, which involved a complete block in the passage, seemed to her unbearable. She walked quickly and blindly in the opposite direction, and found herself at the end of a cul-de-sac. There was a window, and a table and a chair in the window, and upon the table stood a rusty inkstand, an ashtray, an old copy of a French newspaper, and a pen with a broken nib. Rachel sat down as if to study the French newspaper, 
but a tear fell on the blurred French print, raising a soft blot. She lifted her head sharply, exclaiming aloud, It's intolerable! Looking out of the window, with eyes that would have seen nothing even had they not been dazed by tears, she indulged herself at last in violent abuse of the entire day. It had been miserable from start to finish. First the service in the chapel, then luncheon, then Evelyn, then Miss Allen, then old Mrs. Paley blocking up the passage. All day long she had been tantalized and put off. She had now reached one of those eminences, the result of some crisis, from which the world is finally displayed in its true proportions. She disliked the look of it immensely. Churches, politicians, misfits, and huge impostures. Men like Mr. Dalloway, men like Mr. Bax, Evelyn and her chatter, Mrs. Paley blocking up the passage. Meanwhile the steady beat of her own pulse represented the hot current of feeling that ran down beneath, beating, struggling, fretting. For the time her own body was the source of all the life in the world, which tried to burst forth here, there, and was repressed now by Mr. Bax, now by Evelyn, now by the imposition of ponderous stupidity, the weight of the entire world. Thus tormented, she would twist her hands together, for all things were wrong, all people stupid. Vaguely seeing that there were people down in the garden beneath, she represented them as aimless masses of matter, floating hither and thither, without aim except to impede her. What were they doing, those other people in the world? Nobody knows, she said. The force of her rage was beginning to spend itself, and the vision of the world which had been so vivid became dim. It's a dream, she murmured. She considered the rusty inkstand, the pen, the ashtray, and the old French newspaper. These small and worthless objects seemed to her to represent human lives. We're asleep and dreaming, she repeated, but the possibility which now suggested itself that one of the shapes might be the shape of Terence, roused her from her melancholy lethargy. She became as restless as she had been before she sat down. She was no longer able to see the world as a town laid out beneath her. It was covered instead by a haze of feverish red mist. She had returned to the state in which she had been all day. Thinking was no escape. Physical movement was the only refuge. In and out of rooms, in and out of people's minds, seeking she knew not what. Therefore she rose, pushing back the table, and went downstairs. She went out of the hall door, and, turning the corner of the hotel, found herself among the people whom she had seen from the window. But owing to the broad sunshine after shaded passages, and to the substance of living people after dreams, the group appeared with startling intensity, as though the dusty surface had been peeled off everything, leaving only the reality and the instant. It had the look of a vision printed on the dark at night. 
white and grey and purple figures were scattered on the green, round wicker tables. In the middle, the flame of the tea urn made the air waver like a faulty sheet of glass. A massive green tree stood over them as if it were a moving force held at rest. As she approached, she could hear Evelyn's voice repeating monotonously, Here then, here, good doggy, come here. For a moment nothing seemed to happen. It all stood still, and then she realized that one of the figures was Helen Ambrose, and the dust again began to settle. The group indeed had come together in a miscellaneous way, one tea-table joining to another tea-table, and deck-chairs serving to connect two groups. But even at a distance it could be seen that Mrs. Flushing, upright and imperious, dominated the party. She was talking vehemently to Helen across the table. Ten days under canvas, she was saying. No comforts. If you want comforts, don't come. But I may tell you, if you don't come, you'll regret it all your life. You say yes? At this moment Mrs. Flushing caught sight of Rachel. Ah, there's your niece. She's promised. You're coming, aren't you? Having adopted the plan, she pursued it with the energy of a child. Rachel took her part with eagerness. Of course I'm coming. So are you, Helen. And Mr. Pepper, too. As she sat, she realized that she was surrounded by people she knew, but that Terence was not among them. From various angles people began saying what they thought of the proposed expedition. According to some it would be hot, but the nights would be cold. According to others the difficulties would lie rather in getting a boat and in speaking the language. Mrs. Flushing disposed of all objections, whether due to man or due to nature by announcing that her husband would settle all that. Meanwhile, Mr. Flushing quietly explained to Helen that the expedition was really a simple matter. It took five days at the outside, and the place, a native village, was certainly well worth seeing before she returned to England. Helen murmured ambiguously, and did not commit herself to one answer rather than to another. The tea-party, however, included too many different kinds of people for general conversation to flourish, and from Rachel's point of view possessed the great advantage that it was quite unnecessary for her to talk. Over there Susan and Arthur were explaining to Mrs. Paley that an expedition had been proposed, and Mrs. Paley, having grasped the fact, gave the advice of an old traveller that they should take nice canned vegetables, fur cloaks, and insect powder. She leant over to Mrs. Flushing and whispered something, which from the twinkle in her eyes probably had reference to bugs. Then Helen was reciting Toll for the Brave to St. John Hurst, in order apparently to win a sixpence which lay upon the table, while Mr. Hewling Elliot imposed silence upon his section of the audience by his fascinating anecdote of Lord Curzon and the undergraduate's bicycle. Mrs. Thornbury was trying to remember the name of a man who might have been another Garibaldi, and had written a book which they ought to read. And Mr. Thornbury recollected that he had a pair of binoculars at anybody's service. Miss Allen, meanwhile, murmured, with a curious intimacy, 
which a spinster often achieves with dogs, to the fox terrier which Evelyn had at last induced to come over to them. Little particles of dust or blossom fell on the plates now and then, when the branches sighed above. Rachel seemed to see and hear a little of everything, much as a river feels the twigs that fall into it and sees the sky above, but her eyes were too vague for Evelyn's liking. She came across and sat on the ground at Rachel's feet. Well, she asked suddenly, what are you thinking about? Miss Warrington, Rachel replied rashly, because she had to say something. She did indeed see Susan murmuring to Mrs. Elliot, while Arthur stared at her with complete confidence in his own love. Both Rachel and Evelyn then began to listen to what Susan was saying. There's the ordering, and the dogs, and the garden, and the children coming to be taught, her voice proceeded rhythmically, as if checking the list, and my tennis, and the village, and letters to write for father, and a thousand little things that don't sound much, but I never have a moment to myself, and when I go to bed, I'm so sleepy I'm off before my head touches the pillow. Besides, I like to be a great deal with my aunts. I'm a great bore, aren't I, Aunt Emma? She smiled at old Mrs. Paley, who with head slightly drooped, was regarding the cake with speculative affection. And father has to be very careful about chills in winter, which means a great deal of running about, because he won't look after himself any more than you will, Arthur. So it all mounts up. Her voice mounted, too, in a mild ecstasy of satisfaction with her life and her own nature. Rachel suddenly took a violent dislike to Susan, ignoring all that was kindly, modest, and even pathetic about her. She appeared insincere and cruel. She saw her grown stout and prolific, the kind blue eyes now shallow and watery, the bloom of the cheeks congealed to a network of dry red canals. Helen turned to her. Did you go to church? she asked. She had won her sixpence and seemed making ready to go. Yes, said Rachel. For the last time, she added. In preparing to put on her gloves, Helen dropped one. You're not going? Evelyn asked taking hold of one glove as if to keep them. "'It's high time we went,' said Helen. "'Don't you see how silent everyone's getting?' A silence had fallen upon them all, caused partly by one of the accidents of talk, and partly because they saw someone approaching. Helen could not see who it was, but keeping her eyes fixed upon Rachel, observed something which made her say to herself, So it's Hewitt. She drew on her gloves with a curious sense of the significance of the moment. Then she rose, for Mrs. Flushing had seen Hewitt too, and was demanding information about rivers and boats, which showed that the whole conversation would now come over again. Rachel followed her, and they walked in silence down the avenue. In spite of what Helen had seen and understood, the feeling that was uppermost in her mind was now curiously perverse. If she went on this expedition, she would not be able to have a bath. The effort appeared to her to be great and disagreeable. 
It's so unpleasant being cooped up with people one hardly knows, she remarked. People who mind being seen naked. You don't mean to go? Rachel asked. The intensity with which this was spoken irritated Mrs. Ambrose. I don't mean to go, and I don't mean not to go, she replied. She became more and more casual and indifferent. After all, I dare say we've seen all there is to be seen, and there's the bother of getting there. And whatever they may say, it's bound to be vilely uncomfortable. For some time Rachel made no reply, but every sentence Helen spoke increased her bitterness. At last she broke out. Thank God, Helen, I'm not like you. I sometimes think you don't think or feel or care to do anything but exist. You're like Mr. Hurst. You see that things are bad, and you pride yourself on saying so. It's what you call being honest. As a matter of fact, it's being lazy, being dull, being nothing. You don't help. You put an end to things. Helen smiled as if she rather enjoyed the attack. "'Well?' she inquired. "'It seems to me bad, that's all,' Rachel replied. "'Quite likely,' said Helen. "'At any other time, Rachel would probably have been silenced by her aunt's candor. "'But this afternoon she was not in the mood to be silenced by anyone. "'A quarrel would be welcome.' You're only half alive, she continued. Is that because I didn't accept Mr. Flushing's invitation? Helen asked. Or do you always think that? At the moment it appeared to Rachel that she had always seen the same faults in Helen, from the very first night on board the Euphrosyne. In spite of her beauty, in spite of her magnanimity and their love. Oh, it's only what's the matter with everyone, she exclaimed. No one feels. No one does anything but hurt. I tell you, Helen, the world's bad. It's an agony, living, wanting. Here she tore a handful of leaves from a bush and crushed them to control herself. The lives of these people, she tried to explain. The aimlessness, the way they live. One goes from one to another, and it's all the same. One never gets what one wants out of any of them. Her emotional state and her confusion would have made her an easy prey if Helen had wished to argue, or had wished to draw confidences. But instead of talking, she fell into a profound silence as they walked on. Aimless, trivial, meaningless, oh no! What she had seen at tea made it impossible for her to believe that. The little jokes, the chatter, the inanities of the afternoon had shriveled up before her eyes. Underneath the likings and spites, the comings together and partings, great things were happening, terrible things, because they were so great. Her sense of safety was shaken as if beneath twigs and dead leaves she had seen the movement of a snake. It seemed to her that a moment's respite was allowed, a moment's make-believe, and then again the profound and reasonless law asserted itself, molding them all to its liking, making and destroying. 
She looked at Rachel walking beside her, still crushing the leaves in her fingers and absorbed in her own thoughts. She was in love, and she pitied her profoundly. But she roused herself from these thoughts and apologized. I'm very sorry, she said, but if I'm dull, it's my nature, and it can't be helped. If it was a natural defect, however, she found an easy remedy, for she went on to say that she thought Mr. Flushing's scheme a very good one, only needing a little consideration, which it appeared she had given it by the time they reached home. By that time they had settled that if anything more was said, they would accept Chapter Twenty of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When considered in detail by Mr. Flushing and Mrs. Ambrose, the expedition proved neither dangerous nor difficult. They found also that it was not even unusual. Every year at this season, English people made parties which steamed a short way up the river landed and looked at the native village, bought a certain number of things from the natives, and returned again without damage done to mind or body. When it was discovered that six people really wished the same thing, the arrangements were soon carried out. Since the time of Elizabeth, very few people had seen the river and nothing had been done to change its appearance from what it was to the eyes of the Elizabethan voyagers. The time of Elizabeth was only distant from the present time by a moment of space compared with the ages which had passed since the water had run between those banks, and the green thickets swarmed there, and the small trees had grown to huge wrinkled trees in solitude. Changing only with the change of the sun and the clouds, the waving green mass had stood there for century after century, and the water had run between its banks ceaselessly, sometimes washing away earth and sometimes the branches of trees while in other parts of the world one town had risen upon the ruins of another town, and the men in the towns had become more and more articulate and unlike each other. A few miles of this river were visible from the top of the mountain, where some weeks before the party from the hotel had picnicked. Susan and Arthur had seen it as they kissed each other, and Terence and Rachel as they sat talking about Richmond, and Evelyn and Parrot as they strolled about, imagining that they were great captains sent to colonize the world. They had seen the broad blue mark across the sand where it flowed into the sea, and the green cloud of trees massed themselves about it farther up, and finally hide its waters altogether from sight. At intervals for the first twenty miles or so, houses were scattered on the bank. By degrees the houses became huts, and later still there was neither hut nor house, but trees and grass, which were seen only by hunters, explorers, or merchants, marching or sailing, but making no settlement. By leaving Santa Marina early in the morning, driving twenty miles and riding eight, the party which was composed finally of six English people reached the riverside as the night fell. They came cantering through the trees, Mr. and Mrs. Flushing, Helen Ambrose, 
Rachel, Terence, and St. John. The tired little horses then stopped automatically, and the English dismounted. Mrs. Flushing strode to the river bank in high spirits. The day had been long and hot, but she had enjoyed the speed and the open air. She had left the hotel which she hated, and she found the company to her liking. The river was swirling past in the darkness. They could just distinguish the smooth moving surface of the water, and the air was full of the sound of it. They stood in an empty space in the midst of great tree trunks, and out there a little green light moving slightly up and down showed them where the steamer lay in which they were to embark. When they all stood upon its deck they found that it was a very small boat which throbbed gently beneath them for a few minutes, and then shoved smoothly through the water. They seemed to be driving into the heart of the night, for the trees closed in front of them, and they could hear all round them the rustling of leaves. The great darkness had the usual effect of taking away all desire for communication, by making their words sound thin and small, and after walking round the deck three or four times, they clustered together, yawning deeply, and looking at the same spot of deep gloom on the banks, murmuring very low in the rhythmical tone of one oppressed by the air. Mrs. Flushing began to wonder where they were to sleep, for they could not sleep downstairs. They could not sleep in a dog-hole smelling of oil. They could not sleep on deck. They could not sleep. She yawned profoundly. It was as Helen had foreseen. The question of nakedness had risen already although they were half asleep and almost invisible to each other. With St. John's help she stretched an awning and persuaded Mrs. Flushing that she could take off her clothes behind this, and that no one would notice if by chance some part of her which had been concealed for forty-five years was laid bare to the human eye. Mattresses were thrown down, rugs provided, and the three women lay near each other in the soft open air. The gentlemen, having smoked a certain number of cigarettes, dropped the glowing ends into the river, and looked for a time at the ripples wrinkling the black water beneath them, undressed too, and lay down at the other end of the boat. They were very tired, and curtained from each other by the darkness, the light from one lantern fell upon a few ropes, a few planks of the deck, and the rail of the boat, but beyond that there was unbroken darkness. No light reached their faces or the trees which were massed on the sides of the river. Soon Wilfred Flushing slept, and Hurst slept. Hewitt alone lay awake looking straight up into the sky. The gentle motion and the black shapes that were drawn ceaselessly across his eyes had the effect of making it impossible for him to think. Rachel's presence so near him lulled thought asleep. Being so near him, only a few paces off at the other end of the boat, she made it as impossible for him to think about her as it would have been impossible to see her if she had stood quite close to him, her forehead against his forehead. In some strange way the boat became identified with himself, and just as it would have been useless for him to get up and steer the boat, so was it useless for him to struggle any longer with the irresistible force of his own feelings. He was drawn on and on, away from all he knew, 
slipping over barriers and past landmarks into unknown waters, as the boat glided over the smooth surface of the river. In profound peace, enveloped in deeper unconsciousness than had been his for many nights, he lay on deck watching the treetops change their position slightly against the sky, and arch themselves, and sink and tower huge, until he passed from seeing them into dreams where he lay beneath the shadow of the vast trees, looking up into the sky. When they woke next morning they had gone a considerable way up the river. On the right was a high yellow bank of sand tufted with trees. On the left a swamp quivering with long reeds and tall bamboos, on the top of which, swaying slightly, perched vivid green and yellow birds. The morning was hot and still. After breakfast they drew chairs together and sat in an irregular semicircle in the bow. An awning above their heads protected them from the heat of the sun, and the breeze which the boat made aired them softly. Mrs. Flushing was already dotting and striping her canvas, her head jerking this way and that with the action of a bird nervously picking up grain. The others had books or pieces of paper or embroidery on their knees, at which they looked fitfully and again looked at the river ahead. At one point Hewitt read part of a poem aloud, but the number of moving things entirely vanquished his words. He ceased to read, and no one spoke. They moved on under the shelter of the trees. There was now a covey of red birds feeding on one of the little islets to the left, or again a blue-green parrot flew shrieking from tree to tree. As they moved on, the country grew wilder and wilder. The trees and the undergrowth seemed to be strangling each other near the ground in a multitudinous wrestle, while here and there a splendid tree towered high above the swarm, shaking its thin green umbrellas lightly in the upper air. Hewitt looked at his books again. The morning was peaceful as the night had been, only it was very strange because he could see it was light, and he could see Rachel and hear her voice and be near to her. He felt as if he were waiting, as if somehow he were stationary among things that passed over him and around him. Voices, people's bodies, birds, only Rachel, too, was waiting with him. He looked at her sometimes as if she must know that they were waiting together, and being drawn on together, without being able to offer any resistance. Again he read from his book, Whoever you are holding me now in your hand, without one thing all will be useless. A bird gave a wild laugh, a monkey chuckled a malicious question, and, as fire fades in the hot sunshine, his words flickered and went out. By degrees, as the river narrowed, and the high sandbanks fell to level ground, thickly grown with trees, the sounds of the forest could be heard. It echoed like a hall. There were sudden cries, and then long spaces of silence, such as there are in a cathedral when a boy's voice has ceased, and the echo of it still seems to haunt about the remote places of the roof. Once Mr. Flushing rose and spoke to a sailor, and even announced that some time after luncheon the steamer would stop and they could walk a little way through the forest. There are tracks all through the trees there, he explained. We're no distance from civilization yet. 
He scrutinized his wife's painting. Too polite to praise it openly, he contented himself with cutting off one half of the picture with one hand and giving a flourish in the air with the other. God! Hurst exclaimed, staring straight ahead. Don't you think it's amazingly beautiful? Beautiful? Helen inquired. It seemed a strange little word, and Hurst and herself both so small that she forgot to answer him. Hewitt felt that he must speak. That's where the Elizabethans got their style, he mused, staring into the profusion of leaves and blossoms and prodigious fruits. Shakespeare? I hate Shakespeare, Mrs. Flushing exclaimed, and Wilfred returned admiringly. I believe you're the only person who dares to say that, Alice. But Mrs. Flushing went on painting. She did not appear to attach much value to her husband's compliment, and painted steadily, sometimes muttering a half-audible word or groan. The morning was now very hot. Look at Hurst, Mr. Flushing whispered. His sheet of paper had slipped on to the deck, his head lay back, and he drew a long, snoring breath. Terence picked up the sheet of paper and spread it out before Rachel. It was a continuation of the poem on God which he had begun in the chapel, and it was so indecent that Rachel did not understand half of it, although she saw that it was indecent. Hewitt began to fill in words where Hurst had left spaces, but he soon ceased. His pencil rolled on deck. Gradually they approached nearer and nearer to the bank on the right-hand side, so that the light which covered them became definitely green, falling through a shade of green leaves, and Mrs. Flushing set aside her sketch and stared ahead of her in silence. Hurst woke up. They were then called to luncheon, and while they ate it, the steamer came to a standstill a little way out from the bank. The boat which was towed behind them was brought to the side, and the ladies were helped into it. For protection against boredom, Helen put a book of memoirs beneath her arm, and Mrs. Flushing her paint-box, and thus equipped they allowed themselves to be set on shore on the verge of the forest. They had not strolled more than a few hundred yards along the track which ran parallel with the river before Helen professed to find it unbearably hot. The river breeze had ceased, and a hot steamy atmosphere, thick with scents, came from the forest. I shall sit down here, she announced pointing to the trunk of a tree which had fallen long ago, and was now laced across and across by creepers and thong-like brambles. She seated herself, opened her parasol, and looked at the river which was barred by the stems of trees. She turned her back to the trees which disappeared in black shadow behind her. I quite agree, said Mrs. Flushing and proceeded to undo her paint-box. Her husband strolled about to select an interesting point of view for her. Hurst cleared a space on the ground by Helen's side and seated himself with great deliberation, as if he did not mean to move until he had talked to her for a long time. Terence and Rachel were left standing by themselves without occupation. Terence saw that the time had come, as it was fated to come, but although he realized this, he was completely calm and master of himself. He chose to stand for a few moments talking to Helen, and persuading her to leave her seat. 
Rachel joined him too in advising her to come with them. Of all the people I've ever met, he said, you're the least adventurous. You might be sitting on green chairs in Hyde Park. Are you going to sit there the whole afternoon? Aren't you going to walk? Oh, no, said Helen. One's only got to use one's eye. There's everything here. Everything, she repeated in a drowsy tone of voice. What will you gain by walking? You'll be hot and disagreeable by tea-time. We shall be cool and sweet, put in Hurst. Into his eyes as he looked up at them had come yellow and green reflections from the sky and the branches, robbing them of their intentness, and he seemed to think what he did not say. It was thus taken for granted by them both that Terence and Rachel proposed to walk into the woods together. With one look at each other they turned away. "'Good-bye,' cried Rachel. "'Good-bye. Beware of snakes,' Hurst replied. He settled himself still more comfortably under the shade of the fallen tree and Helen's figure. As they went, Mr. Flushing called after them. "'We must start in an hour. Hewitt, please remember that. An hour.' whether made by man or for some reason preserved by nature. There was a wide pathway striking through the forest at right angles to the river. It resembled a drive in an English forest, save that tropical bushes with their sword-like leaves grew at the side, and the ground was covered with an unmarked springy moss instead of grass starred with little yellow flowers. As they passed into the depths of the forest, the light grew dimmer, and the noises of the ordinary world were replaced by those creaking and sighing sounds which suggest to the traveller in a forest that he is walking at the bottom of the sea. The path narrowed and turned, it was hedged in by dense creepers which knotted tree to tree, and burst here and there into star-shaped crimson blossoms. The sighing and creaking up above were broken every now and then by the jarring cry of some startled animal. The atmosphere was close, and the air came at them in languid puffs of scent. The vast green light was broken here and there by a round of pure yellow sunlight, which fell through some gap in the immense umbrella of green above, and in these yellow spaces crimson and black butterflies were circling and settling. Terence and Rachel hardly spoke. Not only did the silence weigh upon them, but they were both unable to frame any thoughts. There was something between them which had to be spoken of. One of them had to begin, but which of them was it to be? Then Hewitt picked up a red fruit and threw it as high as he could. When it dropped, he would speak. They heard the flapping of great wings, they heard the fruit go pattering through the leaves and eventually fall with a thud. The silence was again profound. Does this frighten you? Terence asked when the sound of the fruit falling had completely died away. No, she answered. I like it. She repeated, I like it. She was walking fast and holding herself more erect than usual. There was another pause. You like being with me? Terence asked. Yes, with you, she replied. He was silent for a moment. Silence seemed to have fallen upon the world. That is what I have felt ever since I knew you, he replied. 
we are happy together. He did not seem to be speaking, or she to be hearing. Very happy, she answered. They continued to walk for some time in silence, their steps unconsciously quickened. We love each other, Terence said. We love each other, she repeated. The silence was then broken by their voices, which joined in tones of strange, unfamiliar sound, which formed no words. Faster and faster they walked. Simultaneously they stopped, clasped each other in their arms, then releasing themselves, dropped to the earth. They sat side by side, Sound stood out from the background, making a bridge across their silence. They heard the swish of the trees, and some beast croaking in a remote world. We love each other, Terence repeated, searching into her face. Their faces were both very pale and quiet, and they said nothing. He was afraid to kiss her again. By degrees she drew close to him, and rested against him. In this position they sat for some time. She said, Terence, once. He answered, Rachel. Terrible, terrible, she murmured after another pause. But in saying this she was thinking as much of the persistent churning of the water as of her own feeling. On and on it went in the distance, the senseless and cruel churning of the water. She observed that the tears were running down Terence's cheeks. The next movement was on his part. A very long time seemed to have passed. He took out his watch. Flushing said an hour, We've been gone more than half an hour. And it takes that to get back, said Rachel. She raised herself very slowly. When she was standing up, she stretched her arms and drew a deep breath, half a sigh, half a yawn. She appeared to be very tired. Her cheeks were white. Which way, she asked. There said Terence. They began to walk back down the mossy path again. The sighing and creaking continued far overhead, and the jarring cries of animals. The butterflies were circling still in the patches of yellow sunlight. At first Terence was certain of his way, but as they walked he became doubtful. They had to stop to consider, and then to return and start once more, for although he was certain of the direction of the river, he was not certain of striking the point where they had left the others. Rachel followed him, stopping where he stopped, turning where he turned, ignorant of the way, ignorant why he stopped or why he turned. I don't want to be late, he said, because... He put a flower into her hand, and her fingers closed upon it quietly. We're so late, so late, so horribly late, he repeated, as if he were talking in his sleep. Ah, this is right. We turn here. They found themselves again in the broad path like the drive in an English forest, where they had started when they left the others. They walked on in silence as people walking in their sleep, and were oddly conscious now and again of the mass of their bodies. Then Rachel exclaimed suddenly, Helen! In the sunny space at the edge of the forest they saw Helen still sitting on the tree trunk, her dress showing very white in the sun, 
with Hirst still propped on his elbow by her side. They stopped instinctively. At the sight of other people they could not go on. They stood hand in hand for a minute or two in silence. They could not bear to face other people. But we must go on, Rachel insisted at last, in the curious dull tone of voice in which they had both been speaking, and with a great effort they forced themselves to cover the short distance which lay between them and the pair sitting on the tree trunk. As they approached, Helen turned round and looked at them. She looked at them for some time without speaking, and when they were close to her she said quietly, "'Did you meet Mr. Flushing? He has gone to find you. He thought you must be lost, though I told him you weren't lost.' Hurst half turned round and threw his head back so that he looked at the branches crossing themselves in the air above him. Well, was it worth the effort? he inquired dreamily. Hewitt sat down on the grass by his side and began to fan himself. Rachel had balanced herself near Helen on the end of the tree trunk. Very hot, she said. You look exhausted anyhow, said Hurst. It's fearfully close in those trees, Helen remarked, picking up her book and shaking it free from the dried blades of grass which had fallen between the leaves. Then they were all silent, looking at the river swirling past in front of them, between the trunks of the trees, until Mr. Flushing interrupted them. He broke out of the trees a hundred yards to the left, exclaiming sharply, "'Ah, so you found the way after all! But it's late, much later than we arranged, Hewitt.' He was slightly annoyed, and in his capacity as leader of the expedition, inclined to be dictatorial. He spoke quickly, using curiously sharp, meaningless words. Being late wouldn't matter normally, of course, he said, but when it's a question of keeping the men up to time. He gathered them together and made them come down to the river bank, where the boat was waiting to row them out to the steamer. The heat of the day was going down, and over their cups of tea the flushings tended to become communicative. It seemed to Terence, as he listened to them talking, that existence now went on in two different lairs. Here were the Flushings, talking, talking, somewhere high up in the air above him, and he and Rachel had dropped to the bottom of the world together. But with something of a child's directness, Mrs. Flushing had also the instinct which leads a child to suspect what its elders wished to keep hidden. She fixed Terence with her vivid blue eyes and addressed herself to him in particular. What would he do, she wanted to know, if the boat ran upon a rock and sank? Would you care for anything but saving yourself? Should I? No, no, she laughed. Not one scrap. Don't tell me. There's only two creatures the ordinary woman cares about, she continued, her child and her dog, and I don't believe it's even two with men. One reads a lot about love. That's why poetry's so dull. But what happens in real life, eh? It ain't love, she cried. Terence murmured something unintelligible. Mr. Flushing, however, had recovered his urbanity. He was smoking a cigarette, and he now answered his wife. "'You must always remember, Alice,' he said, "'that your upbringing was very unnatural. Unusual, I should say.' They had no mother, 
he explained, dropping something of the formality of his tone. And a father. He was a very delightful man, I've no doubt, but he cared only for racehorses and Greek statues. Tell them about the bath, Alice. In the stable yard, said Mrs. Flushing, covered with ice in winter. We had to get in. If we didn't, we were whipped. The strong ones lived. The others died. What you call survival of the fittest. A most excellent plan, I dare say. If you thirteen children. And all this going on in the heart of England in the nineteenth century, Mr. Flushing exclaimed, turning to Helen. I'd treat my children just the same if I had any, said Mrs. Flushing. Every word sounded quite distinctly in Terence's ears. But what were they saying, and who were they talking to? And who were they, these fantastic people, detached somewhere high up in the air? Now that they had drunk their tea, they rose and leant over the bow of the boat. The sun was going down, and the water was dark and crimson. The river had widened again, and they were passing a little island set like a dark wedge in the middle of the stream. Two great white birds with red lights on them stood there on stilt-like legs, and the beach of the island was unmarked, save by the skeleton print of birds' feet. The branches of the trees on the bank looked more twisted and angular than ever, and the green of the leaves was lurid and splashed with gold. Then Hurst began to talk, leaning over the bow. It makes one awfully queer, don't you find, he complained. These trees get on one's nerves. It's all so crazy. God's undoubtedly mad. What sane person could have conceived a wilderness like this? and peopled it with apes and alligators. I should go mad if I lived here, raving mad. Terence attempted to answer him, but Mrs. Ambrose replied instead. She bade him look at the way things masked themselves. Look at the amazing colours. Look at the shapes of the trees. She seemed to be protecting Terence from the approach of the others. Yes, said Mr. Flushing, and in my opinion, he continued, the absence of population to which Hurst objects is precisely the significant touch. You must admit, Hurst, that a little Italian town even would vulgarize the whole scene, would detract from the vastness the sense of elemental grandeur. He swept his hands towards the forest and paused for a moment, looking at the great green mass which was now falling silent. I own it makes us seem pretty small. Us, not them. He nodded his head at a sailor who leant over the side, spitting into the river. And that, I think, is what my wife feels, the essential superiority of the peasant. Under cover of Mr. Flushing's words, which continued now gently reasoning with St. John and persuading him, Terence drew Rachel to the side, pointing ostensibly to a great gnarled tree trunk which had fallen and lay half in the water. He wished at any rate to be near her, but he found that he could say nothing. They could hear Mr. Flushing flowing on, now about his wife, now about art, now about the future of the country, little meaningless words floating high in air, 
As it was becoming cold, he began to pace the deck with Hurst. Fragments of their talk came out distinctly as they passed. Art, emotion, truth, reality. Is it true or is it a dream? Rachel murmured when they had passed. It's true, it's true, he replied. But the breeze freshened, and there was a general desire for movement. When the party rearranged themselves under cover of rugs and cloaks, Terence and Rachel were at opposite ends of the circle, and could not speak to each other. But as the dark descended, the words of the others seemed to curl up and vanish as the ashes of burnt paper and left them sitting perfectly silent at the bottom of the world. Occasional starts of exquisite joy ran through them, and then Chapter Twenty One of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thanks to Mr. Flushing's discipline, the right stages of the river were reached at the right hours, and when next morning after breakfast the chairs were again drawn out in a semicircle in the bow, the launch was within a few miles of the native camp which was the limit of the journey. Mr. Flushing, as he sat down, advised them to keep their eyes fixed on the left bank, where they would soon pass a clearing, and in that clearing was a hut where Mackenzie, the famous explorer, had died of fever some ten years ago, almost within reach of civilization. Mackenzie, he repeated, the man who went farther inland than anyone's been yet. Their eyes turned that way obediently. The eyes of Rachel saw nothing. Yellow and green shapes did, it is true, pass before them. But she only knew that one was large and another small. She did not know that they were trees. These directions to look here and there irritated her, as interruptions irritate a person absorbed in thought, although she was not thinking of anything. She was annoyed with all that was said, and with the aimless movements of people's bodies, because they seemed to interfere with her and to prevent her from speaking to Terence. Very soon Helen saw her staring moodily at a coil of rope, and making no effort to listen. Mr. Flushing and St. John were engaged in more or less continuous conversation about the future of the country from a political point of view, and the degree to which it had been explored. The others, with their legs stretched out, or chins poised on the hands, gazed in silence. Mrs. Ambrose looked and listened obediently enough, but inwardly she was prey to an uneasy mood not readily to be ascribed to any one cause. Looking on shore as Mr. Flushing bade her, she thought the country very beautiful, but also sultry and alarming. She did not like to feel herself the victim of unclassified emotions, and certainly as the launch slipped on and on in the hot morning sun, she felt herself unreasonably moved. Whether the unfamiliarity of the forest was the cause of it, or something less definite, she could not determine. Her mind left the scene and occupied itself with anxieties for Ridley, for her children, for far-off things, such as old age and poverty and death. Hurst, too, was depressed. He had been looking forward to this expedition as to a holiday, 
for once away from the hotel surely wonderful things would happen instead of which nothing happened and here they were as uncomfortable as restrained as self-conscious as ever that of course was what came of looking forward to anything one was always disappointed he blamed wilfred flushing who was so well dressed and so formal he blamed hewitt and rachel why didn't they talk he looked at them sitting silent and self-absorbed and the sight annoyed him he supposed that they were engaged or about to become engaged but instead of being in the least romantic or exciting that was as dull as everything else it annoyed him too to think that they were in love he drew close to helen and began to tell her how uncomfortable his night had been lying on the deck sometimes too hot sometimes too cold and the stars so bright that he couldn't get to sleep he had lain awake all night thinking and when it was light enough to see he had written twenty lines of his poem on god and the awful thing was that he'd practically proved the fact that god did not exist he did not see that he was teasing her and he went on to wonder what would happen if god did exist an old gentleman in a beard and a long blue dressing-gown extremely testy and disagreeable as he's bound to be can you suggest a rhyme god rod sod all used any others although he spoke much as usual helen could have seen had she looked that he was also impatient and disturbed but she was not called upon to answer for mr flushing now exclaimed there they looked at the hut on the bank a desolate place with a large rent in the roof and the ground round it yellow scarred with fires and scattered with rusty open tins did they find his dead body there mrs flushing exclaimed leaning forward in her eagerness to see the spot where the explorer had died they found his body and his skins and a notebook her husband replied but the boat had soon carried them on and left the place behind it was so hot that they scarcely moved except now and then to change a foot or again to strike a match their eyes concentrated upon the bank were full of the same green reflections and their lips were slightly pressed together as though the sights they were passing gave rise to thoughts save that hurst's lips moved intermittently as half-consciously he sought rhymes for god whatever the thoughts of the others no one said anything for a considerable space they had grown so accustomed to the wall of trees on either side that they looked up with a start when the light suddenly widened out and the trees came to an end it almost reminds one of an english park said mr flushing indeed no change could have been greater on both banks of the river lay an open lawn-like space grass-covered and planted for the gentleness and order of the place suggested human care with graceful trees on the top of little mounds as far as they could gaze this lawn rose and sank with the undulating motion of an old english park the change of scene naturally suggested a change of position grateful to most of them they rose and leant over the rail it might be arundel or windsor mr flushing continued 
if you cut down that bush with the yellow flowers. And, by Jove, look! Rows of brown backs paused for a moment and then leapt with a motion as if they were springing over waves out of sight. For a moment no one of them could believe that they had really seen live animals in the open, a herd of wild deer, and the sight aroused a childlike excitement in them, dissipating their gloom. I've never in my life seen anything bigger than a hare, Hurst exclaimed with genuine excitement. What an ass I was not to bring my Kodak! Soon afterwards the launch came gradually to a standstill, and the captain explained to Mr. Flushing that it would be pleasant for the passengers if they now went for a stroll on shore. If they chose to return within an hour, he would take them on to the village. If they chose to walk, it was only a mile or two farther on, he would meet them at the landing place. The matter being settled, they were once more put on shore. The sailors producing raisins and tobacco leant upon the rail and watched the six English, whose coats and dresses looked so strange upon the green, wander off. A joke that was by no means proper set them all laughing and then they turned round and lay at their ease upon the deck. Directly they landed, Terence and Rachel drew together, slightly in advance of the others. "'Thank God!' Terence exclaimed, drawing a long breath. "'At last we're alone. "'And if we keep ahead we can talk,' said Rachel. "'Nevertheless, Although their position some yards in advance of the others made it possible for them to say anything they chose, they were both silent. "'You love me?' Terence asked at length, breaking the silence painfully. To speak or to be silent was equally an effort, for when they were silent they were keenly conscious of each other's presence and yet words were either too trivial or too large. She murmured inarticulately, ending, And you? Yes, yes, he replied, but there were so many things to be said, and now that they were alone it seemed necessary to bring themselves still more near and to surmount a barrier which had grown up since they had last spoken. It was difficult, frightening even, oddly embarrassing. At one moment he was clear-sighted, and at the next confused. Now I'm going to begin at the beginning, he said resolutely. I'm going to tell you what I ought to have told you before. In the first place, I've never been in love with other women but I've had other women. Then, I've great faults. I'm very lazy. I'm moody. He persisted in spite of her exclamation. You've got to know the worst of me. I'm lustful. I'm overcome by a sense of futility. Incompetence. I ought never to have asked you to marry me, I expect. I'm a bit of a snob. I'm ambitious. Oh, our faults, she cried. What do they matter? Then she demanded, Am I in love? Is this being in love? Are we to marry each other? Overcome by the charm of her voice and her presence, he exclaimed, Oh, you're free, Rachel. To you time will make no difference. Or marriage. Or... The voices of the others behind them kept floating, now farther, now nearer, 
and Mrs. Flushing's laugh rose clearly by itself. Marriage? Rachel repeated. The shouts were renewed behind, warning them that they were bearing too far to the left. Improving their course, he continued. Yes, marriage. The feeling that they could not be united until she knew all about him made him again endeavour to explain. All that's been bad in me. The things I've put up with. The second best. She murmured, considered her own life, but could not describe how it looked to her now. And the loneliness, he continued. A vision of walking with her through the streets of London came before his eyes. We will go for walks together, he said. The simplicity of the idea relieved them, and for the first time they laughed. They would have liked, had they dared, to take each other by the hand, but the consciousness of eyes fixed on them from behind had not yet deserted them. Books, people, sights, Mrs. Nutt, Greeley, Hutchinson, Hewitt murmured. With every word the mist which had enveloped them making them seem unreal to each other since the previous afternoon, melted a little further, and their contact became more and more natural. Up through the sultry southern landscape they saw the world they knew appear clearer and more vividly than it had ever appeared before. As upon that occasion at the hotel when she had sat in the window, the world once more arranged itself beneath her gaze, very vividly and in its true proportions. She glanced curiously at Terence from time to time, observing his grey coat and his purple tie, observing the man with whom she was to spend the rest of her life. After one of these glances she murmured, Yes, I'm in love. There's no doubt. I'm in love with you. Nevertheless, they remained uncomfortably apart, drawn so close together, as she spoke, that there seemed no division between them, and the next moment separate and far away again. Feeling this painfully, she exclaimed, It will be a fight. But as she looked at him, she perceived from the shape of his eyes, the lines about his mouth, and other peculiarities, that he pleased her, and she added, Where I want to fight, you have compassion. You're finer than I am. You're much finer. He returned her glance and smiled, perceiving, much as she had done, the very small individual things about her, which made her delightful to him. She was his for ever. This barrier being surmounted, innumerable delights lay before them both. I'm not finer, he answered. I'm only older, lazier. A man, not a woman. A man, she repeated, and, a curious sense of possession coming over her, it struck her that she might now touch him. She put out her hand and lightly touched his cheek. His fingers followed where hers had been, and the touch of his hand upon his face brought back the overpowering sense of unreality. This body of his was unreal. The whole world was unreal. What's happened? he began. Why did I ask you to marry me? How did it happen? Did you ask me to marry you? she wondered. 
they faded far away from each other, and neither of them could remember what had been said. We sat upon the ground, he recollected. We sat upon the ground, she confirmed him. The recollection of sitting upon the ground, such as it was, seemed to unite them again, and they walked on in silence, their minds sometimes working with difficulty and sometimes ceasing to work, their eyes alone perceiving the things round them. Now he would attempt again to tell her his faults and why he loved her and she would describe what she had felt at this time or at that time, and together they would interpret her feeling. So beautiful was the sound of their voices, that by degrees they scarcely listened to the words they framed. Long silences came between their words, which were no longer silences of struggle and confusion, but refreshing silences, in which trivial thoughts moved easily. They began to speak naturally of ordinary things, of the flowers and the trees, how they grew there so red like garden flowers at home, and there bent and crooked like the arm of a twisted old man. Very gently and quietly, almost as if it were the blood singing in her veins, or the water of the stream running over stones, Rachel became conscious of a new feeling within her. She wondered for a moment what it was, and then said to herself with a little surprise at recognizing in her own person so famous a thing. This is happiness, I suppose, and aloud to Terence she spoke, This is happiness. On the heels of her words he answered, This is happiness, upon which they guessed that the feeling had sprung in both of them the same time. They began, therefore, to describe how this felt and that felt, how like it was, and yet how different, for they were very different. Voices crying behind them never reached through the waters in which they were now sunk. The repetition of Hewitt's name in short dissevered syllables was to them the crack of a dry branch or the laughter of a bird. The grasses and breezes sounding and murmuring all round them, they never noticed that the swishing of the grasses grew louder and louder, and did not cease with the lapse of the breeze. A hand dropped abrupt as iron on Rachel's shoulder. It might have been a bolt from heaven. She fell beneath it and the grass whipped round her eyes and filled her mouth and ears. Through the waving stems she saw a figure, large and shapeless against the sky. Helen was upon her. Rolled this way and that, now seeing only forests of green, and now the high blue heaven. She was speechless and almost without sense. At last she lay still, all the grasses shaken round her and before her by her panting. Over her loomed two great heads, the heads of a man and woman, of Terence and Helen. Both were flushed, both laughing, and the lips were moving. They came together and kissed in the air above her. Broken fragments of speech came down to her on the ground. She thought she heard them speak of love and then of marriage, raising herself and sitting up. 
She too realised Helen's soft body and strong and hospitable arms, and happiness swelling and breaking in one vast wave. When this fell away, and the grasses once more lay low, and the sky became horizontal, and the earth rolled out flat on each side, and the trees stood upright. She was the first to perceive a little row of human figures standing patiently in the distance. For the moment she could not remember who they were. Who are they? she asked, and then recollected. Falling into line behind Mr. Flushing, they were careful to leave at least three yards' distance between the toe of his boot and the rim of her skirt. He led them across a stretch of green by the river bank, and then through a grove of trees, and bade them remark the signs of human habitation, the blackened grass, the charred tree stumps, and there, through the trees, strange wooden nests, drawn together in an arch where the trees drew apart, the village which was the goal of their journey. Stepping cautiously, they observed the women, who were squatting on the ground in triangular shapes, moving their hands, either plaiting straw or in kneading something in bowls, but when they had looked for a moment undiscovered, they were seen, and Mr. Flushing, advancing into the centre of the clearing, was engaged in talk with a lean, majestic man, whose bones and hollows at once made the shapes of the Englishman's body appear ugly and unnatural. The women took no notice of the strangers, except that their hands paused for a moment, and their long, narrow eyes slid round and fixed upon them, with the motionless, inexpressive gaze of those removed from each other far, far beyond the plunge of speech. Their hands moved again, but the stare continued. It followed them as they walked as they peered into the huts where they could distinguish guns leaning in the corner, and bowls upon the floor, and stacks of rushes. In the dusk the solemn eyes of babies regarded them, and old women stared out too. As they sauntered about, the stare followed them, passing over their legs, their bodies, their heads, curiously, not without hostility, like the crawl of a winter fly. As she drew apart her shawl and uncovered her breast to the lips of her baby, the eyes of a woman never left their faces, although they moved uneasily under her stare, and finally turned away, rather than stand there looking at her any longer. When sweetmeats were offered them, they put out great red hands to take them, and felt themselves treading cumbrously like tight-coated soldiers among these soft, instinctive people. But soon the life of the village took no notice of them. They had become absorbed in it. The women's hands became busy again with the straw. Their eyes dropped. If they moved, it was to fetch something from the hut, or to catch a straying child, or to cross the space with a jar balanced on their heads. If they spoke, it was to cry some harsh, unintelligible cry. Voices rose when a child was beaten and fell again. Voices rose in song which slid up a little way and down a little way, and settled again upon the same low and melancholy note. 
seeking each other, Terence and Rachel drew together under a tree. Peaceful and even beautiful at first, the sight of the women, who had given up looking at them, made them now feel very cold and melancholy. Well, Terence sighed at length, it makes us seem insignificant, doesn't it? Rachel agreed. So it would go on for ever and ever, she said. Those women sitting under the trees, the trees and the river. They turned away and began to walk through the trees, leaning without fear of discovery upon each other's arms. They had not gone far before they began to assure each other once more that they were in love, were happy, were content. But why was it so painful being in love? Why was there so much pain in happiness? The sight of the village indeed affected them all curiously, though all differently. St. John had left the others and was walking slowly down to the river, absorbed in his own thoughts, which were bitter and unhappy, for he felt himself alone, and Helen, standing by herself in the sunny space among the native women, was exposed to presentiments of disaster. The cries of the senseless beasts rang in her ears high and low in the air, as they ran from tree trunk to tree top. How small the little figures looked wandering through the trees. She became acutely conscious of the little limbs, the thin veins, the delicate flesh of men and women, which breaks so easily and lets the life escape, compared with these great trees and deep waters. A falling branch, a foot that slips, and the earth has crushed them, or the water drowned them. Thus thinking, she kept her eyes anxiously fixed upon the lovers, as if by doing so she could protect them from their fate turning, she found the flushings by her side. They were talking about the things they had bought, and arguing whether they were really old, and whether there were not signs here and there of European influence. Helen was appealed to. She was made to look at a brooch, and then at a pair of earrings, but all the time she blamed them for having come on this expedition, for having ventured too far and exposed themselves. Then she roused herself and tried to talk, but in a few moments she caught herself seeing a picture of a boat upset on the river in England at midday. It was morbid, she knew, to imagine such things. Nevertheless, she sought out the figures of the others between the trees, and whenever she saw them she kept her eyes fixed on them, so that she might be able to protect them from disaster. But when the sun went down and the steamer turned and began to steam back towards civilization, again her fears were calmed. In the semi-darkness the chairs on deck and the people sitting in them were angular shapes, the mouth being indicated by a tiny burning spot, and the arm by the same spot moving up or down as the cigar or cigarette was lifted to and from the lips. Words crossed the darkness, but not knowing where they fell, seemed to lack energy and substance. Deep sighs proceeded regularly, although with some attempt at suppression, from the large white mound which represented the person of Mrs. Flushing. 
The day had been long and very hot, and now that all the colours were blotted out, the cool night air seemed to press soft fingers upon the eyelids, sealing them down. Some philosophical remark directed apparently at St. John Hurst missed its aim and hung so long suspended in the air until it was engulfed by a yawn that it was considered dead and this gave the signal for stirring of legs and murmurs about sleep the white mound moved finally lengthened itself and disappeared and after a few turns and paces st john and mr flushing withdrew leaving the three chairs still occupied by three silent bodies the light which came from a lamp high on the mast and a sky pale with stars left them with shapes but without features but even in this darkness the withdrawal of the others made them feel each other very near for they were all thinking of the same thing for some time no one spoke then helen said with a sigh so you're both very happy as if washed by the air her voice sounded more spiritual and softer than usual voices at a little distance answered her yes through the darkness she was looking at them both and trying to distinguish him what was there for her to say rachel had passed beyond her guardianship a voice might reach her ears but never again would it carry as far as it had carried twenty-four hours ago nevertheless speech seemed to be due from her before she went to bed she wished to speak but she felt strangely old and depressed do you realize what you're doing she demanded she's young you're both young and marriage here she ceased they begged her however to continue with such earnestness in their voices as if they only craved advice that she was led to add marriage well it's not easy that's what we want to know they answered and she guessed that now they were looking at each other it depends on both of you she stated her face was turned towards terence and although he could hardly see her he believed that her words really covered a genuine desire to know more about him he raised himself from his semi-recumbent position and proceeded to tell her what she wanted to know he spoke as lightly as he could in order to take away her depression i'm twenty-seven and i've about seven hundred a year he began my temper is good on the whole and health excellent though hirst detects a gouty tendency well then i think i'm very intelligent he paused as if for confirmation helen agreed though unfortunately rather lazy I intend to allow Rachel to be a fool if she wants to, and do you find me on the whole satisfactory in other respects? he asked shyly. Yes, I like what I know of you, Helen replied, but then one knows so little. We shall live in London, he continued, and with one voice they suddenly inquired whether she did not think them the happiest people that she had ever known hush she checked them mrs flushing remember 
she's behind us. Then they fell silent, and Terence and Rachel felt instinctively that their happiness had made her sad, and while they were anxious to go on talking about themselves, they did not like to. We've talked too much about ourselves, Terence said. Tell us. Yes, tell us, Rachel echoed. They were both in the mood to believe that every one was capable of saying something very profound. What can I tell you? Helen reflected, speaking more to herself in a rambling style than as a prophetess delivering a message. She forced herself to speak. After all, though I scold Rachel, I'm not much wiser myself. I'm older, of course. I'm halfway through, and you're just beginning. It's puzzling, sometimes I think disappointing. The great things aren't as great, perhaps, as one expects. But it's interesting. Oh, yes, you're certain to find it interesting. And so it goes on. They became conscious here of the procession of dark trees into which, as far as they could see, Helen was now looking. And there are pleasures where one doesn't expect them. You must write to your father. And you'll be very happy, I've no doubt. But I must go to bed. And if you are sensible, you will follow in ten minutes. And so... She rose and stood before them, almost featureless and very large. Good night. She passed behind the curtain. After sitting in silence for the greater part of the ten minutes she allowed them, they rose and hung over the rail. Beneath them the smooth black water slipped away very fast and silently. The spark of a cigarette vanished behind them. A beautiful voice, Terence murmured. Rachel assented. Helen had a beautiful voice. After a silence, she asked, looking up into the sky, Are we on the deck of a steamer on a river in South America? Am I Rachel and you Terence? The great black world lay round them. As they were drawn smoothly along, it seemed possessed of immense thickness and endurance. They could discern pointed treetops and blunt rounded treetops. Raising their eyes above the trees, they fixed them on the stars and the pale border of sky above the trees. The little points of frosty light infinitely far away, drew their eyes and held them fixed, so that it seemed as if they stayed a long time and fell a great distance, when once more they realized their hands were grasping the rail, and their separate bodies standing side by side. You'd forgotten completely about me, Terence reproached her taking her arm and beginning to pace the deck. And I never forget you. Oh, no, she whispered. She had not forgotten. Only the stars, the night, the dark. You're like a bird half asleep in its nest, Rachel. You're asleep. You're talking in your sleep half asleep and murmuring broken words, they stood in the angle made by the bow of the boat. It slipped on down the river. Now a bell struck on the bridge, and they heard the lapping of water as it rippled away on either side. And once a bird, startled in its sleep, creaked, flew on to the next tree, and was silent again. 
the darkness poured down profusely and left them with scarcely any feeling of life except that they were standing there together in the darkness Chapter Twenty Two of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The darkness fell but rose again, and as each day spread widely over the earth and parted them from the strange day in the forest when they had been forced to tell each other what they wanted, this wish of theirs was revealed to other people and in the process became slightly strange to themselves. Apparently it was not anything unusual that had happened. It was that they had become engaged to marry each other. The world, which consisted for the most part of the hotel and the villa, expressed itself glad on the whole that two people should marry and allowed them to see that they were not expected to take part in the work which has to be done in order that the world shall go on but might absent themselves for a time they were accordingly left alone until they felt the silence as if playing in a vast church the door had been shut on them they were driven to walk alone and sit alone, to visit secret places where the flowers had never been picked, and the trees were solitary. In solitude they could express those beautiful but too vast desires which were so oddly uncomfortable to the ears of other men and women, desires for a world such as their own world which contained two people seemed to them to be where people knew each other intimately and thus judged each other by what was good and never quarrelled because that was waste of time they would talk of such questions among books or out in the sun or sitting in the shade of a tree undisturbed they were no longer embarrassed or half choked with meaning which could not express itself they were not afraid of each other or like travellers down a twisting river dazzled with sudden beauties when the corner is turned the unexpected happened but even the ordinary was lovable and in many ways preferable to the ecstatic and mysterious for it was refreshingly solid and called out effort and effort under such circumstances was not effort but delight when rachel played the piano terence sat near her engaged as far as the occasional writing of a word in pencil testified in shaping the world as it appeared to him now that he and rachel were going to be married it was different certainly the book called silence would not now be the same book that it would have been he would then put down his pencil and stare in front of him and wonder in what respects the world was different it had perhaps more solidity more coherence more importance greater depth why even the earth sometimes seemed to him very deep not carved into hills and cities and fields but heaped in great masses he would look out of the window for ten minutes at a time but no he did not care for the earth swept of human beings he liked human beings he liked them he suspected better than rachel did there she was swaying enthusiastically over her music quite forgetful of him 
but he liked that quality in her. He liked the impersonality which it produced in her. At last, having written down a series of little sentences, with notes of interrogation attached to them, he observed aloud, Women. Under the heading Women, I've written. Not really vainer than men. Lack of self-confidence at the base of most serious faults. Dislike of own sex traditional? or founded on fact. Every woman not so much a rake at heart as an optimist, because they don't think. What do you say, Rachel? He paused with his pencil in his hand and a sheet of paper on his knee. Rachel said nothing. Up and up the steep spiral of a very late Beethoven sonata she climbed like a person ascending a ruined staircase, energetically at first, then more laboriously advancing her feet with effort until she could go no higher, and returned with a run to begin at the very bottom again. Again, it's the fashion now to say that women are more practical and less idealistic than men also that they have considerable organizing ability, but no sense of honor. Query. What is meant by masculine term honor? What corresponds to it in your sex, eh? Attacking her staircase once more, Rachel again neglected this opportunity of revealing the secrets of her sex. She had, indeed, advanced so far in the pursuit of wisdom that she allowed these secrets to rest undisturbed. It seemed to be reserved for a later generation to discuss them philosophically. Crashing down a final chord with her left hand, she exclaimed at last, swinging round upon him, No, Terence, it's no good. Here I am, the best musician in South America, not to speak of Europe and Asia, and I can't play a note because of you in the room interrupting me every other second. You don't seem to realize that that's what I've been aiming at for the last half hour, he remarked. I've no objection to nice simple tunes. Indeed, I find them very helpful to my literary composition. But that kind of thing is merely like an unfortunate old dog going round on its hind legs in the rain. He began turning over the little sheets of notepaper which were scattered on the table, conveying the congratulations of their friends. All possible wishes for all possible happiness, he read. Correct, but not very vivid, are they? They're sheer nonsense, Rachel exclaimed. Think of words compared with sounds, she continued. Think of novels and plays and histories. Perched on the edge of the table, she stirred the red and yellow volumes contemptuously. She seemed to herself to be in a position where she could despise all human learning. Terence looked at them, too. God, Rachel, you do read trash, he exclaimed. And you're behind the times, too, my dear. No one dreams of reading this kind of thing now. Antiquated problem plays harrowing descriptions of life in the East End. Oh, no, we've exploded all that. Read poetry, Rachel. Poetry, poetry, poetry. Picking up one of the books, he began to read aloud, his intention being to satirize the short, sharp bark of the writer's English. But she paid no attention and after an interval of meditation exclaimed, 
Does it ever seem to you, Terence, that the world is composed entirely of vast blocks of matter, and that we're nothing but patches of light? She looked at the soft spots of sun wavering over the carpet and up the wall. Like that. No, said Terence. I feel solid, immensely solid. The legs of my chair might be rooted in the bowels of the earth. But at Cambridge, I can remember, there were times when one fell into ridiculous states of semi-coma about five o'clock in the morning. Hurst does now, I expect. Oh, no, Hurst wouldn't. Rachel continued. The day your note came, asking us to go on the picnic. I was sitting where you're sitting now, thinking that. I wonder if I could think that again. I wonder if the world's changed, and if so, when it'll stop changing, and which is the real world. When I first saw you, he began, I thought you were like a creature who'd lived all its life among pearls and old bones. Your hands were wet, do you remember? And you never said a word until I gave you a bit of bread. And then you said, human beings. And I thought you, a prig, she recollected. No, that's not quite it. There were the ants who stole the tongue, and I thought you and St. John were like those ants, very big, very ugly, very energetic, with all your virtues on your backs. However, when I talked to you, I liked you. You fell in love with me, he corrected her. You were in love with me all the time only you didn't know it. No, I never fell in love with you, she asserted. Rachel, what a lie! Didn't you sit here looking at my window? Didn't you wander about the hotel like an owl in the sun? No, she repeated, I never fell in love. If falling in love is what people say it is, and it's the world that tells the lies, and I tell the truth. Oh, what lies, what lies! She crumpled together a handful of letters from Evelyn M., from Mr. Pepper, from Mrs. Thornbury and Miss Allen, and Susan Warrington. It was strange, considering how very different these people were, that they used almost the same sentences when they wrote to congratulate her upon her engagement. That any one of these people had ever felt what she felt, or could ever feel it, or had even the right to pretend for a single second that they were capable of feeling it, appalled her much as the church service had done, much as the face of the hospital nurse had done, and if they didn't feel a thing, why did they go and pretend to? The simplicity and arrogance and hardness of her youth, now concentrated into a single spark as it was by her love of him, puzzled Terence. Being engaged had not that effect on him. The world was different, but not in that way. He still wanted the things he had always wanted, and in particular he wanted the companionship of other people more than ever, perhaps. He took the letters out of her hand and protested. Of course they're absurd, Rachel. Of course they say things just because other people say them. But even so, what a nice woman Miss Allen is. You can't deny that. And Mrs. Thornbury, too. She's got too many children, I grant you, but if half a dozen of them had gone to the bad instead of rising infallibly to the tops of their trees 
hasn't she a kind of beauty of elemental simplicity as flushing would say isn't she rather like a large old tree murmuring in the moonlight or a river going on and on and on by the way rafe's been made governor of the carroway islands the youngest governor in the service very good isn't it but rachel was at present unable to conceive that the vast majority of the affairs of the world went on unconnected by a single thread with her own destiny i won't have eleven children she asserted i won't have the eyes of an old woman she looks at one up and down up and down as if one were a horse we must have a son and we must have a daughter said terence putting down the letters because let alone the inestimable advantage of being our children they'd be so well brought up they went on to sketch an outline of the ideal education how their daughter should be required from infancy to gaze at a large square of cardboard painted blue to suggest thoughts of infinity for women were grown too practical and their son he should be taught to laugh at great men that is at distinguished successful men at men who wore ribbons and rose to the tops of their trees he should in no way resemble rachel added st john hurst at this terence professed the greatest admiration for st john hurst dwelling upon his good qualities he became seriously convinced of them he had a mind like a torpedo he declared aimed at falsehood where should we all be without him and his like choked in weeds christians bigots why rachel herself would be a slave with a fan to sing songs to men when they felt drowsy but you'll never see it he exclaimed because with all your virtues you don't and you never will care with every fibre of your being for the pursuit of truth you've no respect for facts rachel you're essentially feminine she did not trouble to deny it nor did she think good to produce the one unanswerable argument against the merits which terence admired st john hurst said that she was in love with him she would never forgive that but the argument was not one to appeal to a man but i like him she said and she thought to herself that she also pitied him as one pities those unfortunate people who are outside the warm mysterious globe full of charges and miracles in which we ourselves move about she thought that it must be very dull to be st john hurst she summed up what she felt about him by saying that she would not kiss him supposing he wished it which was not likely as if some apology were due to hurst for the kiss which she then bestowed upon him terence protested and compared with hurst i'm a perfect zany the clock here struck twelve instead of eleven we're wasting the morning i ought to be writing my book and you ought to be answering these we've only got twenty-one whole mornings left said rachel and my father'll be here in a day or two however she drew a pen and paper towards her and began to write laboriously my dear evelyn terence meanwhile read a novel which someone else had written 
a process which he found essential to the composition of his own. For a considerable time nothing was to be heard but the ticking of the clock and the fitful scratch of Rachel's pen, as she produced phrases which bore a considerable likeness to those which she had condemned. She was struck by it herself, for she stopped writing and looked up, looked at Terence deep in the armchair, looked at the different pieces of furniture, at her bed in the corner, at the window-pane which showed the branches of a tree filled in with sky, heard the clock ticking, and was amazed at the gulf which lay between all that and her sheet of paper. Would there ever be a time when the world was one and indivisible? Even with Terence himself, how far apart they could be! How little she knew what was passing in his brain now. She then finished her sentence, which was awkward and ugly, and stated that they were both very happy, and going to be married in the autumn, probably, and hope to live in London, where we hope you will come and see us when we get back. Choosing affectionately, after some further speculation, rather than sincerely, she signed the letter and was doggedly beginning on another when Terence remarked, quoting from his book, Listen to this, Rachel. It is probable that Hugh, he's the hero, a literary man, had not realized at the time of his marriage any more than the young man of parts and imagination usually does realize the nature of the gulf which separates the needs and desires of the male from the needs and desires of the female. At first they had been very happy. The walking tour in Switzerland had been a time of jolly companionship and stimulating revelations for both of them. Betty had proved herself the ideal comrade. They had shouted, Love in the Valley, to each other across the snowy slopes of the Riffelhorn, and so on and so on. I'll skip the descriptions. But in London, after the boy's birth, all was changed. Betty was an admirable mother, but it did not take her long to find out that motherhood as that function is understood by the mother of the upper middle classes, did not absorb the whole of her energies. She was young and strong, with healthy limbs and a body and brain that called urgently for exercise. In short, she began to give tea parties. Coming in late from this singular talk with old Bob Murphy in his smoky book-lined room, where the two men had each unloosened his soul to the other, with the sound of the traffic humming in his ears and the foggy London sky slung tragically across his mind. He found women's hats dotted about among his papers, women's wraps and absurd little feminine shoes and umbrellas were in the hall. Then the bills began to come in, he tried to speak frankly to her. He found her lying on the great polar bear skin in their bedroom, half undressed, for they were dining with the greens in Wilton Crescent, the ruddy firelight making the diamonds wink and twinkle on her bare arms, and in the delicious curve of her breast, a vision of adorable femininity. He forgave her all. Well, this goes from bad to worse, and finally, about fifty pages later, Hugh takes a weekend ticket to Swanage and has it out with himself on the downs above Corfe. Here there's fifteen pages or so which we'll skip. The conclusion is, 
they were different. Perhaps in the far future, when generations of men had struggled and failed as he must now struggle and fail, woman would be, indeed what she now made a pretense of being, the friend and companion, not the enemy and parasite of man. The end of it is, you see, Hugh went back to his wife, poor fellow. It was his duty as a married man. Lord, Rachel, he concluded, will it be like that when we're married? Instead of answering him, she asked, why don't people write about the things they do feel? Ah, that's the difficulty, he sighed, tossing the book away. Well, then, what will it be like when we're married? What are the things people do feel? She seemed doubtful. Sit on the floor and let me look at you, he commanded. Resting her chin on his knee, she looked straight at him. He examined her curiously. You're not beautiful, he began, but I like your face. I like the way your hair grows down in a point, and your eyes, too. They never see anything. Your mouth's too big, and your cheeks would be better if they had more color in them. But what I like about your face is that it makes one wonder what the devil you're thinking about. It makes me want to do that. He clenched his fist and shook it so near her that she started back. Because now you look as if you'd blow my brains out. There are moments, he continued, when, if we stood on a rock together, you'd throw me into the sea. Hypnotized by the force of his eyes in hers, she repeated, if we stood on a rock together. To be flung into the sea, to be washed hither and thither, and driven about the roots of the world, the idea was incoherently delightful. She sprang up and began moving about the room, bending and thrusting aside the chairs and tables as if she were indeed striking through the waters. He watched her with pleasure. She seemed to be cleaving a passage for herself and dealing triumphantly with the obstacles which would hinder their passage through life. It does seem possible, he exclaimed, though I've always thought it the most unlikely thing in the world. I shall be in love with you all my life, and our marriage will be the most exciting thing that's ever been done. We'll never have a moment's peace. He caught her in his arms as she passed him, and they fought for mastery, imagining a rock and the sea heaving beneath them. At last she was thrown to the floor, where she lay gasping and crying for mercy. I'm a mermaid. I can swim, she cried. So the game's up. Her dress was torn across, and peace being established, she fetched a needle and thread and began to mend the tear. And now, she said, be quiet and tell me about the world. Tell me about everything that's ever happened, and I'll tell you. Let me see, what can I tell you? I'll tell you about Miss Montgomery and the river party. She was left, you see, with one foot in the boat and the other on shore. They had spent much time already in thus filling out for the other the course of their past lives and the characters of their friends and relations, so that very soon Terence knew not only what Rachel's aunts might be expected to say upon every occasion, 
but also how their bedrooms were furnished, and what kind of bonnets they wore. He could sustain a conversation between Mrs. Hunt and Rachel, and carry on a tea party, including the Reverend William Johnson and Miss McQuoid, the Christian scientists, with remarkable likeness to the truth. But he had known many more people, and was far more highly skilled in the art of narrative than Rachel was, whose experiences were, for the most part, of a curiously childlike and humorous kind, so that it generally fell to her lot to listen and ask questions. He told her not only what had happened, but what he had thought and felt, and sketched for her portraits which fascinated her of what other men and women might be supposed to be thinking and feeling, so that she became very anxious to go back to England, which was full of people, where she could merely stand in the streets and look at them. According to him, too, there was an order, a pattern, which made life reasonable, or if that word was foolish, made it of deep interest anyhow, for sometimes it seemed possible to understand why things happened as they did. Nor were people so solitary and uncommunicative as she believed she should look for vanity, for vanity was a common quality, first in herself, and then in Helen, in Ridley, in St. John. They all had their share of it, and she would find it in ten people out of every twelve she met, and once linked together by one such tie, she would find them not separate and formidable, but practically indistinguishable, and she would come to love them when she found that they were like herself. If she denied this, she must defend her belief that human beings were as various as the beasts at the zoo, which had stripes and manes and horns and humps. And so, wrestling over the entire list of their acquaintances, and diverging into anecdote and theory and speculation, they came to know each other. The hours passed quickly, and seemed to them full to leaking point. After a night's solitude, they were always ready to begin again. The virtues which Mrs. Ambrose had once believed to exist in free talk between men and women did in truth exist for both of them, although not quite in the measure she prescribed. Far more than upon the nature of sex they dwelt upon the nature of poetry. But it was true that talk which had no boundaries deepened and enlarged the strangely small bright view of a girl. In return for what he could tell her, she brought him such curiosity and sensitiveness of perception that he was led to doubt whether any gift bestowed by much reading and living was quite the equal of that for pleasure and pain. What would experience give her after all? except a kind of ridiculous formal balance, like that of a drilled dog in the street. He looked at her face and wondered how it would look in twenty years' time, when the eyes had dulled, and the forehead wore those little persistent wrinkles which seem to show that the middle-aged are facing something hard which the young do not see. What would the hard thing be for them, he wondered. Then his thoughts turned to their life in England. The thought of England was delightful, for together they would see the old things freshly. It would be England in June, 
and there would be June nights in the country, and the nightingales singing in the lanes, into which they could steal when the room grew hot, and there would be English meadows gleaming with water and set with stolid cows and clouds dipping low and trailing across the green hills. As he sat in the room with her, he wished very often to be back again in the thick of life, doing things with Rachel. He crossed to the window and exclaimed, Lord, how good it is to think of lanes, muddy lanes, with brambles and nettles, you know, and real grass fields, and farmyards with pigs and cows, and men walking beside carts with pitchforks. There's nothing to compare with that here. Look at the stony red earth and the bright blue sea and the glaring white houses. How tired one gets of it. And the air, without a stain or a wrinkle. I'd give anything for a sea mist. Rachel, too, had been thinking of the English country, the flat land rolling away to the sea, and the woods and the long straight roads where one can walk for miles without seeing anyone, and the great church towers and the curious houses clustered in the valleys, and the birds and the dusk, and the rain falling against the windows. But London, London's the place, Terence continued. They looked together at the carpet, as though London itself were to be seen there lying on the floor, with all its spires and pinnacles pricking through the smoke. On the whole, what I should like best at this moment, Terence pondered, would be to find myself walking down King's Way, by those big placards, you know, and turning into the Strand. Perhaps I might go and look over Waterloo Bridge for a moment. Then I'd go along the Strand past the shops with all the new books in them, and through the little archway into the temple. I always like the quiet after the uproar. You hear your own footsteps suddenly quite loud. The temple's very pleasant. I think I should go and see if I could find dear old Hodgkin, the man who writes books about Van Eyck, you know. When I left England, he was very sad about his tame magpie. He suspected that a man had poisoned it. And then Russell lives on the next staircase. I think you'd like him. He's a passion for Handel. Well, Rachel, he concluded, dismissing the vision of London, we shall be doing that together in six weeks' time, and it'll be the middle of June then, and June in London. My God, how pleasant it all is. And we're certain to have it, too, she said. It isn't as if we were expecting a great deal only to walk about and look at things. Only a thousand a year and perfect freedom, he replied. How many people in London do you think have that? And now you've spoilt it, she complained. Now we've got to think of the horrors. She looked grudgingly at the novel, which had once caused her perhaps an hour's discomfort so that she had never opened it again, but kept it on her table, and looked at it occasionally, as some medieval monk kept a skull or a crucifix to remind him of the frailty of the body. Is it true, Terence, she demanded, that women die with bugs crawling across their faces? I think it's very probable, he said, but you must admit, Rachel, 
that we so seldom think of anything but ourselves that an occasional twinge is really rather pleasant accusing him of an affectation of cynicism which was just as bad as sentimentality itself she left her position by his side and knelt upon the window-sill twisting the curtain tassels between her fingers a vague sense of dissatisfaction filled her what's so detestable in this country she exclaimed is the blue always blue sky and blue sea it's like a curtain all the things one wants are on the other side of that i want to know what's going on behind it i hate these divisions don't you terence one person all in the dark about another person now i liked the dalloways she continued and they're gone i shall never see them again just by going on a ship we cut ourselves off entirely from the rest of the world i want to see england there london there all sorts of people why shouldn't one why should one be shut up all by oneself in a room while she spoke thus half to herself and with increasing vagueness because her eye was caught by a ship that had just come into the bay she did not see that terence had ceased to stare contentedly in front of him and was looking at her keenly and with dissatisfaction she seemed to be able to cut herself adrift from him and to pass away to unknown places where she had no need of him the thought roused his jealousy i sometimes think you're not in love with me and never will be he said energetically she started and turned round at his words i don't satisfy you in the way you satisfy me he continued there's something i can't get hold of in you you don't want me as i want you you're always wanting something else he began pacing up and down the room perhaps i ask too much he went on perhaps it isn't really possible to have what i want men and women are too different you can't understand you don't understand he came up to where she stood looking at him in silence it seemed to her now that what he was saying was perfectly true and that she wanted many more things than the love of one human being the sea the sky she turned again and looked at the distant blue which was so smooth and serene where the sky met the sea she could not possibly want only one human being or is it only this damnable engagement he continued let's be married here before we go back or is it too great a risk are we sure we want to marry each other they began pacing up and down the room but although they came very near each other in their pacing they took care not to touch each other the hopelessness of their position overcame them both they were impotent they could never love each other sufficiently to overcome all these barriers and they could never be satisfied with less realizing this with intolerable keenness she stopped in front of him and exclaimed let's break it off then the words did more to unite them than any amount of argument as if they stood on the edge of a precipice they clung together 
They knew that they could not separate, painful and terrible it might be, but they were joined for ever. They lapsed into silence, and after a time crept together in silence. Merely to be so close soothed them, and sitting side by side, the divisions disappeared, and it seemed as if the world were once more solid and entire, and as if, in some strange way, they had grown larger and stronger. It was long before they moved, and when they moved it was with great reluctance. They stood together in front of the looking-glass, and with a brush tried to make themselves look as if they had been feeling nothing all morning, neither pain nor happiness. But it chilled them to see themselves in the glass for instead of being vast and indivisible, they were really very small and separate. The size of the glass leaving a large space for the reflection of other things. Chapter Twenty Three of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But no brush was able to efface completely the expression of happiness, so that Mrs. Ambrose could not treat them when they came downstairs as if they had spent the morning in a way that could be discussed naturally. This being so, she joined in the world's conspiracy to consider them, for the time, incapacitated from the business of life, struck by their intensity of feeling into enmity against life, and almost succeeded in dismissing them from her thoughts. She reflected that she had done all that it was necessary to do in practical matters. She had written a great many letters, and had obtained Willoughby's consent. She had dwelt so often upon Mr. Hewitt's prospects, his profession, his birth, appearance, and temperament, that she had almost forgotten what he was really like. When she refreshed herself by a look at him, she used to wonder again what he was like, and then, concluding that they were happy at any rate, thought no more about it. She might more profitably consider what would happen in three years' time, or what might have happened if Rachel had been left to explore the world under her father's guidance. The result she was honest enough to own might have been better, who knows? She did not disguise from herself that Terence had faults. She was inclined to think him too easy and tolerant, just as he was inclined to think her perhaps a trifle hard. No, it was rather that she was uncompromising. In some ways she found St. John preferable, but then, of course, he would never have suited Rachel. Her friendship with St. John was established, for although she fluctuated between irritation and interest in a way that did credit to the candor of her disposition, she liked his company on the whole. He took her outside this little world of love and emotion. He had a grasp of facts. Supposing, for instance, that England made a sudden move towards some unknown part on the coast of Morocco, St. John knew what was at the back of it, and to hear him engaged with her husband in argument about finance and the balance of power gave her an odd sense of stability. She respected their arguments without always listening to them much as she respected a solid brick wall, or one of those immense municipal buildings which, 
although they compose the greater part of our cities, have been built day after day and year after year by unknown hands. She liked to sit and listen, and even felt a little elated when the engaged couple, after showing their profound lack of interest, slipped from the room and were seen pulling flowers to pieces in the garden. It was not that she was jealous of them, but she did undoubtedly envy them their great unknown future that lay before them. Slipping from one such thought to another, she was at the dining-room, with fruit in her hands. Sometimes she stopped to straighten a candle stooping with the heat, or disturbed some too rigid arrangement of the chairs. She had reason to suspect that Chailey had been balancing herself on the top of a ladder with a wet duster during their absence, and the room had never been quite like itself since. Returning from the dining-room for the third time, she perceived that one of the armchairs was now occupied by St. John. He lay back in it, with his eyes half shut, looking as he always did, curiously buttoned up in a neat grey suit and fenced against the exuberance of a foreign climate which might at any moment proceed to take liberties with him. Her eyes rested on him gently and then passed on over his head. Finally she took the chair opposite. I didn't want to come here, he said at last, but I was positively driven to it. Evelyn M., he groaned. He sat up and began to explain with mock solemnity how the detestable woman was set upon marrying him. She pursues me about the place. This morning she appeared in the smoking-room. All I could do was to seize my hat and fly. I didn't want to come, but I couldn't stay and face another meal with her. Well, we must make the best of it, Helen replied philosophically. It was very hot, and they were indifferent to the amount of silence, so that they lay back in their chairs waiting for something to happen. The bell rang for luncheon but there was no sound of movement in the house. Was there any news? Helen asked. Anything in the papers? St. John shook his head. Oh, yes, he had a letter from home, a letter from his mother, describing the suicide of the parlour-maid. She was called Susan Jane, and she came into the kitchen one afternoon and said that she wanted Cook to keep her money for her. She had twenty pounds in gold. Then she went out to buy herself a hat. She came in at half-past five and said that she had taken poison. They had only just time to get her into bed and call a doctor before she died. Well? Helen inquired. There'll have to be an inquest, said St. John. Why had she done it? He shrugged his shoulders. Why do people kill themselves? Why do the lower orders do any of the things that they do do? Nobody knows. They sat in silence. The bells rung fifteen minutes, and they're not down, said Helen at length. When they appeared, St. John explained why it had been necessary for him to come to luncheon. He imitated Evelyn's enthusiastic tone as she confronted him in the smoking-room. She thinks there can be nothing quite so thrilling as mathematics so I've lent her a large work in two volumes. It'll be interesting to see what she makes of it. Rachel could now afford to laugh at him. She reminded him of Gibbon, 
she had the first volume somewhere still. If he were undertaking the education of Evelyn, that surely was the test. Or she had heard that Burke upon the American Rebellion. Evelyn ought to read them both simultaneously. When St. John had disposed of her argument and had satisfied his hunger, he proceeded to tell them that the hotel was seething with scandals, some of the most appalling kind, which had happened in their absence. He was indeed much given to the study of his kind. Evelyn M., for example. But that was told me in confidence. Nonsense, Terence interposed. You've heard about poor Sinclair, too. Oh, yes, I've heard about Sinclair. He's retired to his mine with a revolver. He writes to Evelyn daily that he's thinking of committing suicide. I've assured her that he's never been so happy in his life, and on the whole she's inclined to agree with me. But then she's entangled herself with Parrot, St. John continued, and I have reason to think, from something I saw in the passage, that everything isn't as it should be between Arthur and Susan. There's a young female lately arrived from Manchester. A very good thing if it were broken off, in my opinion. Their married life is something too horrible to contemplate. Oh, and I distinctly heard old Mrs. Paley rapping out the most fearful oaths as I passed her bedroom door. It's supposed that she tortures her maid in private. It's practically certain she does. One can tell it from the look in her eyes. When you're eighty and the gout tweezes you, you'll be swearing like a trooper. Terence remarked. You'll be very fat, very testy, very disagreeable. Can't you imagine him, bald as a coot, with a pair of sponge-bag trousers, a little spotted tie, and a corporation? After a pause, Hurst remarked that the worst infamy had still to be told. He addressed himself to Helen. They've hoofed out the prostitute. One night while we were away, that old numbskull Thornbury was doddering about the passages very late. Nobody seems to have asked him what he was up to. He saw the Signora Lola Mendoza, as she calls herself, cross the passage in her nightgown. He communicated his suspicions next morning to Elliot with the result that Rodriguez went to the woman and gave her twenty-four hours in which to clear out of the place. No one seems to have inquired into the truth of the story, or to have asked Thornbury and Elliot what business it was of theirs. They had it entirely their own way. I propose that we should all sign a round robin, go to Rodriguez in a body, and insist upon a full enquiry. Something's got to be done, don't you agree? Hewitt remarked that there could be no doubt as to the lady's profession. Still, he added, it's a great shame, poor woman. Only I don't see what's to be done. I quite agree with you, St. John, Helen burst out. It's monstrous. The hypocritical smugness of the English makes my blood boil. A man who's made a fortune in trade as Mr. Thornbury has is bound to be twice as bad as any prostitute. She respected St. John's morality, which she took far more seriously than anyone else did and now entered into a discussion with him as to the steps that were to be taken to enforce their peculiar view of what was right. 
The argument led to some profoundly gloomy statements of a general nature. Who were they, after all? What authority had they? What power against the mass of superstition and ignorance? It was the English, of course. There must be something wrong in the English blood. Directly you met an English person, of the middle classes, you were conscious of an indefinable sensation of loathing. Directly you saw the brown crescent of houses above Dover, the same thing came over you. But unfortunately, St. John added, you couldn't trust these foreigners. They were interrupted by sounds of strife at the further end of the table. Rachel appealed to her aunt. Terence says we must go to tea with Mrs. Thornbury because she's been so kind, but I don't see it. In fact, I'd rather have my right hand sawn in pieces. Just imagine the eyes of all those women. Fiddlesticks, Rachel, Terence replied. Who wants to look at you? You're consumed with vanity. You're a monster of conceit. Surely, Helen, you ought to have taught her by this time that she's a person of no conceivable importance whatever, not beautiful or well-dressed or conspicuous for elegance or intellect or deportment. A more ordinary sight than you are, he concluded, except for the tear across your dress has never been seen. However, stay at home if you want to. I'm going. She appealed again to her aunt. It wasn't the being looked at, she explained, but the things people were sure to say. The women in particular. She liked women, but where emotion was concerned they were as flies on a lump of sugar. They would be certain to ask her questions. Evelyn M. would say, Are you in love? Is it nice being in love? And Mrs. Thornbury, her eyes would go up and down, up and down. She shuddered at the thought of it. Indeed, the retirement of their life since their engagement had made her so sensitive that she was not exaggerating her case. She found an ally in Helen, who proceeded to expound her views of the human race, as she regarded with complacency the pyramid of variegated fruits in the centre of the table. It wasn't that they were cruel, or meant to hurt, or even stupid exactly, but she had always found that the ordinary person had so little emotion in his own life that the scent of it in the lives of others was like the scent of blood in the nostrils of a bloodhound. Warming to the theme, she continued, Directly anything happens, it may be a marriage or a birth or a death. On the whole, they prefer it to be a death. Everyone wants to see you. They insist upon seeing you. They've got nothing to say. They don't care a rap for you. But you've got to go to lunch or to tea or to dinner. And if you don't, you're damned. It's the smell of blood, she continued. I don't blame them. Only they shan't have mine if I know it. She looked about her as if she had called up a legion of human beings, all hostile and all disagreeable, who encircled the table, with mouths gaping for blood, and made it appear a little island of neutral country in the midst of the enemy's country. Her words roused her husband, who had been muttering rhythmically to himself, surveying his guests and his food and his wife with eyes that were now melancholy and now fierce, 
according to the fortunes of the lady in his ballad. He cut Helen short with a protest. He hated even the semblance of cynicism in women. Nonsense, nonsense, he remarked abruptly. Terence and Rachel glanced at each other across the table, which meant that when they were married they would not behave like that. The entrance of Ridley into the conversation had a strange effect. It became at once more formal and more polite. It would have been impossible to talk quite easily of anything that came into their heads, and to say the word prostitute as simply as any other word. The talk now turned upon literature and politics, and Ridley told stories of the distinguished people he had known in his youth. Such talk was of the nature of an art, and the personalities and informalities of the young were silenced. As they rose to go, Helen stopped for a moment, leaning her elbows on the table. "'You've all been sitting here,' she said, "'for almost an hour, and you haven't noticed my figs, or my flowers, or the way the light comes through, or anything.' I haven't been listening, because I've been looking at you. You looked very beautiful. I wish you'd go on sitting for ever. She led the way to the drawing-room, where she took up her embroidery, and began again to dissuade Terence from walking down to the hotel in this heat. But the more she dissuaded, the more he was determined to go. He became irritated and obstinate. There were moments when they almost disliked each other. He wanted other people. He wanted Rachel to see them with him. He suspected that Mrs. Ambrose would now try to dissuade her from going. He was annoyed by all this space and shade and beauty, and Hurst, recumbent, drooping a magazine from his wrist. "'I'm going,' he repeated. "'Rachel needn't come unless she wants to. "'If you go, Hewitt, I wish you'd make enquiries about the prostitute,' said Hurst. "'Look here,' he added. "'I'll walk half the way with you.' Greatly to their surprise he raised himself, looked at his watch, and remarked that, as it was now half an hour since luncheon, the gastric juices had had sufficient time to secrete. He was trying a system, he explained, which involved short spells of exercise interspaced by longer intervals of rest. I shall be back at four, he remarked to Helen when I shall lie down on the sofa and relax all my muscles completely. "'So you're going, Rachel?' Helen asked. "'You won't stay with me?' She smiled, but she might have been sad. Was she sad, or was she really laughing? Rachel could not tell, and she felt for the moment very uncomfortable between Helen and Terence. Then she turned away, saying merely that she would go with Terence on condition that he did all the talking. A narrow border of shadow ran along the road, which was broad enough for two, but not broad enough for three. St. John therefore dropped a little behind the pair and the distance between them increased by degrees. Walking with a view to digestion, and with one eye upon his watch, he looked from time to time at the pair in front of him. They seemed to be happy, so intimate, although they were walking side by side, much as other people walk. They turned slightly toward each other now and then, 
and said something which he thought must be something very private. They were really disputing about Helen's character, and Terence was trying to explain why it was that she annoyed him so much sometimes. But St. John thought that they were saying things which they did not want him to hear, and was led to think of his own isolation. These people were happy, and in some ways he despised them for being made happy so simply, and in other ways he envied them. He was much more remarkable than they were, but he was not happy. People never liked him. He doubted sometimes whether even Helen liked him. To be simple, to be able to say simply what one felt, without the terrific self-consciousness which possessed him, and showed him his own face and words perpetually in a mirror, that would be worth almost any other gift, for it made one happy. Happiness, happiness, what was happiness? He was never happy. He saw too clearly the little vices and deceits and flaws of life, and seeing them it seemed to him honest to take notice of them. That was the reason, no doubt, why people generally disliked him and complained that he was heartless and bitter. Certainly they never told him the things he wanted to be told, that he was nice and kind and that they liked him. But it was true that half the sharp things that he said about them were said because he was unhappy or hurt himself. But he admitted that he had very seldom told anyone that he cared for them, and when he had been demonstrative he had generally regretted it afterwards. His feelings about Terence and Rachel were so complicated that he had never yet been able to bring himself to say that he was glad that they were going to be married. He saw their faults so clearly, and the inferior nature of a great deal of their feeling for each other, and he expected that their love would not last. He looked at them again and very strangely, for he was so used to thinking that he seldom saw anything. The look of them filled him with a simple emotion of affection, in which there were some traces of pity also. What, after all, did people's faults matter in comparison with what was good in them? He resolved that he would now tell them what he felt, he quickened his pace and came up with them just as they reached the corner where the lane joined the main road. They stood still and began to laugh at him, and to ask him whether the gastric juices. But he stopped them and began to speak very quickly and stiffly. Do you remember the morning after the dance, he demanded? It was here we sat, and you talked nonsense, and Rachel made little heaps of stones. I, on the other hand, had the whole meaning of life revealed to me in a flash. He paused for a second, and drew his lips together in a tight little purse. Love, he said, it seems to me to explain everything. So, on the whole, I'm very glad that you two are going to be married. He then turned round abruptly, without looking at them, and walked back to the villa. He felt both exalted and ashamed of himself for having thus said what he felt. Probably they were laughing at him. Probably they thought him a fool. And after all, had he really said what he felt? It was true that they laughed when he was gone, 
but the dispute about Helen, which had become rather sharp, Chapter Twenty Four of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. They reached the hotel rather early in the afternoon, so that most of the people were still lying down or sitting speechless in their bedrooms. And Mrs. Thornbury, although she had asked them to tea, was nowhere to be seen. They sat down, therefore, in the shady hall which was almost empty, and full of the light swishing sounds of air going to and fro in a large empty space. Yes, this armchair was the same armchair in which Rachel had sat that afternoon when Evelyn came up, and this was the magazine she had been looking at, and this the very picture, a picture of New York by lamplight, how odd it seemed. Nothing had changed. By degrees a certain number of people began to come down the stairs and to pass through the hall, and in this dim light their figures possessed a sort of grace and beauty, although they were all unknown people. Sometimes they went straight through and out into the garden by the swing door, Sometimes they stopped for a few minutes and bent over the tables and began turning over the newspapers. Terence and Rachel sat watching them through their half-closed eyelids. The Johnsons, the Parkers, the Baileys, the Simmons, the Lees, the Morleys, the Campbells, the Gardeners. Some were dressed in white flannels and were carrying rackets under their arms. Some were short, some tall, some were only children, and some perhaps were servants, but they all had their standing, their reason for following each other through the hall, their money, their position, whatever it might be. Terence soon gave up looking at them, for he was tired, and closing his eyes he fell half asleep in his chair. Rachel watched the people for some time longer. She was fascinated by the certainty and the grace of their movements, and by the inevitable way in which they seemed to follow each other, and loiter, and pass on, and disappear. But after a time her thoughts wandered, and she began to think of the dance, which had been held in this room, only then the room itself looked quite different. Glancing round, she could hardly believe that it was the same room. It had looked so bare and so bright and formal on that night when they came into it out of the darkness. It had been filled, too, with little red excited faces, always moving, and people so brightly dressed and so animated that they did not seem in the least like real people, nor did you feel that you could talk to them. And now the room was dim and quiet, and beautiful silent people passed through it, to whom you could go and say anything you liked. She felt herself amazingly secure as she sat in her armchair and able to review not only the night of the dance, but the entire past, tenderly and humorously, as if she had been turning in a fog for a long time, and could now see exactly where she had turned. For the methods by which she had reached her present position seemed to her very strange, and the strangest thing about them was that she had not known where they were leading her. That was the strange thing, that one did not know where one was going, or what one wanted, and followed blindly, suffering so much in secret, 
always unprepared and amazed and knowing nothing. But one thing led to another, and by degrees something had formed itself out of nothing, and so one reached at last this calm, this quiet, this certainty, and it was this process that people called living. Perhaps, then, everyone really knew as she knew now where they were going, and things formed themselves into a pattern not only for her, but for them, and in that pattern lay satisfaction and meaning. When she looked back she could see that a meaning of some kind was apparent in the lives of her aunts, and in the brief visit of the Dalloways whom she would never see again, and in the life of her father. The sound of Terence breathing deep in his slumber confirmed her in her calm. She was not sleepy, although she did not see anything very distinctly. But although the figures passing through the hall became vaguer and vaguer, she believed that they all knew exactly where they were going, and the sense of their certainty filled her with comfort. For the moment she was as detached and disinterested as if she had no longer any lot in life, and she thought that she could now accept anything that came to her without being perplexed by the form in which it appeared. What was there to frighten or to perplex in the prospect of life? Why should this insight ever again desert her? The world was in truth so large, so hospitable, and after all it was so simple. Love, St. John had said, that seems to explain it all. Yes, but it was not the love of man for woman, of Terence for Rachel. Although they sat so close together, they had ceased to be little separate bodies. They had ceased to struggle and desire one another. There seemed to be peace between them. It might be love, but it was not the love of man for woman. Through her half-closed eyelids she watched Terence lying back in his chair, and she smiled as she saw how big his mouth was, and his chin so small, and his nose curved like a switchback with a knob at the end. Naturally, looking like that, he was lazy and ambitious, and full of moods and faults. She remembered their quarrels, and in particular how they had been quarrelling about Helen that very afternoon, and she thought how often they would quarrel in the thirty or forty or fifty years in which they would be living in the same house together, catching trains together, and getting annoyed because they were so different. But all this was superficial and had nothing to do with the life that went on beneath the eyes and the mouth and the chin, for that life was independent of her and independent of everything else. So, too, although she was going to marry him and to live with him for thirty or forty or fifty years, and to quarrel and to be so close to him, she was independent of him, she was independent of everything else. Nevertheless, as St. John said, it was love that made her understand this, for she had never felt this independence, this calm, and this certainty, until she fell in love with him. And perhaps this too was love. She wanted nothing else. For perhaps two minutes Miss Allen had been standing at a little distance looking at the couple lying back so peacefully in their armchairs. She could not make up her mind whether to disturb them or not, and then 
seeming to recollect something, she came across the hall. The sound of her approach woke Terence, who sat up and rubbed his eyes. He heard Miss Allen talking to Rachel. Well, she was saying, this is very nice. It is very nice indeed. Getting engaged seems to be quite the fashion. It cannot often happen that two couples who have never seen each other before meet in the same hotel and decide to get married. Then she paused and smiled, and seemed to have nothing more to say, so that Terence rose and asked her whether it was true that she had finished her book. Someone had said that she had really finished it. Her face lit up. She turned to him with a livelier expression than usual. Yes, I think I can fairly say I have finished it, she said. That is, omitting Swinburne. Beowulf to Browning. I rather like the two bees myself. Beowulf to Browning, she repeated. I think that is the kind of title which might catch one's eye on a railway bookstall. She was indeed very proud that she had finished her book, for no one knew what an amount of determination had gone to the making of it. Although she thought that it was a good piece of work, and considering what anxiety she had been in about her brother while she wrote it, she could not resist telling them a little more about it. I must confess, she continued, that if I had known how many classics there are in English literature, and how verbose the best of them contrive to be, I should never have undertaken the work. They only allow one seventy thousand words, you see. Only seventy thousand words? Terence exclaimed. Yes, and one has to say something about everybody, Miss Allen added. That is what I find so difficult, saying something different about everybody. Then she thought that she had said enough about herself, and she asked whether they had come down to join the tennis tournament. The young people are very keen about it, it begins again in half an hour. Her gaze rested benevolently upon them both, and after a momentary pause she remarked, looking at Rachel as if she had remembered something that would serve to keep her distinct from other people. You're the remarkable person who doesn't like ginger. But the kindness of the smile in her rather worn and courageous face made them feel that although she would scarcely remember them as individuals, she had laid upon them the burden of the new generation. And in that I quite agree with her, said a voice behind. Mrs. Thornbury had overheard the last few words about not liking Ginger. It's associated in my mind with a horrid old aunt of ours, Poor thing, she suffered dreadfully, so it isn't fair to call her horrid, who used to give it to us when we were small, and we never had the courage to tell her we didn't like it. We just had to put it out in the shrubbery. She had a big house near Bath. They began moving slowly across the hall, when they were stopped by the impact of Evelyn who dashed into them, as though in running downstairs to catch them her legs had got beyond her control. Well, she exclaimed, with her usual enthusiasm, seizing Rachel by the arm. I call this splendid. I guessed it was going to happen from the very beginning. I saw you two were made for each other. Now you've just got to tell me all about it. When's it to be? Where are you going to live? 
Are you both tremendously happy? But the attention of the group was diverted to Mrs. Elliot, who was passing them with her eager but uncertain movement, carrying in her hands a plate and an empty hot water bottle. She would have passed them, but Mrs. Thornbury went up and stopped her. Thank you. Hewling's better, she replied in answer to Mrs. Thornbury's inquiry. But he's not an easy patient. He wants to know what his temperature is, and if I tell him he gets anxious, and if I don't tell him he suspects. You know what men are when they're ill, and of course there are none of the proper appliances, and though he seems very willing and anxious to help, here she lowered her voice mysteriously, one can't feel that Dr. Rodriguez is the same as a proper doctor. If you would come and see him, Mr. Hewitt, she added, I know it would cheer him up lying there in bed all day, and the flies. But I must go and find Angelo, the food here, of course, with an invalid. One wants things particularly nice. And she hurried past them in search of the head waiter. The worry of nursing her husband had fixed a plaintive frown upon her forehead. She was pale and looked unhappy and more than usually inefficient, and her eyes wandered more vaguely than ever from point to point. Poor thing, Mrs. Thornbury exclaimed. She told them that for some days Hewling Elliot had been ill, and the only doctor available was the brother of the proprietor, or so the proprietor said whose right to the title of doctor was not above suspicion. I know how wretched it is to be ill in a hotel, Mrs. Thornbury remarked, once more leading the way with Rachel to the garden. I spent six weeks on my honeymoon in having typhoid at Venice, she continued. But even so, I look back upon them as some of the happiest weeks in my life. Ah, yes, she said, taking Rachel's arm. You think yourself happy now, but it's nothing to the happiness that comes afterwards. And I assure you that I could find it in my heart to envy you young people. You've a much better time than we had, I may tell you. When I look back upon it, I can hardly believe how things have changed. When we were engaged, I wasn't allowed to go for walks with William alone. Someone had always to be in the room with us. I really believe I had to show my parents all his letters, though they were very fond of him too. Indeed, I may say they looked upon him as their own son. It amuses me, she continued, to think how strict they were to us when I see how they spoil their grandchildren. The table was laid under the tree again, and taking her place before the teacups, Mrs. Thornbury beckoned and nodded, until she had collected quite a number of people, Susan and Arthur and Mr. Pepper, who were strolling about waiting for the tournament to begin. A murmuring tree, a river brimming in the moonlight. Terence's words came back to Rachel as she sat drinking the tea and listening to the words which flowed on so lightly, so kindly, and with such silvery smoothness. This long life and all these children had left her very smooth, they seemed to have rubbed away the marks of individuality, and to have left only what was old and maternal. And the things you young people are going to see, Mrs. Thornbury continued. She included them all in her forecast. She included them all in her maternity. 
although the party comprised William Pepper and Miss Allen, both of whom might have been supposed to have seen a fair share of the panorama. When I see how the world has changed in my lifetime, she went on, I can set no limit to what may happen in the next fifty years. Ah, no, Mr. Pepper, I don't agree with you in the least, she laughed, interrupting his gloomy remark about things going steadily from bad to worse. I know I ought to feel that, but I don't, I'm afraid. They're going to be much better people than we were. Surely everything goes to prove that. All round me I see women, young women, women with household cares of every sort, going out and doing things that we should not have thought it possible to do. Mr. Pepper thought her sentimental and irrational, like all old women, but her manner of treating him as if he were a cross old baby baffled him and charmed him, and he could only reply to her with a furious grimace, which was more a smile than a frown. And they remain women, Mrs. Thornbury added. They give a great deal to their children. As she said this, she smiled slightly in the direction of Susan and Rachel. They did not like to be included in the same lot, but they both smiled a little self-consciously, and Arthur and Terence glanced at each other too. She made them feel that they were all in the same boat together, and they looked at the women they were going to marry and compared them. It was inexplicable how anyone could wish to marry Rachel, incredible that anyone should be ready to spend his life with Susan. But singular though the other's taste must be, they bore each other no ill will on account of it. Indeed, they liked each other rather the better for the eccentricity of their choice. I really must congratulate you, Susan remarked as she leant across the table for the jam. There seemed to be no foundation for St. John's gossip about Arthur and Susan. Sunburnt and vigorous, they sat side by side, with their rackets across their knees, not saying much, but smiling slightly all the time. Through the thin white clothes which they wore, it was possible to see the lines of their bodies and legs, the beautiful curves of their muscles, his leanness and her flesh, and it was natural to think of the firm-fleshed, sturdy children that would be theirs. Their faces had too little shape in them to be beautiful, but they had clear eyes and an appearance of great health and power of endurance for it seemed as if the blood would never cease to run in his veins or to lie deeply and calmly in her cheeks. Their eyes at the present moment were brighter than usual and wore the peculiar expression of pleasure and self-confidence which is seen in the eyes of athletes, for they had been playing tennis and they were both first-rate at the game. Evelyn had not spoken, but she had been looking from Susan to Rachel. Well, they had both made up their minds very easily. They had done in a very few weeks what it sometimes seemed to her that she would never be able to do. Although they were so different, she thought that she could see in each the same look of satisfaction and completion the same calmness of manner, and the same slowness of movement. It was that slowness, that confidence, that content which she hated, she thought to herself. They moved so slowly because they were not single but double, and Susan was attached to Arthur, 
and Rachel to Terence, and for the sake of this one man they had renounced all other men, and movement, and the real things of life. Love was all very well, and those snug domestic houses with their kitchen below and the nursery above, which were so secluded and self-contained, like little islands in the torrents of the world. But the real things were surely the things that happened, the causes, the wars, the ideals which happened in the great world outside and went so independently of these women, turning so quietly and beautifully towards the men. She looked at them sharply. Of course they were happy and content, but there must be better things than that. Surely one could get nearer to life, one could get more out of life, one could enjoy more and feel more than they would ever do. Rachel in particular looked so young. What could she know of life? She became restless, and getting up crossed over to sit beside Rachel. She reminded her that she had promised to join her club. The bother is, she went on, that I mayn't be able to start work seriously till October. I've just had a letter from a friend of mine whose brother is in business in Moscow. They want me to stay with them, and as they're in the thick of all the conspiracies and anarchists, I've a good mind to stop on my way home. It sounds too thrilling. She wanted to make Rachel see how thrilling it was. My friend knows a girl of fifteen who's been sent to Siberia for life merely because they caught her addressing a letter to an anarchist. And the letter wasn't from her either. I'd give all I have in the world to help on a revolution against the Russian government. And it's bound to come. She looked from Rachel to Terence. They were both a little touched by the sight of her, remembering how lately they had been listening to evil words about her. And Terence asked her what her scheme was, and she explained that she was going to found a club, a club for doing things, really doing them. She became very animated as she talked on and on, for she professed herself certain that if once twenty people, no, ten would be enough if they were keen, set about doing things instead of talking about doing them, they could abolish almost every evil that exists. It was brains that were needed. If only people with brains of course they would want a room, a nice room in Bloomsbury preferably, where they could meet once a week. As she talked, Terence could see the traces of fading youth in her face, the lines that were being drawn by talk and excitement round her mouth and eyes. But he did not pity her, looking into those bright, rather hard, and very courageous eyes. He saw that she did not pity herself, or feel any desire to exchange her own life for the more refined and orderly lives of people like himself and St. John, although as the years went on the fight would become harder and harder. Perhaps, though, she would settle down Perhaps, after all, she would marry Parrot. While his mind was half occupied with what she was saying, he thought of her probable destiny, the light clouds of tobacco smoke serving to obscure his face from her eyes. Terence smoked, and Arthur smoked, 
and Evelyn smoked, so that the air was full of the mist and fragrance of good tobacco. In the intervals when no one spoke, they heard far off the low murmur of the sea, as the waves quietly broke and spread the beach with a film of water, and withdrew to break again. The cool green light fell through the leaves of the tree, and there were soft crescents and diamonds of sunshine upon the plates and the tablecloth. Mrs. Thornbury, after watching them all for a time in silence, began to ask Rachel kindly questions. When did they all go back? Oh, they expected her father. She must want to see her father. There would be a great deal to tell him, and— She looked sympathetically at Terence. He would be so happy, she felt sure. Years ago, she continued, it might have been ten or twenty years ago, she remembered meeting Mr. Vinrace at a party, and being so much struck by his face, which was so unlike the ordinary face one sees at a party, that she had asked who he was, and she was told that it was Mr. Vinrace, and she had always remembered the name an uncommon name, and he had a lady with him, a very sweet-looking woman, but it was one of those dreadful London crushes, where you don't talk, you only look at each other. And although she had shaken hands with Mr. Vinrace, she didn't think they had said anything. She sighed very slightly, remembering the past. Then she turned to Mr. Pepper, who had become very dependent on her, so that he always chose a seat near her, and attended to what she was saying, although he did not often make any remark of his own. "'You who know everything, Mr. Pepper,' she said, "'tell us how did those wonderful French ladies manage their salons?' Did we ever do anything of the same kind in England? Or do you think that there is some reason why we cannot do it in England? Mr. Pepper was pleased to explain very accurately why there has never been an English salon. There were three reasons, and they were very good ones, he said. As for himself, when he went to a party, as one was sometimes obliged to, from a wish not to give offence. His niece, for example, had been married the other day. He walked into the middle of the room, said, Ha, ha, as loud as ever he could, considered that he had done his duty, and walked away again. Mrs. Thornbury protested. She was going to give a party directly she got back, and they were all to be invited and she should set people to watch Mr. Pepper, and if she heard that he had been caught saying ha ha, she would. She would do something very dreadful indeed to him. Arthur Venning suggested that what she must do was to rig up something in the nature of a surprise. A portrait, for example, of a nice old lady in a lace cap, concealing a bath of cold water, which at a signal could be sprung on Pepper's head, or they'd have a chair which shot him twenty feet high directly he sat on it. Susan laughed. She had done her tea. She was feeling very contented, partly because she had been playing tennis brilliantly, and then everyone was so nice she was beginning to find it so much easier to talk, and to hold her own even with quite clever people, for somehow clever people did not frighten her any more. Even Mr. Hurst, whom she had disliked when she first met him, 
really wasn't disagreeable. And, poor man, he always looked so ill. Perhaps he was in love. Perhaps he had been in love with Rachel. She really shouldn't wonder. Or perhaps it was Evelyn. She was, of course, very attractive to men. Leaning forward, she went on with the conversation. She said that she thought that the reason why parties were so dull was mainly because gentlemen will not dress. Even in London, she stated, it struck her very much how people don't think it necessary to dress in the evening. And, of course, if they don't dress in London, they won't dress in the country. It was really quite a treat at Christmas time, when there were the hunt balls, and the gentlemen wore nice red coats. But Arthur didn't care for dancing, so she supposed that they wouldn't go even to the ball in their little country town. She didn't think that people who were fond of one sport often care for another, although her father was an exception but then he was an exception in every way. Such a gardener, and he knew all about birds and animals, and of course he was simply adored by all the old women in the village, and at the same time what he really liked best was a book. You always knew where to find him if he were wanted. He would be in his study with a book, very likely it would be an old, old book, some fusty old thing that no one else would dream of reading. She used to tell him that he would have made a first-rate old bookworm if only he hadn't had a family of six to support. And six children, she added, charmingly confident of universal sympathy, didn't leave one much time for being a bookworm. Still talking about her father, of whom she was very proud, she rose, for Arthur, upon looking at his watch, found that it was time they went back again to the tennis court. The others did not move. They're very happy, said Mrs. Thornbury, looking benignantly after them. Rachel agreed. They seemed to be so certain of themselves. They seemed to know exactly what they wanted. "'Do you think they are happy?' Evelyn murmured to Terence in an undertone, and she hoped that he would say that he did not think them happy. But instead he said that they must go too, go home, for they were always being late for meals, and Mrs. Ambrose, who was very stern and particular, didn't like that. Evelyn laid hold of Rachel's skirt and protested. Why should they go? It was still early, and she had so many things to say to them. No, said Terence, we must go, because we walk so slowly. We stop and look at things, and we talk. What do you talk about? Evelyn inquired, upon which he laughed and said that they talked about everything. Mrs. Thornbury went with them to the gate, trailing very slowly and gracefully across the grass and the gravel, and talking all the time about flowers and birds. She told them that she had taken up the study of botany since her daughter married, and it was wonderful what a number of flowers there were which she had never seen, although she had lived in the country all her life, and she was now seventy-two. It was a good thing to have some occupation, which was quite independent of other people, she said, when one got old. But the odd thing was that one never felt old, she always felt that she was twenty-five, not a day more or a day less. But, of course, one couldn't expect other people to agree to that. 
it must be very wonderful to be twenty-five and not merely to imagine that you're twenty-five she said looking from one to the other with her smooth bright glance it must be very wonderful very wonderful indeed she stood talking to them at the gate for a long time she seemed reluctant that they should go Chapter Twenty Five Part One of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The afternoon was very hot, so hot that the breaking of the waves on the shore sounded like the repeated sigh of some exhausted creature, and even on the terrace under an awning the bricks were hot and the air danced perpetually over the short dry grass. The red flowers in the stone basins were drooping with the heat, and the white blossoms which had been so smooth and thick only a few weeks ago were now dry, and their edges were curled and yellow. Only the stiff and hostile plants of the south whose fleshy leaves seemed to be grown upon spines, still remained standing upright and defied the sun to beat them down. It was too hot to talk, and it was not easy to find any book that would withstand the power of the sun. Many books had been tried and then let fall, and now Terence was reading Milton aloud because he said the words of Milton had substance and shape, so that it was not necessary to understand what he was saying. One could merely listen to his words. One could almost handle them. There is a gentle nymph not far from hence, he read, that with moist curb sways the smooth severn stream. Sabrina is her name a virgin pure, while Om she was the daughter of Locrine, that had the scepter from his father Brute. The words, in spite of what Terence had said, seemed to be laden with meaning, and perhaps it was for this reason that it was painful to listen to them. They sounded strange. They meant different things from what they usually meant. Rachel, at any rate, could not keep her attention fixed upon them, but went off upon curious trains of thought suggested by words such as curb and locrine and brute, which brought unpleasant sights before her eyes independently of their meaning. Owing to the heat and the dancing air, the garden too looked strange. The trees were either too near or too far, and her head almost certainly ached. She was not quite certain, and therefore she did not know whether to tell Terence now or to let him go on reading. She decided that she would wait until he came to the end of a stanza and if by that time she had turned her head this way and that, and it ached in every position, undoubtedly, she would say very calmly that her head ached. Sabrina, fair, listen where thou art sitting, under the glassy, cool, translucent wave, in twisted braids of lilies knitting, the loose train of thy amber dropping hair. Listen, for dear honour's sake, goddess of the silver lake, listen and save. But her head ached. It ached whichever way she turned it. She sat up and said as she had determined, My head aches so that I shall go indoors. He was halfway through the next verse, 
but he dropped the book instantly. "'Your head aches?' he repeated. For a few moments they sat looking at one another in silence, holding each other's hands. During this time his sense of dismay and catastrophe were almost physically painful. All round him he seemed to hear the shiver of broken glass, which, as it fell to earth, left him sitting in the open air. But at the end of two minutes, noticing that she was not sharing his dismay, but was only rather more languid and heavy-eyed than usual, he recovered, fetched Helen, and asked her to tell him what they had better do for Rachel had a headache. Mrs. Ambrose was not discomposed, but advised that she should go to bed, and added that she must expect her head to ache if she sat up to all hours and went out in the heat, but a few hours in bed would cure it completely. Terence was unreasonably reassured by her words, as he had been unreasonably depressed the moment before. Helen's sense seemed to have much in common with the ruthless good sense of nature, which avenged rashness by a headache, and like nature's good sense might be depended upon. Rachel went to bed. She lay in the dark, it seemed to her, for a very long time, but at length, waking from a transparent kind of sleep, she saw the windows white in front of her and recollected that some time before she had gone to bed with a headache, and that Helen had said it would be gone when she woke. She supposed, therefore, that she was now quite well again. At the same time the wall of her room was painfully white and curved slightly, instead of being straight and flat. Turning her eyes to the window, she was not reassured by what she saw there. The movement of the blind as it filled with air and blew slowly out, drawing the cord with a little trailing sound along the floor, seemed to her terrifying, as if it were the movement of an animal in the room. She shut her eyes, and the pulse in her head beat so strongly that each bump seemed to tread upon a nerve, piercing her forehead with a little stab of pain. It might not be the same headache, but she certainly had a headache. She turned from side to side in the hope that the coolness of the sheets would cure her and that when she next opened her eyes to look, the room would be as usual. After a considerable number of vain experiments, she resolved to put the matter beyond a doubt. She got out of bed and stood upright, holding on to the brass ball at the end of the bedstead. Ice cold at first, it soon became as hot as the palm of her hand, and as the pains in her head and body and the instability of the floor proved that it would be far more intolerable to stand and walk than to lie in bed, she got into bed again. But though the change was refreshing at first, the discomfort of bed was soon as great as the discomfort of standing up. She accepted the idea that she would have to stay in bed all day long, and as she laid her head on the pillow, relinquished the happiness of the day. When Helen came in an hour or two later, suddenly stopped her cheerful words, looked startled for a second, and then unnaturally calm, the fact that she was ill was put beyond a doubt. It was confirmed when the whole household knew of it, 
when the song that someone was singing in the garden stopped suddenly, and when Maria, as she brought water, slipped past the bed with averted eyes. There was all the morning to get through, and then all the afternoon, and at intervals she made an effort to cross over into the ordinary world, but she found that her heat and discomfort had put a gulf between her world and the ordinary world, which she could not bridge. At one point the door opened, and Helen came in with a little dark man who had. It was the chief thing she noticed about him. Very hairy hands. She was drowsy and intolerably hot, and as he seemed shy and obsequious, she scarcely troubled to answer him, although she understood that he was a doctor. At another point the door opened and Terence came in very gently, smiling too steadily, as she realized, for it to be natural. He sat down and talked to her, stroking her hands until it became irksome to her to lie any more in the same position, and she turned round, and when she looked up again Helen was beside her and Terence had gone. It did not matter. She would see him tomorrow when things would be ordinary again. Her chief occupation during the day was to try to remember how the lines went. Under the glassy, cool, translucent wave, in twisted braids of lilies knitting, the loose train of thy amber dropping hair. And the effort worried her because the adjectives persisted in getting into the wrong places. The second day did not differ very much from the first day, except that her bed had become very important, and the world outside, when she tried to think of it, appeared distinctly further off. The glassy, cool, translucent wave was almost visible before her, curling up at the end of the bed, and as it was refreshingly cool, she tried to keep her mind fixed upon it. Helen was here and Helen was there all day long. Sometimes she said that it was lunchtime, and sometimes that it was tea-time, but by the next day all landmarks were obliterated, and the outer world was so far away that the different sounds, such as the sounds of people moving overhead, could only be ascribed to their cause by a great effort of memory. The recollection of what she had felt or of what she had been doing and thinking three days before had faded entirely. On the other hand, every object in the room, and the bed itself, and her own body with its various limbs and their different sensations, were more and more important each day. She was completely cut off and unable to communicate with the rest of the world isolated alone with her body. Hours and hours would pass thus, without getting any further through the morning, or again a few minutes would lead from broad daylight to the depths of the night. One evening when the room appeared very dim, either because it was evening or because the blinds were drawn, Helen said to her, Someone is going to sit here tonight. You won't mind. Opening her eyes, Rachel saw not only Helen, but a nurse in spectacles, whose face vaguely recalled something that she had once seen. She had seen her in the chapel, 
Nurse McInnes, said Helen, and the nurse smiled steadily, as they all did, and said that she did not find many people who were frightened of her. After waiting for a moment, they both disappeared, and having turned on her pillow, Rachel woke to find herself in the midst of one of those interminable nights which do not end at twelve, but go on into the double figures, thirteen, fourteen, and so on, until they reach the twenties, and then the thirties, and then the forties. She realized that there is nothing to prevent knights from doing this if they chose. At a great distance an elderly woman sat with her head bent down. Rachel raised herself slightly and saw with dismay that she was playing cards by the light of a candle which stood in the hollow of a newspaper. The sight had something inexplicably sinister about it, and she was terrified and cried out upon which the woman laid down her cards and came across the room, shading the candle with her hands. Coming nearer and nearer across the great space of the room, she stood at last above Rachel's head and said, Not asleep? Let me make you comfortable. She put down the candle and began to arrange the bedclothes, it struck Rachel that a woman who sat playing cards in a cavern all night long would have very cold hands, and she shrunk from the touch of them. Why, there's a toe all the way down there, the woman said, proceeding to tuck in the bedclothes. Rachel did not realize that the toe was hers. You must try to lie still, she proceeded because if you lie still you will be less hot, and if you toss about you will make yourself more hot, and we don't want you to be any hotter than you are. She stood looking down upon Rachel for an enormous length of time. And the quieter you lie, the sooner you will be well, she repeated. Rachel kept her eyes fixed upon the peaked shadow on the ceiling, and all her energy was concentrated upon the desire that this shadow should move. But the shadow and the woman seemed to be eternally fixed above her. She shut her eyes. When she opened them again, several more hours had passed, but the night still lasted interminably. The woman was still playing cards, only she sat now in a tunnel under a river, and the light stood in a little archway in the wall above her. She cried, Terence, and the peaked shadow again moved across the ceiling, as the woman with an enormous slow movement rose and they both stood still above her. It's just as difficult to keep you in bed as it was to keep Mr. Forrest in bed, the woman said, and he was such a tall gentleman. In order to get rid of this terrible stationary sight, Rachel again shut her eyes and found herself walking through a tunnel under the Thames where there were little deformed women sitting in archways playing cards, while the bricks of which the wall was made oozed with damp, which collected into drops and slid down the wall. But the little old women became Helen and Nurse McGuinness after a time, standing in the window together, whispering, whispering incessantly. Meanwhile, outside her room, the sounds, the movements, and the lives of the other people in the house 
went on in the ordinary light of the sun throughout the usual succession of hours. When, on the first day of her illness, it became clear that she would not be absolutely well, for her temperature was very high, until Friday, that day being Tuesday, Terence was filled with resentment, not against her, but against the force outside them which was separating them. He counted up the number of days that would almost certainly be spoilt for them. He realized with an odd mixture of pleasure and annoyance that, for the first time in his life, he was so dependent upon another person that his happiness was in her keeping. The days were completely wasted upon trifling, immaterial things, for after three weeks of such intimacy and intensity, all the usual occupations were unbearably flat and beside the point. The least intolerable occupation was to talk to St. John about Rachel's illness, and to discuss every symptom and its meaning and when this subject was exhausted, to discuss illness of all kinds, and what caused them, and what cured them. Twice every day he went in to sit with Rachel, and twice every day the same thing happened. On going into her room, which was not very dark, where the music was lying about as usual, and her books and letters, his spirits rose instantly. When he saw her he felt completely reassured. She did not look very ill. Sitting by her side he would tell her what he had been doing, using his natural voice to speak to her, only a few tones lower down than usual. But by the time he had sat there for five minutes he was plunged into the deepest gloom. She was not the same. He could not bring them back to their old relationship. But although he knew that it was foolish, he could not prevent himself from endeavouring to bring her back, to make her remember. And when this failed, he was in despair. He always concluded as he left her room that it was worse to see her than not to see her. But by degrees, as the day wore on, the desire to see her returned and became almost too great to be born. On Thursday morning, when Terence went into her room he felt the usual increase of confidence. She turned round and made an effort to remember certain facts from the world that was so many millions of miles away. "'You have come up from the hotel?' she asked. "'No, I'm staying here for the present,' he said. "'We've just had luncheon,' he continued and the mail has come in. There's a bundle of letters for you, letters from England. Instead of saying, as he meant her to say, that she wished to see them, she said nothing for some time. You see, there they go, rolling off the edge of the hill, she said suddenly. Rolling, Rachel? What do you see rolling? There's nothing rolling. The old woman with the knife, she replied, not speaking to Terence in particular, and looking past him, as she appeared to be looking at a vase on the shelf opposite, he rose and took it down. Now they can't roll any more, he said cheerfully. Nevertheless, she lay gazing at the same spot, and paid him no further attention, although he spoke to her. He became so profoundly wretched 
that he could not endure to sit with her, but wandered about until he found St. John, who was reading the Times in the veranda. He laid it aside patiently, and heard all that Terence had to say about delirium. He was very patient with Terence. He treated him like a child. By Friday it could not be denied that the illness was no longer an attack that would pass off in a day or two. It was a real illness that required a good deal of organization, and engrossed the attention of at least five people but there was no reason to be anxious. Instead of lasting five days, it was going to last ten days. Rodriguez was understood to say that there were well-known varieties of this illness. Rodriguez appeared to think that they were treating the illness with undue anxiety. His visits were always marked by the same show of confidence and in his interviews with Terence he always waved aside his anxious and minute questions with a kind of flourish which seemed to indicate that they were all taking it much too seriously. He seemed curiously unwilling to sit down. A high temperature, he said, looking furtively about the room, and appearing to be more interested in the furniture and in Helen's embroidery than in anything else. In this climate you must expect a high temperature. You need not be alarmed by that. It is the pulse we go by, he tapped his own hairy wrist, and the pulse continues excellent. Thereupon he bowed and slipped out, the interview was conducted laboriously upon both sides in French, and this, together with the fact that he was optimistic, and that Terence respected the medical profession from hearsay, made him less critical than he would have been had he encountered the doctor in any other capacity. Unconsciously he took Rodriguez's side against Helen, who seemed to have taken an unreasonable prejudice against him. When Saturday came, it was evident that the hours of the day must be more strictly organized than they had been. St. John offered his services. He said that he had nothing to do, and that he might as well spend the day at the villa if he could be of use as if they were starting on a difficult expedition together. They parceled out their duties between them, writing out an elaborate scheme of hours upon a large sheet of paper which was pinned to the drawing-room door. Their distance from the town, and the difficulty of procuring rare things with unknown names from the most unexpected places, made it necessary to think very carefully, and they found it unexpectedly difficult to do the simple but practical things that were required of them, as if they, being very tall, were asked to stoop down and arrange minute grains of sand in a pattern on the ground. It was St. John's duty to fetch what was needed from the town, so that Terence would sit all through the long hot hours alone in the drawing-room, near the open door, listening for any movement upstairs or call from Helen. He always forgot to pull down the blinds, so that he sat in bright sunshine, which worried him without his knowing what was the cause of it. The room was terribly stiff and uncomfortable. There were hats in the chairs, and medicine bottles among the books. He tried to read, but good books were too good, and bad books were too bad, and the only thing he could tolerate was the newspaper, which, with its news of London 
and the movements of real people who were giving dinner parties and making speeches seemed to give a little background of reality to what was otherwise mere nightmare. Then, just as his attention was fixed on the print, a soft call would come from Helen, or Mrs. Chailey would bring in something which was wanted upstairs, and he would run up very quietly in his socks and put the jug on the little table which stood crowded with jugs and cups outside the bedroom door. Or if he could catch Helen for a moment, he would ask, How is she? Rather restless. On the whole, quieter, I think. The answer would be one or the other. As usual, she seemed to reserve something which she did not say, and Terence was conscious that they disagreed, and without saying it aloud, were arguing against each other. But she was too hurried and preoccupied to talk. The strain of listening and the effort of making practical arrangements and seeing that things worked smoothly absorbed all Terence's power. Involved in this long, dreary nightmare, he did not attempt to think what it amounted to. Rachel was ill. That was all. He must see that there was medicine and milk, and that things were ready when they were wanted. Thought had ceased. Life itself had come to a standstill. Sunday was rather worse than Saturday had been, simply because the strain was a little greater every day, although nothing else had changed. The separate feelings of pleasure, interest, and pain, which combined to make up the ordinary day, were merged in one long-drawn sensation of sordid misery and profound boredom. He had never been so bored since he was shut up in the nursery alone as a child. The vision of Rachel as she was now, confused and heedless, had almost obliterated the vision of her as she had been once long ago. He could hardly believe that they had ever been happy or engaged to be married. For what were feelings? What was there to be felt? Confusion covered every sight and person, and he seemed to see St. John, Ridley, and the stray people who came up now and then from the hotel to inquire, through a mist. The only people who were not hidden in this mist were Helen and Rodriguez because they could tell him something definite about Rachel. Nevertheless, the day followed the usual forms. At certain hours they went into the dining room, and when they sat round the table they talked about indifferent things. St. John usually made it his business to start the talk and to keep it from dying out. I've discovered the way to get Sancho past the White House, said St. John on Sunday at luncheon. You crackle a piece of paper in his ear. Then he bolts for about a hundred yards. But he goes on quite well after that. Yes, but he wants corn. You should see that he has corn. I don't think much of the stuff they give him, and Angelo seems a dirty little rascal. There was then a long silence. Ridley murmured a few lines of poetry under his breath, and remarked, as if to conceal the fact that he had done so, very hot today. Two degrees higher than it was yesterday, said St. John. I wonder where these nuts come from, 
he observed, taking a nut out of the plate, turning it over in his fingers, and looking at it curiously. "'London, I should think,' said Terence, looking at the nut too. "'A competent man of business could make a fortune here in no time,' St. John continued. "'I suppose the heat does something funny to people's brains. Even the English go a little queer.' Anyhow, they're hopeless people to deal with. They kept me three-quarters of an hour waiting at the chemist's this morning, for no reason whatever. There was another long pause. Then Ridley inquired, Rodriguez seems satisfied? Quite, said Terence with decision. It's just got to run its course whereupon Ridley heaved a deep sigh. He was genuinely sorry for everyone, but at the same time he missed Helen considerably, and was a little aggrieved by the constant presence of the two young men. They moved back into the drawing-room. "'Look here, Hurst,' said Terence. "'There's nothing to be done for two hours.' he consulted the sheet pinned to the door. You go and lie down. I'll wait here. Chailey sits with Rachel while Helen has her luncheon. It was asking a good deal of Hurst to tell him to go without waiting for a sight of Helen. These little glimpses of Helen were the only respites from strain and boredom, and very often they seemed to make up for the discomfort of the day, although she might not have anything to tell them. However, as they were on an expedition together, he had made up his mind to obey. Helen was very late in coming down. She looked like a person who has been sitting for a long time in the dark. She was pale and thinner and the expression of her eyes was harassed but determined. She ate her luncheon quickly, and seemed indifferent to what she was doing. She brushed aside Terence's inquiries, and at last, as if he had not spoken, she looked at him with a slight frown and said, "'We can't go on like this, Terence. Either you've got to find another doctor, or you must tell Rodriguez to stop coming, and I'll manage for myself. It's no use for him to say that Rachel's better. She's not better. She's worse. Terence suffered a terrific shock, like that which he had suffered when Rachel said, My head aches. He stilled it by reflecting that Helen was overwrought, and he was upheld in this opinion by his obstinate sense that she was opposed to him in the argument. "'Do you think she's in danger?' he asked. "'No one can go on being as ill as that day after day,' Helen replied. She looked at him, and spoke as if she felt some indignation with somebody. "'Very well.' I'll talk to Rodriguez this afternoon, he replied. Helen went upstairs at once. Nothing could now assuage Terence's anxiety. He could not read, nor could he sit still, and his sense of security was shaken, in spite of the fact that he was determined that Helen was exaggerating, and that Rachel was not very ill but he wanted a third person to confirm him in his belief. Directly Rodriguez came down, he demanded, Well, how is she? Do you think her worse? There is no reason for anxiety, I tell you, none, Rodriguez replied in his execrable French, smiling uneasily and making little movements all the time as if to get away. 
Hewitt stood firmly between him and the door. He was determined to see for himself what kind of man he was. His confidence in the man vanished as he looked at him and saw his insignificance, his dirty appearance, his shiftiness, and his unintelligent hairy face. It was strange that he had never seen this before. You won't object, of course, if we ask you to consult another doctor, he continued. At this the little man became openly incensed. Ah, he cried, you have not confidence in me. You object to my treatment? You wish me to give up the case? Not at all, Terence replied but in serious illness of this kind. Rodriguez shrugged his shoulders. It is not serious, I assure you. You are over-anxious. The young lady is not seriously ill, and I am a doctor. The lady, of course, is frightened, he sneered. I understand that perfectly. The name and address of the doctor is... Terence continued. There is no other doctor, Rodriguez replied sullenly. Everyone has confidence in me. Look, I will show you. He took out a packet of old letters and began turning them over as if in search of one that would confute Terence's suspicions. As he searched, he began to tell a story about an English lord who had trusted him, a great English lord, whose name he had unfortunately forgotten. There is no other doctor in the place, he concluded, still turning over the letters. Never mind, said Terence shortly. I will make inquiries for myself. Rodriguez put the letters back in his pocket. Very well, he remarked. I have no objection. He lifted his eyebrows, shrugged his shoulders, as if to repeat that they took the illness much too seriously, and that there was no other doctor, and slipped out, leaving behind him an impression that he was conscious that he was distrusted and that his malice was aroused. After this, Terence could no longer stay downstairs. He went up, knocked at Rachel's door, and asked Helen whether he might see her for a few minutes. He had not seen her yesterday. She made no objection, and went and sat at a table in the window. Terence sat down by the bedside, Rachel's face was changed. She looked as though she were entirely concentrated upon the effort of keeping alive. Her lips were drawn, and her cheeks were sunken and flushed, though without colour. Her eyes were not entirely shut, the lower half of the white part showing, not as if she saw but as if they remained open because she was too much exhausted to close them. She opened them completely when he kissed her, but she only saw an old woman slicing a man's head off with a knife. There it falls, she murmured. She then turned to Terence and asked him anxiously some question about a man with mules which he could not understand. Why doesn't he come? Why doesn't he come? she repeated. He was appalled to think of the dirty little man downstairs in connection with illness like this, and turned instinctively to Helen. But she was doing something at a table in the window, and did not seem to realize how great the shock to him must be. He rose to go, for he could not endure to listen any longer. His heart 
beat quickly and painfully with anger and misery. As he passed Helen she asked him in the same weary, unnatural but determined voice to fetch her more ice and to have the jug outside filled with fresh milk. When he had done these errands he went to find Hurst. Exhausted and very hot, St. John had fallen asleep on a bed, but Terence woke him without scruple. Helen thinks she's worse, he said. There's no doubt she's frightfully ill. Rodriguez is useless. We must get another doctor. But there is no other doctor, said Hurst drowsily, sitting up and rubbing his eyes. Don't be a damned fool, Terence exclaimed. Of course there's another doctor, and if there isn't, you've got to find one. It ought to have been done days ago. I'm going down to saddle the horse. He could not stay still in one place. In less than ten minutes St. John was riding to the town in the scorching heat in search of a doctor, his orders being to find one and bring him back if he had to be fetched in a special train. We ought to have done it days ago, Hewitt repeated angrily. When he went back into the drawing-room he found that Mrs. Flushing was there, standing very erect in the middle of the room, having arrived, as people did in these days, by the kitchen or through the garden unannounced. "'She's better?' Mrs. Flushing inquired abruptly. They did not attempt to shake hands. No, said Terence, if anything, they think she's worse. Mrs. Flushing seemed to consider for a moment or two, looking straight at Terence all the time. Let me tell you, she said, speaking in nervous jerks, it's always about the seventh day one begins to get anxious. I dare say you've been sitting here worrying by yourself. You think she's bad, but anyone coming with a fresh eye would see she was better. Mr. Elliot's had fever. He's all right now, she threw out. It wasn't anything she caught on the expedition. What's it matter? A few days fever. My brother had fever for twenty-six days once and in a week or two he was up and about. We gave him nothing but milk and arrowroot. Here Mrs. Chailey came in with a message. I'm wanted upstairs, said Terence. You'll see, she'll be better, Mrs. Flushing jerked out as he left the room. Her anxiety to persuade Terence was very great and when he left her without saying anything she felt dissatisfied and restless. She did not like to stay, but she could not bear to go. She wandered from room to room, looking for someone to talk to, but all the rooms were empty. Chapter Twenty Five Part Two of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Terence went upstairs, stood inside the door to take Helen's directions, looked over at Rachel, but did not attempt to speak to her. She appeared vaguely conscious of his presence, but it seemed to disturb her, and she turned so that she lay with her back to him. For six days, indeed, she had been oblivious of the world outside, because it needed all her attention to follow the hot, 
red, quick sights which passed incessantly before her eyes. She knew that it was of enormous importance that she should attend to these sights and grasp their meaning, but she was always being just too late to hear or see something which would explain it all. For this reason, the faces, Helen's face, the nurse's, Terence's, the doctor's, which occasionally forced themselves very close to her, were worrying because they distracted her attention and she might miss the clue. However, on the fourth afternoon she was suddenly unable to keep Helen's face distinct from the sights themselves. Her lips widened as she bent down over the bed, and she began to gabble unintelligibly like the rest. The sights were all concerned in some plot, some adventure, some escape. The nature of what they were doing changed incessantly, although there was always a reason behind it, which she must endeavour to grasp. Now they were among trees and savages, now they were on the sea, now they were on the tops of high towers, now they jumped, now they flew. But just as the crisis was about to happen, something invariably slipped in her brain, so that the whole effort had to begin over again. The heat was suffocating. At last the faces went further away. She fell into a deep pool of sticky water, which eventually closed over her head. She saw nothing and heard nothing but a faint booming sound, which was the sound of the sea rolling over her head. While all her tormentors thought that she was dead, she was not dead, but curled up at the bottom of the sea. There she lay, sometimes seeing darkness, sometimes light, while every now and then someone turned her over at the bottom of the sea. After St. John had spent some hours in the heat of the sun, wrangling with evasive and very garrulous natives, he extracted the information that there was a doctor, a French doctor, who was at present away on a holiday in the hills. It was quite impossible, so they said, to find him. With his experience of the country, St. John thought it unlikely that a telegram would either be sent or received. But having reduced the distance of the hill town, in which he was staying, from a hundred miles to thirty miles, and having hired a carriage and horses, he started at once to fetch the doctor himself. He succeeded in finding him and eventually forced the unwilling man to leave his young wife and return forthwith. They reached the villa at midday on Tuesday. Terence came out to receive them, and St. John was struck by the fact that he had grown perceptibly thinner in the interval. He was white, too. His eyes looked strange but the curt speech and the sulky masterful manner of Dr. Lesage impressed them both favourably, although at the same time it was obvious that he was very much annoyed at the whole affair. Coming downstairs he gave his directions emphatically, but it never occurred to him to give an opinion, either because of the presence of Rodriguez, who was now obsequious as well as malicious, or because he took it for granted that they already knew what was to be known. Of course, he said with a shrug of his shoulders, when Terence asked him, is she very ill? They were both conscious of a certain sense of relief when Dr. Lesage was gone, leaving explicit directions and promising another visit in a few hours' time. But unfortunately, the rise of their spirits led them to talk more than usual, 
and in talking they quarrelled. They quarrelled about a road, the Portsmouth Road. St. John said that it was macadamized where it passes Hindhead, and Terence knew as well as he knew his own name that it is not macadamized at that point. In the course of the argument they said some very sharp things to each other, and the rest of the dinner was eaten in silence, save for an occasional half-stifled reflection from Ridley. When it grew dark and the lamps were brought in, Terence felt unable to control his irritation any longer. St. John went to bed in a state of complete exhaustion, bidding Terence good night with rather more affection than usual because of their quarrel, and Ridley retired to his books. Left alone, Terence walked up and down the room. He stood at the open window. The lights were coming out one after another in the town beneath, and it was very peaceful and cool in the garden, so that he stepped out on to the terrace. As he stood there in the darkness, able only to see the shapes of trees through the fine grey light, he was overcome by a desire to escape to have done with this suffering, to forget that Rachel was ill. He allowed himself to lapse into forgetfulness of everything, as if a wind that had been raging incessantly suddenly fell asleep. The fret and strain and anxiety which had been pressing on him passed away. He seemed to stand in an unvexed space of air, on a little island by himself, he was free and immune from pain. It did not matter whether Rachel was well or ill, it did not matter whether they were apart or together, nothing mattered, nothing mattered. The waves beat on the shore far away and the soft wind passed through the branches of the trees seeming to encircle him with peace and security, with dark and nothingness. Surely the world of strife and fret and anxiety was not the real world, but this was the real world, the world that lay beneath the superficial world, so that whatever happened one was secure. The quiet and peace seemed to lap his body in a fine, cool sheet, soothing every nerve. His mind seemed once more to expand and become natural. But when he had stood thus for a time, a noise in the house roused him. He turned instinctively and went into the drawing-room. The sight of the lamp-lit room brought back so abruptly all that he had forgotten, that he stood for a moment unable to move. He remembered everything, the hour, the minute even, what point they had reached and what was to come. He cursed himself for making believe for a minute that things were different from what they are. The night was now harder to face than ever. Unable to stay in the empty drawing-room, he wandered out and sat on the stairs halfway up to Rachel's room. He longed for someone to talk to, but Hurst was asleep, and Ridley was asleep. There was no sound in Rachel's room. The only sound in the house was the sound of Chailey moving in the kitchen. At last there was a rustling on the stairs overhead, and Nurse McGinnis came down, fastening the links in her cuffs, in preparation for the night's watch. Terence rose and stopped her. He had scarcely spoken to her, but it was possible that she might confirm him in his belief, which still persisted in his mind, that Rachel was not seriously ill. 
He told her in a whisper that Dr. Lesage had been, and what he had said. Now, nurse, he whispered, please tell me your opinion. Do you consider that she is very seriously ill? Is she in any danger? The doctor has said, she began, Yes, but I want your opinion. You have had experience of many cases like this. I could not tell you more than Dr. Lesage, Mr. Hewitt, she replied cautiously, as though her words might be used against her. The case is serious, but you may feel quite certain that we are doing all we can for Miss Vinrace. She spoke with some professional self-approbation, but she realized perhaps that she did not satisfy the young man who still blocked her way, for she shifted her feet slightly upon the stair and looked out of the window where they could see the moon over the sea. If you ask me, she began in a curiously stealthy tone, I never like May for my patients. May? Terence repeated. It may be a fancy, but I don't like to see anybody fall ill in May, she continued. Things seem to go wrong in May. Perhaps it's the moon. They say the moon affects the brain, don't they, sir? He looked at her, but he could not answer her. Like all the others, when one looked at her, she seemed to shrivel beneath one's eyes and become worthless, malicious, and untrustworthy. She slipped past him and disappeared. Though he went to his room, he was unable even to take his clothes off. For a long time he paced up and down, and then leaning out of the window, gazed at the earth which lay so dark against the paler blue of the sky. With a mixture of fear and loathing he looked at the slim black cypress trees which were still visible in the garden, and heard the unfamiliar creaking and grating sounds which show that the earth is still hot. All these sights and sounds appeared sinister and full of hostility and foreboding. Together with the natives and the nurse and the doctor and the terrible force of the illness itself, they seemed to be in conspiracy against him. They seemed to join together in their effort to extract the greatest possible amount of suffering from him. He could not get used to his pain. It was a revelation to him. He had never realized before that underneath every action, underneath the life of every day, pain lies, quiescent, but ready to devour. He seemed to be able to see suffering, as if it were a fire, curling up over the edges of all action, eating away the lives of men and women. He thought for the first time with understanding of words which had before seemed to him empty. The struggle of life, the hardness of life. Now he knew for himself that life is hard and full of suffering. He looked at the scattered lights in the town beneath, and thought of Arthur and Susan, of Evelyn and Parrot venturing out unwittingly, and by their happiness laying themselves open to suffering such as this. How did they dare to love each other, he wondered. How had he himself dared to live as he had lived, rapidly and carelessly, passing from one thing to another, loving Rachel as he had loved her? Never again would he feel secure. He would never believe in the stability of life, or forget what depths of pain lie beneath small happiness and feelings of content and safety. It seemed to him as he looked back 
that their happiness had never been so great as his pain was now. There had always been something imperfect in their happiness, something they had wanted and had not been able to get. It had been fragmentary and incomplete, because they were so young and had not known what they were doing. The light of his candle flickered over the boughs of a tree outside the window, and as the branch swayed in the darkness there came before his mind a picture of all the world that lay outside his window. He thought of the immense river and the immense forest, the vast stretches of dry earth and the plains of the sea that encircled the earth. From the sea the sky rose steep and enormous, and the air washed profoundly between the sky and the sea. How vast and dark it must be tonight, lying exposed to the wind! And in all this great space it was curious to think how few the towns were, and how small little rings of light or single glow-worms he figured them, scattered here and there among the swelling uncultivated folds of the world. And in those towns were little men and women, tiny men and women. Oh, it was absurd, when one thought of it, to sit here in a little room, suffering and caring. What did anything matter? Rachel, a tiny creature, lay ill beneath him, and here in his little room he suffered on her account. The nearness of their bodies in this vast universe, and the minuteness of their bodies, seemed to him absurd and laughable. Nothing mattered, he repeated. They had no power, no hope. He leant on the window sill, thinking until he almost forgot the time and the place. Nevertheless, although he was convinced that it was absurd and laughable, and that they were small and hopeless, he never lost the sense that these thoughts somehow formed part of a life which he and Rachel would live together. Owing, perhaps, to the change of doctor, Rachel appeared to be rather better next day. Terribly pale and worn, though Helen looked, there was a slight lifting of the cloud which had hung all these days in her eyes. She talked to me, she said voluntarily. She asked me what day of the week it was. Like herself, then suddenly, without any warning or any apparent reason, the tears formed in her eyes and rolled steadily down her cheeks. She cried with scarcely any attempt at movement of her features, and without any attempt to stop herself, as if she did not know that she was crying. In spite of the relief which her words gave him, Terence was dismayed by the sight. Had everything given way? Were there no limits to the power of this illness? Would everything go down before it? Helen had always seemed to him strong and determined, and now she was like a child. He took her in his arms, and she clung to him like a child, crying softly and quietly upon his shoulder. Then she roused herself and wiped her tears away. It was silly to behave like that, she said. Very silly, she repeated. When there could be no doubt that Rachel was better. She asked Terence to forgive her for her folly. She stopped at the door and came back and kissed him without saying anything. On this day, indeed, Rachel was conscious of what went on round her. She had come to the surface of the dark, sticky pool, 
and a wave seemed to bear her up and down with it. She had ceased to have any will of her own. She lay on the top of the wave, conscious of some pain, but chiefly of weakness. The wave was replaced by the side of a mountain. Her body became a drift of melting snow, above which her knees rose in huge peaked mountains of bare bone. It was true that she saw Helen and saw her room, but everything had become very pale and semi-transparent. Sometimes she could see through the wall in front of her. Sometimes when Helen went away she seemed to go so far that Rachel's eyes could hardly follow her. The room also had an odd power of expanding, and though she pushed her voice out as far as possible until sometimes it became a bird and flew away, she thought it doubtful whether it ever reached the person she was talking to. There were immense intervals or chasms, for things still had the power to appear visibly before her, between one moment and the next. It sometimes took an hour for Helen to raise her arm, pausing long between each jerky movement and pour out medicine. Helen's form stooping to raise her in bed appeared of gigantic size, and came down upon her like the ceiling falling. But for long spaces of time she would merely lie conscious of her body floating on the top of the bed, and her mind driven to some remote corner of her body, or escaped and gone flitting round the room. All sights were something of an effort, but the sight of Terence was the greatest effort, because he forced her to join mind to body in the desire to remember something. She did not wish to remember. It troubled her when people tried to disturb her loneliness. She wished to be alone. She wished for nothing else in the world. Although she had cried, Terence observed Helen's greater hopefulness with something like triumph. In the argument between them, she had made the first sign of admitting herself in the wrong. He waited for Dr. Lesage to come down that afternoon with considerable anxiety but with the same certainty at the back of his mind that he would in time force them all to admit that they were in the wrong. As usual, Dr. Lesage was sulky in his manner and very short in his answers. To Terence's demand, she seems to be better? He replied, looking at him in an odd way. She has a chance of life. The door shut and Terence walked across to the window. He leant his forehead against the pane. Rachel, he repeated to himself, she has a chance of life. Rachel. How could they say these things of Rachel? Had any one yesterday seriously believed that Rachel was dying? They had been engaged for four weeks. A fortnight ago she had been perfectly well. What could fourteen days have done to bring her from that state to this? To realize what they meant by saying that she had a chance of life was beyond him, knowing as he did that they were engaged. He turned, still enveloped, in the same dreary mist, and walked towards the door. Suddenly he saw it all. He saw the room and the garden, and the trees moving in the air. They could go on without her. She could die. 
For the first time since she fell ill he remembered exactly what she looked like, and the way in which they cared for each other. The immense happiness of feeling her close to him mingled with a more intense anxiety than he had felt yet. He could not let her die. He could not live without her. But after a momentary struggle, the curtain fell again, and he saw nothing and felt nothing clearly. It was all going on, going on still, in the same way as before, save for a physical pain when his heart beat and the fact that his fingers were icy cold. He did not realize that he was anxious about anything. Within his mind he seemed to feel nothing about Rachel or about anyone or anything in the world. He went on giving orders, arranging with Mrs. Chailey, writing out lists, and every now and then he went upstairs and put something quietly on the table outside Rachel's door. That night Dr. Lesage seemed to be less sulky than usual. He stayed voluntarily for a few moments, and addressing St. John and Terence equally, as if he did not remember which of them was engaged to the young lady, said, I consider that her condition to-night is very grave. Neither of them went to bed or suggested that the other should go to bed. They sat in the drawing-room, playing piquet with the door open. St. John made up a bed upon the sofa, and when it was ready, insisted that Terence should lie upon it. They began to quarrel as to who should lie on the sofa, and who should lie upon a couple of chairs covered with rugs. St. John forced Terence at last to lie down upon the sofa. "'Don't be a fool, Terence,' he said. "'You'll only get ill if you don't sleep.' "'Old fellow,' he began, as Terence still refused, and stopped abruptly, fearing sentimentality. He found that he was on the verge of tears. He began to say what he had long been wanting to say, that he was sorry for Terence, that he cared for him, that he cared for Rachel. Did she know how much he cared for her? Had she said anything, asked perhaps? He was very anxious to say this, but he refrained, thinking that it was a selfish question after all. And what was the use of bothering Terence to talk about such things? He was already half asleep, but St. John could not sleep at once. If only, he thought to himself, as he lay in the darkness, something would happen. If only this strain would come to an end. He did not mind what happened so long as the succession of these hard and dreary days was broken. He did not mind if she died. He felt himself disloyal in not minding it, but it seemed to him that he had no feelings left. All night long there was no call or movement, except the opening and shutting of the bedroom door once. By degrees the light returned into the untidy room. At six the servants began to move. At seven they crept downstairs into the kitchen, and half an hour later the day began again. Nevertheless it was not the same as the days that had gone before, although it would have been hard to say in what the difference consisted. Perhaps it was that they seemed to be waiting for something. There were certainly fewer things to be done than usual. People drifted through the drawing-room. 
Mr. Flushing, Mr. and Mrs. Thornbury. They spoke very apologetically, in low tones, refusing to sit down, but remaining for a considerable time standing up, although the only thing they had to say was, Is there anything we can do? And there was nothing they could do. Feeling oddly detached from it all, Terence remembered how Helen had said that whenever anything happened to you, this was how people behaved. Was she right, or was she wrong? He was too little interested to frame an opinion of his own. He put things away in his mind, as if one of these days he would think about them but not now. The mist of unreality had deepened and deepened until it had produced a feeling of numbness all over his body. Was it his body? Were those really his own hands? This morning also, for the first time, Ridley found it impossible to sit alone in his room. He was very uncomfortable downstairs, and as he did not know what was going on, constantly in the way. But he would not leave the drawing-room. Too restless to read, and having nothing to do, he began to pace up and down, reciting poetry in an undertone. Occupied in various ways, now in undoing parcels, now in uncorking bottles, now in writing directions. The sound of Ridley's song and the beat of his pacing worked into the minds of Terence and St. John all the morning as a half-comprehended refrain. They wrestled up, they wrestled down, they wrestled sore and still, the fiend who blinds the eyes of men that night he had his will. Like stags full spent, among the bent, they dropped a while to rest. Oh, it's intolerable, Hurst exclaimed, and then checked himself as if it were a breach of their agreement. Again and again Terence would creep halfway up the stairs in case he might be able to glean news of Rachel but the only news now was of a very fragmentary kind. She had drunk something. She had slept a little. She seemed quieter. In the same way, Dr. Lesage confined himself to talking about details, save once when he volunteered the information that he had just been called in to ascertain by severing a vein in the wrist, that an old lady of eighty-five was really dead. She had a horror of being buried alive. It is a horror, he remarked, that we generally find in the very old, and seldom in the young. They both expressed their interest in what he told them. It seemed to them very strange. Another strange thing about the day was that the luncheon was forgotten by all of them until it was late in the afternoon, and then Mrs. Chailey waited on them, and looked strange, too, because she wore a stiff print dress, and her sleeves were rolled up above her elbows. She seemed as oblivious to her appearance, however, as if she had been called out of her bed by a midnight alarm of fire, and she had forgotten, too, her reserve and her composure. She talked to them quite familiarly, as if she had nursed them and held them naked on her knee. She assured them over and over again that it was their duty to eat. The afternoon, being thus shortened, passed more quickly than they expected. Once Mrs. Flushing opened the door, but on seeing them shut it again quickly. 
once Helen came down to fetch something, but she stopped as she left the room to look at a letter addressed to her. She stood for a moment turning it over, and the extraordinary and mournful beauty of her attitude struck Terence in the way things struck him now, as something to be put away in his mind and to be thought about afterwards. They scarcely spoke, the argument between them seeming to be suspended or forgotten. Now that the afternoon sun had left the front of the house, Ridley paced up and down the terrace, repeating stanzas of a long poem, in a subdued but suddenly sonorous voice. Fragments of the poem were wafted in at the open window as he passed and repassed. Peor and Balim forsake their temples dim, with that twice-battered god of Palestine, and mooned Astaroth. The sound of these words were strangely discomforting to both the young men, but they had to be borne. As the evening drew on and the red light of the sunset glittered far away on the sea, the same sense of desperation attacked both Terence and St. John at the thought that the day was nearly over, and that another night was at hand. The appearance of one light after another in the town beneath them produced in Hurst a repetition of his terrible and disgusting desire to break down and sob. Then the lamps were brought in by Chailey. She explained that Maria, in opening a bottle, had been so foolish as to cut her arm badly, but she had bound it up. It was unfortunate when there was so much work to be done. Chailey herself limped because of the rheumatism in her feet, but it appeared to her mere waste of time to take any notice of the unruly flesh of servants. The evening went on, Dr. Lesage arrived unexpectedly and stayed upstairs a very long time. He came down once and drank a cup of coffee. She is very ill, he said in answer to Ridley's question. All the annoyance had by this time left his manner. He was grave and formal, but at the same time it was full of consideration which had not marked it before. He went upstairs again. The three men sat together in the drawing-room. Ridley was quite quiet now, and his attention seemed to be thoroughly awakened. Save for little half-voluntary movements and exclamations that were stifled at once, they waited in complete silence. It seemed as if they were at last brought together face to face with something definite. It was nearly eleven o'clock when Dr. Lesage again appeared in the room. He approached them very slowly and did not speak at once. He looked first at St. John and then at Terence and said to Terence, Mr. Hewitt, I think you should go upstairs now. Terence rose immediately, leaving the others seated with Dr. Lesage standing motionless between them. Chailey was in the passage outside, repeating over and over again, It's wicked, it's wicked. Terence paid her no attention. He heard what she was saying but it conveyed no meaning to his mind. All the way upstairs he kept saying to himself, This has not happened to me. It is not possible that this has happened to me. He looked curiously at his own hand on the banisters. The stairs were very steep, and it seemed to take him a long time to surmount them. Instead of feeling keenly, as he knew that he ought to feel, 
he felt nothing at all. When he opened the door he saw Helen sitting by the bedside. There were shaded lights on the table, and the room, though it seemed to be full of a great many things, was very tidy. There was a faint and not unpleasant smell of disinfectants. Helen rose and gave up her chair to him in silence. As they passed each other, their eyes met in a peculiar level glance. He wondered at the extraordinary clearness of her eyes, and at the deep calm and sadness that dwelt in them. He sat down by the bedside, and a moment afterwards heard the door shut gently behind her. He was alone with Rachel, and a faint reflection of the sense of relief that they used to feel when they were left alone possessed him. He looked at her. He expected to find some terrible change in her, but there was none. She looked indeed very thin, and as far as he could see, very tired but she was the same as she had always been. Moreover, she saw him and knew him. She smiled at him and said, Hello, Terence. The curtain which had been drawn between them for so long vanished immediately. Well, Rachel, he replied in his usual voice, upon which she opened her eyes quite widely and smiled with her familiar smile. He kissed her and took her hand. It's been wretched without you, he said. She still looked at him and smiled, but soon a slight look of fatigue or perplexity came into her eyes, and she shut them again. But when we're together we're perfectly happy, he said. He continued to hold her hand. The light being dim, it was impossible to see any change in her face. An immense feeling of peace came over Terence, so that he had no wish to move or to speak. The terrible torture and unreality of the last days were over, and he had come out now into perfect certainty and peace. His mind began to work naturally again, and with great ease. The longer he sat there, the more profoundly was he conscious of the peace invading every corner of his soul. Once he held his breath and listened acutely. She was still breathing. He went on thinking for some time. They seemed to be thinking together. He seemed to be Rachel as well as himself, and then he listened again. No, she had ceased to breathe. So much the better. This was death. It was nothing. It was to cease to breathe. It was happiness. It was perfect happiness. They had now what they had always wanted to have, the union which had been impossible while they lived. Unconscious whether he thought the words or spoke them aloud, he said, No two people have ever been so happy as we have been. No one has ever loved as we have loved. It seemed to him that their complete union and happiness filled the room with rings eddying more and more widely. He had no wish in the world left unfulfilled. They possessed what could never be taken from them. He was not conscious that anyone had come into the room, but later, moments later, or hours later, perhaps, he felt an arm behind him. The arms were round him. He did not want to have arms round him, and the mysterious whispering voices annoyed him. 
he laid Rachel's hand, which was now cold, upon the counterpane, and rose from his chair, and walked across to the window. The windows were uncurtained, and showed the moon, and a long silver pathway upon the surface of the waves. Why, he said in his ordinary tone of voice, look at the moon. There's a halo round the moon. We shall have rain to-morrow. The arms, whether they were the arms of man or of woman, were round him again. They were pushing him gently towards the door. He turned of his own accord and walked steadily in advance of the arms, conscious of a little amusement at the strange way in which people behaved, merely because someone was dead. He would go if they wished it, but nothing they could do would disturb his happiness. As he saw the passage outside the room, and the table with the cups and the plates, it suddenly came over him that here was a world in which he would never see Rachel again. Rachel! Rachel! he shrieked, trying to rush back to her. But they prevented him, and pushed him down the passage, and into a bedroom far from her room. Downstairs they could hear the thud of his feet on the floor as he struggled to break free, and twice they heard him shout, Rachel! Rachel! Chapter Twenty Six of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For two or three hours longer, the moon poured its light through the empty air. Unbroken by clouds, it fell straightly and lay almost like a chill white frost over the sea and the earth. During these hours, the silence was not broken and the only movement was caused by the movement of trees and branches which stirred slightly, and then the shadows that lay across the white spaces of the land moved too. In this profound silence one sound only was audible, the sound of a slight but continuous breathing which never ceased, although it never rose and never fell. It continued after the birds had begun to flutter from branch to branch, and could be heard behind the first thin notes of their voices. It continued all through the hours when the east whitened and grew red, and a faint blue tinged the sky. But when the sun rose it ceased, and gave place to other sounds. The first sounds that were heard were little inarticulate cries, the cries, it seemed, of children or of the very poor, of people who were very weak or in pain. But when the sun was above the horizon, the air which had been thin and pale grew every moment richer and warmer, and the sounds of life became bolder and more full of courage and authority. By degrees the smoke began to ascend in wavering breaths over the houses, and these slowly thickened, until they were as round and straight as columns, and instead of striking upon pale white blinds, the sun shone upon dark windows, beyond which there was depth and space. The sun had been up for many hours, and the great dome of air was warmed through and glittering with thin gold threads of sunlight before any one moved in the hotel. White and massive it stood in the early light, half asleep with its blinds down. At about half-past nine Miss Allen came very slowly into the hall 
and walked very slowly to the table where the morning papers were laid. But she did not put out her hand to take one. She stood still, thinking, with her head a little sunk upon her shoulders. She looked curiously old, and from the way in which she stood, a little hunched together and very massive, you could see what she would be like when she was really old, how she would sit day after day in her chair, looking placidly in front of her. Other people began to come into the room and to pass her, but she did not speak to any of them or even look at them, and at last, as if it were necessary to do something, she sat down in a chair and looked quietly and fixedly in front of her. She felt very old this morning, and useless too, as if her life had been a failure, as if it had been hard and laborious to no purpose. She did not want to go on living, and yet she knew that she would. She was so strong that she would live to be a very old woman. She would probably live to be eighty, and as she was now fifty, that left thirty years more for her to live. She turned her hands over and over in her lap and looked at them curiously, her old hands that had done so much work for her. There did not seem to be much point in it all. One went on, of course one went on. She looked up to see Mrs. Thornbury standing beside her, with lines drawn upon her forehead, and her lips parted as if she were about to ask a question. Miss Allen anticipated her. Yes, she said. She died this morning, very early, about three o'clock. Mrs. Thornbury made a little exclamation drew her lips together, and the tears rose in her eyes. Through them she looked at the hall, which was now laid with great breaths of sunlight, and at the careless, casual groups of people who were standing beside the solid armchairs and tables. They looked to her unreal, or as people look who remain unconscious that some great explosion is about to take place beside them. But there was no explosion, and they went on standing by the chairs and the tables. Mrs. Thornbury no longer saw them, but penetrating through them as though they were without substance, she saw the house, the people in the house, the room, the bed in the room, and the figure of the dead lying still in the dark beneath the sheets. She could almost see the dead. She could almost hear the voices of the mourners. They expected it? she asked at length. Miss Allen could only shake her head. I know nothing, she replied, except what Mrs. Flushing's maid told me. She died early this morning. The two women looked at each other with a quiet, significant gaze, and then, feeling oddly dazed, and seeking she did not know exactly what, Mrs. Thornbury went slowly upstairs and walked quietly along the passages, touching the wall with her fingers as if to guide herself. Housemaids were passing briskly from room to room, but Mrs. Thornbury avoided them. She hardly saw them. They seemed to her to be in another world. She did not even look up directly when Evelyn stopped her. It was evident that Evelyn had been lately in tears, and when she looked at Mrs. Thornbury she began to cry again. Together they drew into the hollow of a window and stood there in silence. Broken words formed themselves at last among Evelyn's sobs. 
It was wicked, she sobbed. It was cruel. They were so happy. Mrs. Thornbury patted her on the shoulder. It seems hard, very hard, she said. She paused and looked out over the slope of the hill at the Ambrose's villa. The windows were blazing in the sun, and she thought how the soul of the dead had passed from those windows. Something had passed from the world. It seemed to her strangely empty. And yet the older one grows, she continued, her eyes regaining more than their usual brightness. The more certain one becomes that there is a reason. How could one go on if there were no reason? she asked. She asked the question of someone, but she did not ask it of Evelyn. Evelyn's sobs were becoming quieter. There must be a reason, she said. It can't only be an accident. For it was an accident. It need never have happened. Mrs. Thornbury sighed deeply. But we must not let ourselves think of that, she added, and let us hope that they won't either. Whatever they had done, it might have been the same. These terrible illnesses. There's no reason. I don't believe there's any reason at all, Evelyn broke out, pulling the blind down and letting it fly back with a little snap. Why should these things happen? Why should people suffer? I honestly believe, she went on, lowering her voice slightly, that Rachel's in heaven. But Terence. What's the good of it all? she demanded. Mrs. Thornbury shook her head slightly but made no reply, and pressing Evelyn's hand she went on down the passage. Impelled by a strong desire to hear something, although she did not know exactly what there was to hear, she was making her way to the Flushing's room. As she opened their door she felt that she had interrupted some argument between husband and wife. Mrs. Flushing was sitting with her back to the light, and Mr. Flushing was standing near her, arguing and trying to persuade her of something. "'Ah, here is Mrs. Thornbury,' he began, with some relief in his voice. "'You have heard, of course. My wife feels that she was in some way responsible. She urged poor Miss Vinrace to come on the expedition.' I'm sure you will agree with me that it is most unreasonable to feel that. We don't even know. In fact, I think it most unlikely that she caught her illness there. These diseases. Besides, she was set on going. She would have gone whether you asked her or not, Alice. Don't, Wilfred, said Mrs. Flushing, neither moving nor taking her eyes off the spot on the floor upon which they rested. What's the use of talking? What's the use? She ceased. I was coming to ask you, said Mrs. Thornbury, addressing Wilfred, for it was useless to speak to his wife. Is there anything you think that one could do? Has the father arrived? Could one go and see? The strongest wish in her being at this moment was to be able to do something for the unhappy people, to see them, to assure them, to help them. It was dreadful to be so far away from them. But Mr. Flushing shook his head. He did not think that now Later, perhaps, one might be able to help. Here Mrs. Flushing rose stiffly, turned her back to them, 
and walked to the dressing-room opposite. As she walked, they could see her breast slowly rise and slowly fall. But her grief was silent. She shut the door behind her. When she was alone by herself, she clenched her fists together and began beating the back of a chair with them. She was like a wounded animal. She hated death. She was furious, outraged, indignant with death, as if it were a living creature. She refused to relinquish her friends to death. She would not submit to dark and nothingness. She began to pace up and down, clenching her hands and making no attempt to stop the quick tears which raced down her cheeks. She sat still at last, but she did not submit. She looked stubborn and strong when she had ceased to cry. In the next room, meanwhile, Wilfred was talking to Mrs. Thornbury with greater freedom now that his wife was not sitting there. "'That's the worst of these places,' he said. "'People will behave as though they were in England, and they're not. "'I've no doubt myself that Miss Vinrace caught the infection up at the villa itself. "'She probably ran risks a dozen times a day that might have given her the illness. "'It's absurd to say she caught it with us.' If he had not been sincerely sorry for them, he would have been annoyed. Pepper tells me, he continued, that he left the house because he thought them so careless. He says they never washed their vegetables properly. Poor people! It's a fearful price to pay, but it's only what I've seen over and over again. People seem to forget that these things happen, and then they do happen, and they're surprised. Mrs. Thornbury agreed with him that they had been very careless, and that there was no reason whatever to think that she had caught the fever on the expedition. And after talking about other things for a short time, she left him and went sadly along the passage to her own room. There must be some reason why such things happen, she thought to herself, as she shut the door. Only at first it was not easy to understand what it was. It seemed so strange, so unbelievable. Why only three weeks ago, only a fortnight ago, she had seen Rachel. When she shut her eyes she could almost see her now, the quiet, shy girl who was going to be married. She thought of all that she would have missed had she died at Rachel's age. The children, the married life, the unimaginable depths and miracles that seemed to her, as she looked back, to have lain about her day after day and year after year. The stunned feeling, which had been making it difficult for her to think, gradually gave way to a feeling of the opposite nature. She thought very quickly and very clearly, and looking back over all her experiences, tried to fit them into a kind of order. There was undoubtedly much suffering, much struggling, but on the whole, Surely there was a balance of happiness. Surely order did prevail. Nor were the deaths of young people really the saddest things in life. They were saved so much. They kept so much. The dead, she called to mind those who had died early, accidentally, were beautiful. She often dreamt of the dead and in time Terence himself would come to feel. She got up and began to wander restlessly about the room. For an old woman of her age she was very restless. 
and for one of her clear, quick mind she was unusually perplexed. She could not settle to anything, so that she was relieved when the door opened. She went up to her husband, took him in her arms, and kissed him with unusual intensity, and then as they sat down together she began to pat him and question him as if he were a baby, an old, tired, querulous baby. She did not tell him about Miss Vinrace's death, for that would only disturb him, and he was put out already. She tried to discover why he was uneasy. Politics again? What were those horrible people doing? She spent the whole morning in discussing politics with her husband, and by degrees she became deeply interested in what they were saying. But every now and then, what she was saying seemed to her oddly empty of meaning. At luncheon it was remarked by several people that the visitors at the hotel were beginning to leave. There were fewer every day. There were only forty people at luncheon instead of the sixty that there had been. So old Mrs. Paley computed, gazing about her with her faded eyes as she took her seat at her own table in the window. Her party generally consisted of Mr. Parrott as well as Arthur and Susan, and today Evelyn was lunching with them also. She was unusually subdued. Having noticed that her eyes were red, and guessing the reason, the others took pains to keep up an elaborate conversation between themselves. She suffered it to go on for a few minutes, leaning both elbows on the table, and leaving her soup untouched, when she exclaimed suddenly, I don't know how you feel, but I can simply think of nothing else. The gentleman murmured sympathetically, and looked grave. Susan replied, Yes, isn't it perfectly awful? When you think what a nice girl she was, only just engaged, and this need never have happened. It seems too tragic. She looked at Arthur as though he might be able to help her with something more suitable. Hard lines, said Arthur briefly. But it was a foolish thing to do, to go up that river. He shook his head. They should have known better. You can't expect English women to stand roughing it as the natives do, who've been acclimatized. I'd half a mind to warn them at tea that day when it was being discussed, but it's no good saying these sort of things. It only puts people's backs up. It never makes any difference. Old Mrs. Paley, hitherto contented with her soup, here intimated, by raising one hand to her ear, that she wished to know what was being said. You heard, Aunt Emma, that poor Miss Vinrace has died of the fever, Susan informed her gently. She could not speak of death loudly, or even in her usual voice, so that Mrs. Paley did not catch a word. Arthur came to the rescue. Miss Vinrace is dead, he said very distinctly. Mrs. Paley merely bent a little towards him and asked, Eh? Miss Vinrace is dead, he repeated. It was only by stiffening all the muscles round his mouth that he could prevent himself from bursting into laughter, and forced himself to repeat for the third time. Miss Vinrace, she's dead. Let alone the difficulty of hearing the exact words, facts that were outside her daily experience took some time to reach Mrs. Paley's consciousness. A weight seemed to rest upon her brain, impeding, though not damaging its action. 
she sat vague-eyed for at least a minute before she realised what Arthur meant. Dead? she said vaguely. Miss Vinrace dead? Dear me, that's very sad. But I don't at the moment remember which she was. We seem to have made so many new acquaintances here. She looked at Susan for help. A tall dark girl who just missed being handsome with a high colour? No, Susan interposed. She was. Then she gave it up in despair. There was no use in explaining that Mrs. Paley was thinking of the wrong person. She ought not to have died, Mrs. Paley continued. She looked so strong. But people will drink the water. I can never make out why. It seems such a simple thing to tell them to put a bottle of seltzer water in your bedroom. That's all the precaution I've ever taken, and I've been in every part of the world, I may say. Italy a dozen times over. But young people always think they know better, and then they pay the penalty. Poor thing. I am very sorry for her. But the difficulty of peering into a dish of potatoes and helping herself engrossed her attention. Arthur and Susan both secretly hoped that the subject was now disposed of, for there seemed to them something unpleasant in this discussion. But Evelyn was not ready to let it drop. Why would people never talk about the things that mattered? I don't believe you care a bit, she said, turning savagely upon Mr. Parrot, who had sat all this time in silence. I? Oh, yes, I do, he answered awkwardly, but with obvious sincerity. Evelyn's questions made him, too, feel uncomfortable. It seems so inexplicable, Evelyn continued. Death, I mean. Why should she be dead, and not you or I? It was only a fortnight ago that she was here with the rest of us. What do you believe? she demanded of Mr. Parrot. Do you believe that things go on, that she's still somewhere? Or do you think it's simply a game? we crumble up to nothing when we die. I'm positive Rachel's not dead. Mr. Parrot would have said almost anything that Evelyn wanted him to say, but to assert that he believed in the immortality of the soul was not in his power. He sat silent, more deeply wrinkled than usual, crumbling his bread lest Evelyn should next ask him what he believed, Arthur, making a pause equivalent to a full stop, started a completely different topic. Supposing, he said, a man were to write and tell you that he wanted five pounds because he had known your grandfather, what would you do? It was this way. My grandfather, Invented a stove, said Evelyn. I know all about that. We had one in the conservatory to keep the plants warm. Didn't know I was so famous, said Arthur. Well, he continued, determined at all costs to spin his story out at length. The old chap being about the second best inventor of his day, and a capable lawyer, too, died, as they always do, without making a will. Now Fielding, his clerk, with how much justice I don't know, always claimed that he meant to do something for him. The poor old boy's come down in the world through trying inventions on his own account. Lives in Penge over a tobacconist's shop. I've been to see him there, the question is, must I stump up or not? What does the abstract spirit of justice require, Parrot? 
Remember, I didn't benefit under my grandfather's will, and I've no way of testing the truth of the story. I don't know much about the abstract spirit of justice, said Susan, smiling complacently at the others, but I'm certain of one thing, he'll get his five pounds. As Mr. Parrott proceeded to deliver an opinion, and Evelyn insisted that he was much too stingy, like all lawyers, thinking of the letter and not of the spirit, while Mrs. Paley required to be kept informed between the courses as to what they were all saying. The luncheon passed with no interval of silence, and Arthur congratulated himself upon the tact with which the discussion had been smoothed over. As they left the room it happened that Mrs. Paley's wheeled chair ran into the Elliots, who were coming through the door as she was going out. Brought thus to a standstill for a moment, Arthur and Susan congratulated Hewling Elliot upon his convalescence. He was down, cadaverous enough for the first time, and Mr. Parrott took occasion to say a few words in private to Evelyn. Would there be any chance of seeing you this afternoon about three-thirty, say? I shall be in the garden, by the fountain. The block dissolved before Evelyn answered. But as she left them in the hall, she looked at him brightly and said, Half-past three, did you say? That'll suit me. She ran upstairs with the feeling of spiritual exultation and quickened life which the prospect of an emotional scene always aroused in her. That Mr. Parrott was again about to propose to her, she had no doubt, and she was aware that on this occasion she ought to be prepared with a definite answer, for she was going away in three days' time. But she could not bring her mind to bear upon the question. To come to a decision was very difficult to her because she had a natural dislike of anything final and done with. She liked to go on and on, always on and on. She was leaving, and therefore she occupied herself in laying her clothes out side by side upon the bed. She observed that some were very shabby. She took the photograph of her father and mother, and before she laid it away in her box, she held it for a minute in her hand. Rachel had looked at it. Suddenly the keen feeling of someone's personality, which things that they have owned or handled sometimes preserves, overcame her. She felt Rachel in the room with her. It was as if she were on a ship at sea, and the life of the day was as unreal as the land in the distance. But by degrees the feeling of Rachel's presence passed away, and she could no longer realize her, for she had scarcely known her. But this momentary sensation left her depressed and fatigued. What had she done with her life? What future was there before her? What was make-believe, and what was real? Were these proposals and intimacies and adventures real? Or was the contentment which she had seen on the faces of Susan and Rachel more real than anything she had ever felt? She made herself ready to go downstairs, absent-mindedly, but her fingers were so well trained that they did the work of preparing her almost of their own accord. When she was actually on the way downstairs, the blood began to circle through her body of its own accord, too, for her mind felt very dull. Mr. Parrott was waiting for her. Indeed, he had gone straight into the garden after luncheon, and had been walking up and down the path for more than half an hour, 
in a state of acute suspense. "'I'm late as usual,' she exclaimed, as she caught sight of him. "'Well, you must forgive me. I had to pack up. My word, it looks stormy. And that's a new steamer in the bay, isn't it? She looked at the bay in which a steamer was just dropping anchor, the smoke still hanging about it, while a swift black shudder ran through the waves. One's quite forgotten what rain looks like, she added. But Mr. Parrott paid no attention to the steamer or to the weather. Miss Murgatroyd, he began, with his usual formality. I asked you to come here from a very selfish motive, I fear. I do not think you need to be assured once more of my feelings. But as you are leaving so soon, I felt that I could not let you go without asking you to tell me. Have I any reason to hope that you will ever come to care for me? He was very pale, and seemed unable to say any more. The little gush of vitality which had come into Evelyn as she ran downstairs had left her, and she felt herself impotent. There was nothing for her to say. She felt nothing. Now that he was actually asking her, in his elderly gentle words, to marry him, she felt less for him than she had ever felt before. Let's sit down and talk it over, she said rather unsteadily. Mr. Parrott followed her to a curved green seat under a tree. They looked at the fountain in front of them, which had long ceased to play. Evelyn kept looking at the fountain instead of thinking of what she was saying. The fountain without any water seemed to be the type of her own being. Of course I care for you, she began, rushing her words out in a hurry. I should be a brute if I didn't. I think you're quite one of the nicest people I've ever known, and one of the finest, too. But I wish, I wish you didn't care for me in that way. Are you sure you do? For the moment she honestly desired that he should say no. Quite sure, said Mr. Parrott. You see, I'm not as simple as most women, Evelyn continued. I think I want more. I don't know exactly what I feel. He sat by her, watching her and refraining from speech. I sometimes think I haven't got it in me to care very much for one person only. Someone else would make you a better wife. I can imagine you very happy with someone else. If you think that there is any chance that you will come to care for me, I am quite content to wait, said Mr. Parrott. Well, there's no hurry, is there? said Evelyn. Suppose I thought it over and wrote and told you when I get back. I'm going to Moscow. I'll write from Moscow. But Mr. Parrott persisted. You cannot give me any kind of idea? I do not ask for a date. That would be most unreasonable. He paused, looking down at the gravel path. As she did not immediately answer, he went on. I know very well that I am not, that I have not much to offer you either in myself or in my circumstances. And I forget, it cannot seem the miracle to you that it does to me. Until I met you, I had gone on in my own quiet way. We are both very quiet people, my sister and I quite content with my lot. My friendship with Arthur was the most important thing in my life. Now that I know you, all that has changed. You seem to put such a spirit into everything. Life seems to hold so many possibilities that I had never dreamt of. 
that's splendid, Evelyn exclaimed, grasping his hand. Now you'll go back and start all kinds of things and make a great name in the world. And we'll go on being friends, whatever happens. We'll be great friends, won't we? Evelyn, he moaned suddenly, and took her in his arms and kissed her. She did not resent it, although it made little impression on her. As she sat upright again, she said, I never see why one shouldn't go on being friends, though some people do. And friendships do make a difference, don't they? They are the kind of things that matter in one's life. He looked at her with a bewildered expression as if he did not really understand what she was saying. With a considerable effort he collected himself, stood up, and said, Now I think I have told you what I feel, and I will only add that I can wait as long as ever you wish. Left alone, Evelyn walked up and down the path. What did matter, then? What was the meaning of it all? Chapter 27 of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. All that evening the clouds gathered, until they closed entirely over the blue of the sky. They seemed to narrow the space between earth and heaven, so that there was no room for the air to move in freely. And the waves, too, lay flat and yet rigid, as if they were restrained. The leaves on the bushes and trees in the garden hung closely together and the feeling of pressure and restraint was increased by the short chirping sounds which came from birds and insects. So strange were the lights and the silence that the busy hum of voices which usually filled the dining-room at meal-times had distinct gaps in it, and during these silences the clatter of the knives upon plates became audible. The first roll of thunder and the first heavy drop striking the pane caused a little stir. "'It's coming,' was said simultaneously in many different languages. There was a profound silence as if the thunder had withdrawn into itself. People had just begun to eat again when a gust of cold air came through the open windows lifting tablecloths and skirts. A light flashed and was instantly followed by a clap of thunder right over the hotel. The rain swished with it and immediately there were all those sounds of windows being shut and doors slamming violently which accompany a storm. The room grew suddenly several degrees darker, for the wind seemed to be driving waves of darkness across the earth. No one attempted to eat for a time, but sat looking out at the garden, with their forks in the air. The flashes now came frequently, lighting up faces as if they were going to be photographed, surprising them in tense and unnatural expressions. The clap followed close and violently upon them. Several women half rose from their chairs and then sat down again, but dinner was continued uneasily with eyes upon the garden. The bushes outside were ruffled and whitened, and the wind pressed upon them so that they seemed to stoop to the ground. The waiters had to press dishes upon the diner's notice and the diners had to draw the attention of waiters, for they were all absorbed in looking at the storm. As the thunder showed no signs of withdrawing, but seemed massed right overhead, while the lightning aimed straight at the garden every time, 
an uneasy gloom replaced the first excitement finishing the meal very quickly people congregated in the hall where they felt more secure than in any other place because they could retreat far from the windows and although they heard the thunder they could not see anything a little boy was carried away sobbing in the arms of his mother while the storm continued no one seemed inclined to sit down but they collected in little groups under the central skylight where they stood in a yellow atmosphere looking upwards now and again their faces became white as the lightning flashed and finally a terrific crash came making the panes of the skylight lift at the joints ah several voices exclaimed at the same moment something struck said a man's voice the rain rushed down the rain seemed now to extinguish the lightning and the thunder and the hall became almost dark after a minute or two when nothing was heard but the rattle of water upon the glass there was a perceptible slackening of the sound and then the atmosphere became lighter it's over said another voice at a touch all the electric lights were turned on and revealed a crowd of people all standing all looking with rather strained faces up at the skylight but when they saw each other in the artificial light they turned at once and began to move away for some minutes the rain continued to rattle upon the skylight and the thunder gave another shake or two but it was evident from the clearing of the darkness and the light drumming of the rain upon the roof that the great confused ocean of air was travelling away from them and passing high overhead with its clouds and its rods of fire out to sea the building which had seemed so small in the tumult of the storm now became as square and spacious as usual as the storm drew away the people in the hall of the hotel sat down and with a comfortable sense of relief began to tell each other stories about great storms and produced in many cases their occupations for the evening the chessboard was brought out and mr elliot who wore a stock instead of a collar as a sign of convalescence but was otherwise much as usual challenged mr pepper to a final contest round them gathered a group of ladies with pieces of needlework or in default of needlework with novels to superintend the game much as if they were in charge of two small boys playing marbles every now and then they looked at the board and made some encouraging remark to the gentleman mrs paley just round the corner had her cards arranged in long ladders before her and susan sitting near to sympathize but not to correct and the merchants and the miscellaneous people who had never been discovered to possess names were stretched in their armchairs with their newspapers on their knees the conversation in these circumstances was very gentle fragmentary and intermittent but the room was full of the indescribable stir of life every now and then the moth which was now grey of wing and shiny of thorax whizzed over their heads and hit the lamps with a thud a young woman put down her needlework and exclaimed poor creature it would be kinder to kill it but nobody seemed disposed to rouse himself in order to kill the moth they watched it dash from lamp to lamp because they were comfortable and had nothing to do 
On the sofa beside the chess players Mrs. Elliot was imparting a new stitch in knitting to Mrs. Thornbury, so that their heads came very near together, and were only to be distinguished by the old lace cap which Mrs. Thornbury wore in the evening. Mrs. Elliot was an expert at knitting, and disclaimed a compliment to that effect with evident pride. I suppose we're all proud of something, she said, and I'm proud of my knitting. I think things like that run in families. We all knit well. I had an uncle who knitted his own socks to the day of his death and he did it better than any of his daughters, dear old gentleman. Now I wonder that you, Miss Allen, who use your eyes so much, don't take up knitting in the evenings. You'd find it such a relief, I should say, such a rest to the eyes. And the bazaars are so glad of things. Her voice dropped into the smooth, half-conscious tone of the expert knitter. The words came gently, one after another. As much as I do I can always dispose of, which is a comfort, for then I feel that I am not wasting my time. Miss Allen, being thus addressed, shut her novel and observed the others placidly for a time. At last, she said, it is surely not natural to leave your wife because she happens to be in love with you. But that, as far as I can make out, is what the gentleman in my story does. Tut, tut, that doesn't sound good. No, that doesn't sound at all natural, murmured the knitters in their absorbed voices. Still, it's the kind of book people call very clever, Miss Allen added. Maternity by Michael Jessop, I presume, Mr. Elliot put in, for he could never resist the temptation of talking while he played chess. Do you know, said Mrs. Elliot after a moment, I don't think people do write good novels now. Not as good as they used to, anyhow. No one took the trouble to agree with her, or to disagree with her. Arthur Benning, who was strolling about, sometimes looking at the game, sometimes reading a page of a magazine, looked at Miss Allen, who was half asleep, and said humorously, A penny for your thoughts, Miss Allen. The others looked up. They were glad that he had not spoken to them. But Miss Allen replied without any hesitation, I was thinking of my imaginary uncle. Hasn't everyone got an imaginary uncle? she continued. I have one, a most delightful old gentleman. He's always giving me things. Sometimes it's a gold watch. Sometimes it's a carriage and pair. Sometimes it's a beautiful little cottage in the new forest. Sometimes it's a ticket to the place I most want to see. She set them all thinking vaguely of the things they wanted. Mrs. Elliot knew exactly what she wanted. She wanted a child. And the usual little pucker deepened on her brow. We're such lucky people, she said, looking at her husband. We really have no wants. She was apt to say this, partly in order to convince herself, and partly in order to convince other people. But she was prevented from wondering how far she carried conviction by the entrance of Mr. and Mrs. Flushing, who came through the hall and stopped by the chessboard. Mrs. Flushing looked wilder than ever. A great strand of black hair looped down across her brow. Her cheeks were whipped a dark blood red, and drops of rain made wet marks upon them. 
Mr. Flushing explained that they had been on the roof watching the storm. It was a wonderful sight, he said. The lightning went right out over the sea, and lit up the waves and the ships far away. You can't think how wonderful the mountains looked, too, with the lights on them and the great masses of shadow. It's all over now. He slid down into a chair, becoming interested in the final struggle of the game. And you go back tomorrow? said Mrs. Thornbury, looking at Mrs. Flushing. Yes, she replied. And indeed one is not sorry to go back, said Mrs. Elliot, assuming an air of mournful anxiety. After all this illness, are you afraid of dyin mrs flushing demanded scornfully i think we are all afraid of that said mrs elliot with dignity i suppose we're all cowards when it comes to the point said mrs flushing rubbing her cheek against the back of the chair i'm sure i am not a bit of it said mr flushing turning round for Mr. Pepper took a very long time to consider his mood. It's not cowardly to wish to live, Alice. It's the very reverse of cowardly. Personally, I'd like to go on for a hundred years. Granted, of course, that I had the full use of my faculties. Think of all the things that are bound to happen. That is what I feel. Mrs. Thornbury rejoined. The changes, the improvements, the inventions, and beauty. Do you know, I feel sometimes that I couldn't bear to die and cease to see beautiful things about me. It would certainly be very dull to die before they have discovered whether there is life in Mars, Miss Allen added. Do you really believe there's life in Mars? asked Mrs. Flushing, turning to her for the first time with keen interest. Who tells you that? Someone who knows? Do you know a man called... Here Mrs. Thornbury laid down her knitting, and a look of extreme solicitude came into her eyes. There is Mr. Hurst, she said quietly. St. John had just come through the swing door. He was rather blown about by the wind, and his cheeks looked terribly pale, unshorn and cavernous. After taking off his coat he was going to pass straight through the hall and up to his room, but he could not ignore the presence of so many people he knew especially as Mrs. Thornbury rose and went up to him, holding out her hand. But the shock of the warm, lamp-lit room, together with the sight of so many cheerful human beings sitting together at their ease, after the dark walk in the rain and the long days of strain and horror, overcame him completely. He looked at Mrs. Thornbury and could not speak. Everyone was silent. Mr. Pepper's hand stayed upon his night. Mrs. Thornbury somehow moved him to a chair, sat herself beside him, and with tears in her own eyes said gently, You have done everything for your friend. Her action set them all talking again, as if they had never stopped, and Mr. Pepper finished the move with his knight. There was nothing to be done, said St. John. He spoke very slowly. It seems impossible. He drew his hand across his eyes as if some dream came between him and the others and prevented him from seeing where he was. And that poor fellow, said Mrs. Thornbury, 
the tears falling again down her cheeks. Impossible, St. John repeated. Did he have the consolation of knowing? Mrs. Thornbury began very tentatively. But St. John made no reply. He lay back in his chair, half seeing the others, half hearing what they said. He was terribly tired, and the light and warmth, the movements of the hands, and the soft communicative voices soothed him. They gave him a strange sense of quiet and relief. As he sat there motionless, this feeling of relief became a feeling of profound happiness. Without any sense of disloyalty to Terence and Rachel, he ceased to think about either of them. The movements and the voices seemed to draw together from different parts of the room, and to combine themselves into a pattern before his eyes. He was content to sit silently watching the pattern build itself up, looking at what he hardly saw. The game was really a good one, and Mr. Pepper and Mr. Elliot were becoming more and more set upon the struggle. Mrs. Thornbury, seeing that St. John did not wish to talk, resumed her knitting. Lightning again! Mrs. Flushing suddenly exclaimed. A yellow light flashed across the blue window, and for a second they saw the green trees outside. She strode to the door, pushed it open, and stood half out in the open air. But the light was only the reflection of the storm which was over. The rain had ceased. The heavy clouds were blown away, and the air was thin and clear, although vaporish mists were being driven swiftly across the moon. The sky was once more a deep and solemn blue, and the shape of the earth was visible at the bottom of the air, enormous, dark, and solid, rising into the tapering mass of the mountains and pricked here and there on the slopes by the tiny lights of villas. The driving air, the drone of the trees, and the flashing light which now and again spread a broad illumination over the earth filled Mrs. Flushing with exultation. Her breasts rose and fell. Splendid, splendid, she muttered to herself, then she turned back into the hall and exclaimed in a peremptory voice, Come outside and see, Wilfred. It's wonderful. Some half stirred, some rose, some dropped their balls of wool and began to stoop to look for them. To bed, to bed, said Miss Allen. It was the move with your queen that gave it away, Pepper, exclaimed Mr. Elliot triumphantly, sweeping the pieces together and standing up. He had won the game. What? Pepper beaten at last? I congratulate you, said Arthur Venning, who was wheeling old Mrs. Paley to bed. All these voices sounded gratefully in St. John's ears as he lay half asleep, and yet vividly conscious of everything around him. Across his eyes passed a procession of objects, black and indistinct, the figures of people picking up their books, their cards, their balls of wool, their work-baskets, and passing him one after another. 